Book. Chapter 11. Death of Orpheus. The Thracian women, offended at the coldness of Orpheus, tear him to pieces, and throw his head into the Hebras, whose streams convey it to the coast of the Aegean Sea. Where a serpent, while sucking his blood, is changed into a stone. Here, while the Thracian bard's enchanting strain soothes beasts, and woods, and all the listening plain. The female bacchanals, devoutly mad. In shaggy skins, like savage creatures. Clad. Warbling in air, perceived his lovely lay. And from a rising ground beheld him play. When one, the wildest, with disheveled hair. That loosely streamed and ruffled in the air. Soon as her frantic eye the lyrist spied. See, see, the hater of our sex, she cried. Then at his face her missive javelin sent. Which whizzed along, and brushed him as it went. But the soft wreaths of ivy twisted round. Prevent a deep impression of the wound. Another, for a weapon, hurls a stone. Which, by the sound subdued as soon as thrown. Falls at his feet, and, with a seeming sense. Implores his pardon for its late offense. But now their frantic rage unbounded grows. Turns all to madness, and no measure knows. Yet this the charms of music might subdue. But that, with all its charms, is conquered too. In louder strains their hideous yellings rise. And squeaking hornpipes echo through the skies. Which, in hoarse concert with the drum. Confound. The moving lyre, and every gentle sound. Then, twas the deafened stones flew on with speed. And saw, unsoothed, their tuneful poet bleed. The birds, the beasts, and all the savage crew. Which the sweet lyrist to attention drew. Now by the female mob's more furious rage. Are driven, and forced to quit the shady stage. Next their fierce hands the bard himself assail. Nor can his song against their wrath prevail. They flock like birds, when, in a clustering flight. By day they chase the boding fowl of night. So crowded amphitheaters survey. The stag, to greedy dogs a future prey. Their steely javelins, which soft curls entwine. Of budding tendrils from the leafy vine. For sacred rites of mild religion made. Are flung promiscuous at the poet's head. Those, clods of earth or flints discharge. And these. Hurl prickly branches, slivered from the trees. And lest their passion should be unsupplied. The rabble crew, by chance, at distance spied. Where oxen. Straining at the heavy yoke. The fallowed field with slow advances broke. Nigh which the brawny peasants dug the soil. Procuring food with long laborious toil. These, when they saw the ranting throng draw near. Quitted their tools, and fled. Possessed with fear. Long spades, and rakes of mighty size, were found. Carelessly left upon the broken ground. With these the furious lunatics engage. And first the laboring oxen feel their rage. Then to the poet they return with speed. Whose fate was, past prevention, now decreed. In vain he lifts his suppliant hands, in vain. He tries, before. His never failing strain. And from those sacred lips, whose thrilling sound. Fierce tigers and insensate rocks could wound. Ah, gods! How moving was the mournful sight! To see the fleeting soul now take its flight. Thee the soft warblers of the feathered kind. Bewailed, for thee thy savage audience pined. Those rocks and woods that oft thy strain had led. Mourn for their charmer, and lament him dead. And drooping trees their leafy glories shed. Naiads and dryads, with disheveled hair. Promiscuous weep, and scarfs of sable wear. Nor could the river gods conceal their moan. But with new floods of tears augment their own. His mangled limbs lay scattered all around. His head and harp a better fortune found. 
In Hebra streams they gently rolled along, and soothed the waters with a mournful song. Soft deadly notes the lifeless tongue inspire. A doleful tune sounds from the floating lyre. The hollow banks in solemn concert mourn, and the sad strain in echoing groans return. Now with the current to the sea they glide, borne by the billows of the briny tide, and driven where waves round rocky Lesbos roar. They strand, and lodge upon Methymna's shore. But here, when landed on the foreign soil, a venomed snake, the product of the isle, attempts the head, and sacred locks, imbrued, with clotted gore and still fresh dropping blood. Phoebus at last his kind protection gives, and from the fact the greedy monster drives, whose marble jaws his impious crime atone. Still grinning ghastly, though transformed to stone, his ghost flies downward to the Stygian shore, and knows the places it had seen before. Among the shadows of the pious train, he finds Eurydice, and loves again. With pleasure views the beauteous phantom's charms, and clasps her in his unsubstantial arms. There side by side they unmolested walk, or pass their blissful hours in pleasing talk. Aft or before the bard securely goes, and without danger can review his spouse. Thracian women transform to trees. Bacchus punishes the cruelty of the Thracian women by transforming them into trees. Bacchus, resolving to revenge the wrong of Orpheus murdered on the matting throng, decreed that each accomplice dame should stand fixed by the roots along the conscious land. Their wicked feet that late so nimbly ran to wreak their malice on the guiltless man, sudden with twisted ligatures were bound like trees deep planted in the turfy ground. And as the fowler, with his subtle gins, his feathered captives by the feet entwines, that fluttering pant, and struggle to get loose, yet only closer draw the fatal noose. So these were caught, and, as they strove in vain, to quit the place, they but increased their pain. They flounce and toil, yet find themselves controlled. The root, though pliant, toughly keeps its hold. In vain their toes and feet they look to find. For even their shapely legs are clothed with rind. One smites her thighs with a lamenting stroke. And finds the flesh transformed to solid oak. Another, with surprise and grief distressed. Lays on above, but beats a wooden breast. A rugged bark their softer neck invades. Their branching arms shoot up delightful shades. At once they seem and are a real grove. With mossy trunks below, and verdant leaves above. Fable of Midas The hospitality of Midas toward Silenus, the tutor of Bacchus, is rewarded by the grateful deity with a permission to choose whatever recompense he pleases, Midas imprudently demands that whatever he touches may be turned into gold, his prayers are granted. And he is in danger of perishing by hunger, when the indulgent god supplies a remedy, some time after this adventure Midas has the folly to maintain the superiority of Pan to Apollo in musical skill. For which rash opinion his ears are changed into those of an ass, to denote his ignorance and stupidity. Nor this sufficed. The god's disgust remains. And he resolves to quit their hated plains. The vineyards of Timol engross his care and with a better choir he fixes there, where the smooth streams of clear Pactolus rolled, then undistinguished for its sands of gold. The satyrs with the nymphs, his usual throng, come to salute their god, and jovial dance along. Silenus only missed. For while he reeled, feeble with age and wine, about the field, the hoary drunkard had forgot his way and to the Phrygian clowns became a prey. Who to King Midas dragged the captive god? While on his toddy pate the wreaths of ivy nod. Midas from Orpheus had been taught his lore, and knew the rites of Bacchus long before. He, when he saw his venerable guest, in honor of the god ordained a feast, 
Ten days in course, with each continued night. Were spent in genial mirth and brisk delight. Then on the eleventh, when, with brighter ray, Phosphor had chased the fading stars away. The king through Lydia's fields young Bacchus sought. And to the god his foster father brought. Pleased with the welcome sight, he bids him soon. But name his wish, and swears to grant the boon. A glorious offer. Yet but ill bestowed. On him whose choice so little judgment showed. Give me, says he, nor thought he asked too much. That with my body whatsoe'er I touch. Changed from the nature which it held of old. May be converted into yellow gold. He had his wish, but yet the god repined. To think the fool no better wish could find. But the brave king departed from the place. With smiles of gladness sparkling in his face. Nor could contain, but, as he took his way. Impatient longs to make the first essay. Down from a lowly branch a twig he drew. The twig straight glittered with a golden hue. He takes a stone, the stone was turned to gold. A clod he touches, and the crumbling mold. Acknowledged soon the great transforming power. In weight and substance like a mass of ore. He plucked the corn, and straight his grasp appears. Filled with a bending tuft of golden ears. An apple next he takes, and seems to hold. The bright Hesperian vegetable gold. His hand he careless on a pillar lays. With shining gold the fluted pillars blaze. And, while he washes, as the servants pour. His touch converts the stream to Dane's shower. To see these miracles so finely wrought. Fires with transporting joy his giddy thought. The ready slaves prepare a sumptuous board. Spread with rich dainties for their happy lord. Whose powerful hands the bread no sooner hold. But its whole substance is transformed to gold. Up to his mouth he lifts the savory meat. Which turns to gold as he attempts to eat. His patron's noble juice of purple hue. Touched by his lips, a gilded cordial grew. Unfit for drink. And, wondrous to behold. It trickles from his jaws a fluid gold. The rich poor fool, confounded with surprise. Starving in all his various plenty lies. Sick of his wish, he now detests the power. For which he asked so earnestly before. Amid his gold with pinching famine cursed. And justly tortured with an equal thirst. At last, his shining arms to heaven he rears. And, in distress, for refuge flies to prayers. Oh, Father Bacchus, I have shinned, he cried. And foolishly thy gracious gift applied. Thy pity now, repenting, I implore. Oh may I feel the golden plague no more. The hungry wretch, his folly thus confessed. Touched the kind deity's good-natured breast. The gentle god annulled his first decree. And from the cruel compact set him free. But then, to cleanse him quite from further harm. And to dilute the relics of the charm. He bids him seek the stream, that cuts the land. Nigh where the towers of Lydia's Sardis stand. Then trace the river to the fountain head. And meet it rising from its rocky bed. There, as the bubbling tide pours forth a main. To plunge his body in, and wash away the stain. The king, instructed, to the fount retires. But with the golden charm the stream inspires. For, while this quality the man forsakes. An equal power the limpid water takes. Informs with veins of gold the neighboring land. And glides along a bed of golden sand. Now loathing wealth, the occasion of his woes. Far in the woods, he sought a calm repose. In caves and grottoes, where the nymphs resort. And keep with mountain pan their sylvan court. Ah! Had he left his stupid soul behind. But his condition altered and not his mind. For where high Molus rears his shady brow. And from his cliff surveys the seas below. In his descent, by Sardis bounded here. By the small confines of Hypepa there. 
Pan to the nymphs his frolic ditties played. Tuning his reeds beneath the checkered shade. The nymphs are pleased, the boasting sylvan plays. And speaks with slight of great Apollo's lays. Molus was arbiter, the boaster still. Accepts the trial with unequal skill. The venerable judge was seated high. On his own hill, that seemed to touch the sky. Above the whispering trees his head he rears. From their encumbering boughs to free his ears. A wreath of oak alone his temples bound. The pendant acorns loosely dangled round. In me, your judge, says he, there's no delay. Then bids the goatherd god begin and play. Pan tuned his pipe, and with his rural song. Please the low taste of all the vulgar throng. Such songs a vulgar judgment mostly please. Midas was there, and Midas judged with these. The mountain sire, with grave deportment, now. To Phoebus turns his venerable brow. And, as he turns, with him the listening wood. In the same posture of attention stood. The god his own Parnassian laurel crowned. And in a wreath his golden tresses bound. Graceful his purple mantle swept the ground. High on the left his ivory lute he raised. The lute, embossed with glittering jewels, blazed. In his right hand he nicely held the quill. His easy posture spoke a master's skill. The strings he touched with more than human art. Which pleased the judge's ear, and soothed his heart. Who soon judiciously the palm decreed. And to the lute postponed the squeaking reed. All, with applause, the rightful sentence heard. Midas alone dissatisfied appeared. To him unjustly given the judgment seems. For Pan's barbaric notes he most esteems. The lyric god, who thought his untuned ear. Deserved but ill a human form to wear. Of that deprives him, and supplies the place. With some more fit, and of an ampler space. Fixed on his noddle an unseemly pair. Flagging, and large, and full of whitish hair. Without a total change from what he was. Still in the man preserves the simple ass. He, to conceal the scandal of the deed. A purple turban folds about his head. Veils the reproach from public view, and fears. The laughing world would spy his monstrous ears. One trusty barber slave, that used to dress. His master's hair, when lengthened to excess. The mighty secret knew, but knew alone. And, though impatient, durst not make it known. Restless, at last a private place he found. Then dug a hole, and told it to the ground. In a low whisper he revealed the case. And covered in the earth, and silent left the place. In time, of trembling reeds a plenteous crop. From the confided furrow sprouted up. Which, high advancing with the ripening year. Made known the tiller, and his fruitless care. For then the rustling blades and whispering wind. To tell the important secret both combined. Building of Troy. Apollo and Neptune engage with Laomedon to build the walls of Troy for a stipulated sum. Which he refuses to pay, for which breach of faith his territories are laid waste by the encroachments of the sea, he is delivered from the rage of a sea monster by the valor of Hercules. Whom he in like manner defrauds, the hero is therefore obliged to besiege Troy, and take it by force of arms. Phoebus, with full revenge, from Molus flies. Darts through the air, and cleaves the liquid skies. Near Hellespont he lights, and treads the plains. Where great Laomedon's sole monarch reigns. Where, built between the two projecting strands. To Panomphian Jove an altar stands. Here first aspiring thoughts the king employ. To found the lofty towers of future Troy. The work, from schemes magnificent begun. At vast expense, was slowly carried on. Which Phoebus seeing, with the trident god. Who rules the swelling surges with his nod. Assuming each a mortal shape, combine. At a set price, to finish his design. The work was built, the king their price denies. 
and his injustice backs with perjuries. This Neptune could not brook, but drove the main. A mighty deluge, o'er the Phrygian plain. Twas all a sea, the waters of the deep. From every vale the copious harvest sweep. The briny billows overflow the soil. Ravage the fields, and mock the plowman's toil. Nor this appeased the god's revengeful mind. For still a greater plague remains behind. A huge sea monster lodges on the sands. And the king's daughter for his prey demands. To him, that saved the, damsel, was decreed. A set of horses of the sun's fine breed. But, when I'll see this from the rock untied. The trembling fair, the ransom was denied. He, in revenge, the new-built walls attacked. And the twice-perjured city bravely sacked. Telamon aided. And, in justice, shared. Part of the plunder as his due reward. The princess, rescued late, with all her charms. Hyssiony, was yielded to his arms. For Peleus, with a goddess bride. Was more. Proud of his spouse than of his birth before. Grandsons to Jove there might be more than one. But he the goddess had beloved alone. Story of Thetis and Peleus. Thetis, after assuming various shapes to avoid the importunities of Peleus, is at length compelled to yield her consent to the nuptials. For Proteus thus to virgin Thetis said. Fair goddess of the waves, consent to wed. And take some sprightly lover to your bed. A son you'll have, the terror of the field. To whom, in fame and power, his sire shall yield. Jove, who adored the nymph with boundless love. Did from his breast the dangerous flame remove. He knew the fates, nor cared to raise up one. Whose fame and greatness should eclipse his own. On happy Peleus he bestowed her charms. And blessed his grandson in the goddess arms. A silent creek Thessalia's coast can show. Two arms project, and shape it like a bow. Twould make a bay, but the transparent tide. Does scarce the yellow graveled bottom hide. For the quick eye may through the liquid wave. A firm, unweedy, level beach perceive. A grove of fragrant myrtle near it grows. Whose boughs, though thick, a beauteous grot disclose. The well-wrought fabric, to discerning eyes. Rather by art than nature seems to rise. A bridal dolphin oft fair Thetis bore. To this her loved retreat, her favorite shore. Here Peleus seized her, slumbering while she lay. And urged his suit with all that love could say. The nymph, o'erpowered, to art for succor flies. And various shapes the eager youth surprise. A bird she seems, but plies her wings in vain. His hands the fleeting substance still detain. A branchy tree high in the air she grew. About its bark his nimble arms he threw. A tiger next, she glares with flaming eyes. The frightened lover quits his hold, and flies. The sea gods he with sacred rites adores. Then a libation on the ocean pours. While the fat entrails crackle in the fire. And sheets of smoke, in sweet perfume, aspire. Till Proteus, rising from his oozy bed. Thus to the poor desponding lover said. No more in anxious thoughts your mind employ. For yet you shall possess the dear expected joy. You must, once more, the unwary nymph surprise. As coolly in her grot she slumbering lies. Then bind her fast with unrelenting hands. And strain her tender limbs with knotted bands. Still hold her under every different shape. Till, tired she tries no longer to escape. Thus he, then sunk beneath the glassy flood. And broken accents fluttered where he stood. Bright soul had almost now his journey done. And down the steepy western convex run. When the fair Nereid left the briny wave. And, as she used, retreated to her cave. He scarce had bound her fast, when she arose. And into various shapes her body throws. She went to move her arms, and found them tied. 
Then, with a sigh, some god assists ye, cried. And in her proper shape stood blushing by his side. About her waist his longing arms he flung. From which alliance great Achilles sprung. Transformation of Dedalion. Dedalion is so much afflicted at the death of his daughter Chione, that he throws himself from Mount Parnassus, and is changed into a hawk by Apollo. Peleus unmixed felicity enjoyed. Blessed in a valiant son and virtuous bride. Till fortune did in blood his hands embrew. And his own brother, by cursed chance. He slew. Then driven from Thessaly, his native clime. Trachinia first gave shelter to his crime. Where peaceful Sikhs mildly filled the throne. And like his sire, the morning planet. Shone. But now, unlike himself, bedewed with tears. Mourning a brother lost, his brow appears. First to the town, with travel spent and care. Peleus, and his small company, repair. His herds and flocks the while at leisure feed. On the rich pasture of a neighboring mead. The prince before the royal presence brought. Showed, by the suppliant olive, what he sought. Then tells his name, and race, and country, right. But hides the unhappy reason of his flight. He begs the king some little town to give. Where they may safe his faithful vassals live. Seeks replied, to all my bounty flows. A hospitable realm your suit has chose. Your glorious race, and far-resounding fame. And grandsire Jove, peculiar favors claim. All you can wish I grant, entreaty spare. My kingdom, would, twere worth the sharing, share. Tears stopped his speech, astonished Peleus pleads. To know the cause from whence his grief proceeds. The prince replied, there's none of ye but deems. This hawk was ever such as now it seems. No, twas a hero once, Dedalian named. For warlike deeds, and haughty valor, famed. Like me, to that bright luminary born. Who wakes Aurora, and brings on the morn. His fierceness still remains, and love of blood. Now dread of birds and tyrant of the wood. My make was softer, peace my greatest care. But this, my brother, wholly bent on war. Late, nations feared, and routed armies fled. That force, which now the timorous pigeons dread. A daughter he possessed, divinely fair. And scarcely yet had seen her fifteenth year. Young Kione. A thousand rivals strove. To win the maid, and teach her how to love. Phoebus and Mercury, by chance, one day. From Delphi and Silene passed this way. Together they the virgin saw, desire. At once warmed both their breasts with Amrau's fire. Her time complete nine circling moons had run. To either god she bore a lovely son. To Mercury Autolycus she brought. Who turned to thefts and tricks his subtle thought. Possessed he was of all his father's slight. At will made white look black, and black look white. Philemon born to Phoebus, like his sire. The muses loved, and finally struck the lyre and made his voice and touch in harmony conspire. In vain, fond maid, you boast this double birth. The love of gods, and royal father's worth. And Jove among your ancestors rehearse. Could blessing such as these e'er prove a curse? To her they did, who with audacious pride. Vain of her own, Diana's charms decried. Her taunts the goddess with resentment fill. My face you like not, you shall try my skill. She said, and straight her vengeful bow she strung. And sent a shaft, that pierced her guilty tongue. The bleeding tongue in vain its accents tries. In the red stream her soul reluctant flies. With sorrow wild I ran to her relief. And tried to moderate my brother's grief. He, deaf as rocks by stormy surges beat. Loudly laments, and hears me not entreat. When on the funeral pile he saw her laid. Thrice he to rush into the flames essayed. 
thrice with officious care by us was stayed. Now, mad with grief, away he fled amain. Like a stung heifer, that resents the pain. And, bellowing loudly, bounds along the plain. O'er the most rugged ways so fast he ran. He seemed a bird already, not a man. He left us breathless all behind, and now. In quest of death, had gained Parnassus' brow. But when from thence headlong himself he threw. He fell not, but with airy pinions flew. Phoebus in pity changed him to a fowl. Whose crooked beak and claws the birds control. Little of bulk, but of a warlike soul. A hawk become, the feathered race's foe. He tries to ease his own, by others' wa. A wolf turned into marble. A wolf, which desolates the plains of Trachinia, is changed into marble by the intercession of Thetis. While they astonished heard the king relate. These wonders of his hapless brother's fate. The prince's herdsman at the court arrives. And fresh surprise to all the audience gives. O oh, Peleus! Peleus! Dreadful news I bear! He said, and trembled as he spoke for fear. The worst affrighted Peleus bid him tell. While Sikhs too grew pale with friendly zeal. Thus he began, when soul mid heaven had gained. And half his way was passed, and half remained. I to the level shore my cattle drove. And let them freely in the meadows rove. Some stretched at length, admire the watery plain. Some cropped the herb, some wanton swam the main. A temple stands of antique make hard by. Where no gilt domes, or marble. Lure the eye. Unpolished rafters bear its lowly height. Hid by a grove, as ancient, from the sight. Here Nereus, and the Nereids they adore. I learned it from the man who thither bore. His net to dry it on the sunny shore. Adjoins a lake, enclosed with willows round. Where swelling waves have overflowed the mound. And muddy, stagnate, on the lower ground. From thence a rustling noise, increasing, flies. Strikes the still shore, and frights us with surprise. Straight a huge wolf rushed from the marshy wood. His jaws besmeared with mingled foam and blood. Though equally by hunger urged, and rage. His appetite he minds not to assuage. Not that he meets his rapid fury spares. But the whole herd with mad disorder tears. Some of our men, who strove to drive him thence. Torn by his teeth, have died in their defense. The echoing lakes, the sea, and fields, and shore. Empurpled blush with streams of reeking gore. Delay is loss, nor have we time for thought. While yet some few remain alive. We ought. To seize our arms, and, with confederate force. Try if we so can stop his bloody course. But Peleus cared not for his ruined herd. His crime he called to mind, and thence inferred. That Samothy's revenge this havoc made. In sacrifice to murdered Phocus shade. The king commands his servants to their arms. Resolve to go, but the loud noise alarms. His lovely queen, who from her chamber flew. And her half-plaited hair behind her threw. About his neck she hung with loving fears. And now with words, and now with pleading tears. Entreated that he'd send his men alone. And stay himself, to save two lives in one. Then Peleus, your just fears, O queen, forget. Too much the offer leaves me in your debt. No arms against the monster I shall bear. But the sea nymphs appease with humble prayer. The citadel's high turrets pierce the sky. Which homebound vessels glad, from far descry. This they ascend, and thence with sorrow ken. The mangled heifers lie, and bleeding men. The inexorable ravager they view. With blood discolored, still the rest pursue. There, Peleus prayed submissive towards the sea. And deprecates the ire of injured Samothy. But deaf to all his prayers the nymph remained. Till Thetis for her spouse the boon obtained. 
pleased with the luxury, the furious beast. Unstopped, continues still his bloody feast. While yet upon a sturdy bull he flew. Changed by the nymph, a marble block he grew. No longer dreadful now the wolf appears. Buried in stone, and vanished like their fears. Yet still the fates unhappy Peleus vexed. To the Magnesian shore he wanders next. A Castus there, who ruled the peaceful clime. Grants his request, and expiates his crime. Story of Seix and Alcyone Seix, the husband of Alcyone, is drowned while on a voyage to consult the oracle of Apollo, the wife is apprised, in a dream, of his fate. And throws herself into the sea, when she and Seix are transformed into Halcyons or Kingfishers. These prodigies affect the pious prince. But more perplexed with those that happened since. He purposes to seek the clarion god. Avoiding Delphi, his more famed abode. Since Phrygian robbers made unsafe the road. Yet could he not, from her he loved so well. The fatal voyage he resolved, conceal. But when she saw her lord prepared to part. A deadly cold ran shivering to her heart. Her faded cheeks are changed to box and hue. And in her eyes the tears are ever new. She thrice essayed to speak, her accents hung. And, faltering, died unfinished on her tongue. Or vanished into sighs, with long delay. Her voice returned, and found the wanted way. Tell me, my lord, she said, what fault unknown. Thy once beloved Alcyone has done. Whither? Ah! Whither is thy kindness gone? Can seeks, then, sustain to leave his wife? And, unconcerned, forsake the sweets of life? What can thy mind to this long journey move? Or needst thou absence to renew thy love? Yet, if thou goest by land, though grief possess. My soul, even then my fears will be the less. But, ah! Be warned to shun the watery way. The face is frightful of the stormy sea. For late I saw adrift disjointed planks. And empty tombs erected on the banks. Nor let false hopes to trust betray thy mind. Because my sire in caves constrains the wind. Can with a breath their clamorous rage appease. They fear his whistle. And forsake the seas. Not so. For, once indulged, they sweep the main. Deaf to the call, or, hearing, hear in vain. But bent on mischief bear the waves before. And not content with seas, insult the shore. When ocean, air, and earth at once engage. And rooted forests fly before their rage. At once the clashing clouds to battle move. And lightnings rim across the fields above. I know them well, and mark their rude comport. While yet a child within my father's court. In times of tempest they command alone. And he but sits precarious on the throne. The more I know, the more my fears augment. And fears are oft prophetic of the event. But if not fears, or reasons will prevail. If fate has fixed the obstinate to sail. Go not without thy wife, but let me bear my part of danger with an equal share. And present. What I suffer only fear. Then o'er the bounding billows shall we fly. Secure to live together, or to die. These reasons moved her star-like husband's heart. But still he held his purpose to depart. For as he loved her equal to his life. He would not to the seas expose his wife. Nor could be wrought his voyage to refrain but sought by arguments to soothe her pain. Nor these availed. At length he lights on one. With which so difficult a case he won. My love, so short an absence cease to fear. For by my father's holy flame I swear. Before two moons their orb with light adorn. If heaven allow me life, I will return. This promise of so short a stay prevails. He soon equips the ships, supplies the sails. And gives the word to launch. She trembling views. This pomp of death, 
and parting tears renews. Last with a kiss, she took a long farewell. Sight with a sad presage, and swooning fell. While Seek seeks delays, the lusty crew. Raised on their banks. Their oars in order drew. To their broad breasts, the ship with fury flew. The queen recovered, rears her humid eyes. And first her husband on the poop espies. Shaking his hand at distance on the main. She took the sign, and shook her hand again. Still as the ground recedes, contracts her view. With sharpened sight, till she no longer knew. The much-loved face. That comfort lost supplies. With less, and with the galley feeds her eyes. The galley borne from view by rising gales. She followed with her sight the flying sails. When even the flying sails were seen no more. Forsaken of all sight she left the shore. Then on her bridal bed her body throws. And sought in sleep her wearied eyes to close. Her husband's pillow, and the widowed part. Which once he pressed, renewed the former smart. And now a breeze from shore began to blow. The sailors ship their oars, and cease to row. Then hoist their yards a trip, and all their sails. Let fall, to court the wind. And catch the gales. By this the vessel half her course had run. And as much rested till the rising sun. Both shores were lost to sight, when at the close. Of day a stiffer gale at east arose. The sea grew white, the rolling waves from far. Like heralds, first denounced the watery war. This scene, the master soon began to cry. Strike, strike the topsail, let the mainsheet fly. And furl your sails, the winds repel the sound. And in the speaker's mouth the speech is drowned. Yet of their own accord, as danger taught. Each in his way, officiously they wrought. Some stow their oars, or stop the leaky sides. Another bolder, yet the yard bestrides. And folds the sails, a fourth with labor laves. The intruding seas, and waves ejects on waves. In this confusion, while their work they ply. The winds augment the winter of the sky. And wage intestine wars, the suffering seas. Are tossed, and mingled, as their tyrants please. The master would command, but, in despair. Of safety, stands amazed with stupid care. Nor what to bid, or what forbid he knows. The ungoverned tempest to such fury grows. Vain is his force, and vainer is his skill. With such a concourse comes the flood of ill. The cries of men are mixed with rattling shrouds. Seas dash on seas, and clouds encounter clouds. At once from east to west, from pole to pole. The forky lightnings flash, the roaring thunders roll. Now waves on waves ascending scale the skies. And in the fires above the water fries. When yellow sands are sifted from below. The glittering billows give a golden show. And when the fowler bottom spews the black. The Stygian dye the tainted waters take. Then frothy white appear the flatted seas. And change their color, changing their disease. Like various fits the Trochian vessel finds. And now sublime, she rides upon the winds. As from a lofty summit looks from high. And from the clouds beholds the nether sky. Now from the depth of hell they lift their sight. And at a distance see superior light. The lashing billows make a loud report. And beat her sides, as battering rams a fort. Or as a lion bounding in his way. With force augmented, bears against his prey. Sidelong to seize, or unappalled with fear. Springs on the toils, and rushes on the spear. So seas impelled by winds, with added power. Assault the sides, and o'er the hatches tower. The planks, their pitchy covering washed away. Now yield, and now a yawning breach display. The roaring waters with a hostile tide. Rush through the ruins of her gaping side. Meantime in sheets of rain the sky descends. 
and ocean swelled with waters upward tens. One rising, falling one, the heavens and sea. Meet at their confines, in the middle way. The sails are drunk with showers, and drop with rain. Sweet waters mingle with the briny main. No star appears to lend his friendly light. Darkness and tempest make a double night. But flashing fires disclose the deep by turns. And while the lightnings blaze, the water burns. Now all the waves their scattered force unite. And, as a soldier foremost in the fight, make way for others, and a host alone. Still presses on, and urging gains the town. So, while the invading billows come abreast, the hero tenth advanced before the rest, sweeps all before him with impetuous sway, and from the walls descends upon the prey. Part following enter, part remain without. With envy hear their fellows conquering shout, and mount on others' backs, in hopes to share. The city, thus become the seat of war. A universal cry resounds aloud. The sailors run in heaps, a helpless crowd. Art fails, and courage fails, no succor near. As many waves, as many deaths appear. One weeps, and yet despairs of late relief. One cannot weep, his fears congeal his grief. But, stupid, with dry eyes expects his fate. One with loud shrieks laments his lost estate. And calls those happy, whom their funerals wait. This wretch with prayers and vows the gods implores. And even the skies he cannot see. Adores. That other, on his friends his thoughts bestows. His careful father, and his faithful spouse. The covetous worldling, in his anxious mind. Thinks only on the wealth he left behind. All seeks his Alcyone employs. For her he grieves, yet in her absence joys. His wife he wishes, and would still be near. Not her with him, but wishes him with her. Now with last looks he seeks his native shore. Which fate has destined him to see no more. He sought, but, in the dark tempestuous night. He knew not whither to direct his sight. So whirl the seas, such darkness blinds the sky. That the black night receives a deeper dye. The giddy ship ran round, the tempest tore. Her mast, and overboard the rudder bore. One billow mounts, and with a scornful brow. Proud of her conquest gained, insults the waves below. Nor lighter falls, than if some giant tore. Pindus and Athos with the freight they bore. And tossed on seas, pressed with the ponderous blow. Down sinks the ship within the abyss below. Down with the vessel sink into the main. The many, never more to rise again. Some few on scattered planks, with fruitless care. Lay hold, and swim, but while they swim despair. Even he who laid a scepter did command. Now grasps a floating fragment in his hand. And while he struggles on the stormy main. Invokes his father, and his wife's, in vain. But yet his consort is his greatest care. Alcyone he names amid his prayer. Names as a charm against the waves and wind. Most in his mouth, and ever in his mind. Tired with his toil, all hopes of safety past. From prayeress to wishes he descends at last. That his dead body, wafted to the sands. Might have its burial from her friendly hands. As oft as he can catch a gulp of air. And peep above the seas, he names the fair. And even when plunged beneath, on her he raves. Murmuring Alcyone below the waves. At last a falling billow stops, his breath. Breaks o'er his head, and whelms him underneath. Bright Lucifer unlike himself appears. That night, his heavenly form obscured with tears. And since he was forbid to leave the skies. He muffled with a cloud his mournful eyes. Meantime Alcyone, his fate unknown. Computes how many nights he had been gone. Observes the waning moon with hourly view. Numbers her age, and wishes for a new. Against the promised time provides with care. 
and hastens in the woof the robes he was to wear. And for herself employs another loom. New dressed to meet her lord returning home. Flattering her heart with joys that never were to come. She fumed the temples with an odorous flame. And oft before the sacred altars came. To pray for him, who was an empty name. All powers implored, but far above the rest. To Juno she her pious vows addressed. Her much-loved lord from perils to protect and safe o'er sees his voyage to direct. Then prayed. That she might still possess his heart. And no pretending rival share apart. This last petition heard of all her prayer. The rest, dispersed by winds, were lost in air. But she, the goddess of the nuptial bed. Tired with her vain devotions for the dead. Resolved the tainted hand should be repelled. Which incense offered and her altar held. Then Iris thus bespoke, Thou faithful maid, by whom thy queen's commands are well conveyed. Haste to the house of sleep, and bid the god, who rules the night by visions with a nod. Prepare a dream, in figure and in form, resembling him who perished in the storm. This form before Alcyone present, to make her certain of the sad event. Endued with robes of various hue, she flies. And flying draws an arch, a segment of the skies. Then leaves her bending bow, and from the steep. Descends. To search the silent house of sleep. Near the Cimmerians, in his dark abode. Deep in a cavern dwells the drowsy god. Whose gloomy mansion nor the rising sun. Nor setting, visits. Nor the lightsome noon but lazy vapors round the region fly. Perpetual twilight, and a doubtful sky. No crowing cock does there his wings display. Nor with his horny bill provoke the day. Nor watchful dogs, nor the more wakeful geese. Disturb with nightly noise the sacred peace. Nor beast of nature, nor the tame are nigh. Nor trees with tempests rocked, nor human cry but safe repose, without an air of breath. Dwells here, and a dumb quiet next to death. An arm of Lethe, with a gentle flow. Arising upward from the rock below. The palace motes, and o'er the pebbles creeps. And with soft murmurs calls the coming sleeps. Around its entry nodding poppies grow. And all cool simples that sweet rest bestow. Night from the plants their sleepy virtue drains and, passing, sheds it on the silent plains. No door there was, the unguarded house to keep. On creaking hinges turned, to break his sleep. But in the gloomy court was raised a bed. Stuffed with black plumes, and on an ebon, stead. Black was the covering too, where lay the god. And slept supine, his limbs displayed abroad. About his head fantastic visions fly which various images of things supply, and mock their forms, the leaves on trees not more, nor bearded ears in fields, nor sands upon the shore. The virgin entering bright, indulged the day, to the brown cave, and brushed the dreams away. The god, disturbed with this new glare of light, cast sudden on his face, unsealed his sight, and raised his tardy head, which sunk again and, sinking, on his bosom knocked his chin. At length shook off himself, and asked the dame. And asking yawned, for what intent she came. To whom the goddess thus, O sacred rest! Sweet pleasing sleep, of all the powers the best! O peace of mind! Repairer of decay! Whose bombs renew the limbs to labors of the day! Care shuns thy soft approach, and sullen flies away. Adorn a dream, expressing human form. The shape of him who suffered in the storm. And send it flitting to the Trochin court. The wreck of wretched seeks to report. Before his queen bid the pale specter stand. Who begs a vain relief at Juno's hand. She said, and scarce awake her eyes could keep. Unable to support the fumes of sleep. 
but fled, returning by the way she went. And swerved along her bow with swift ascent. The god, uneasy till he slept again. Resolved at once to rid himself of pain. And, though against his custom, called aloud. Exciting Morpheus from the sleepy crowd. Morpheus, of all his numerous train, expressed. The shape of man, and imitated best. The walk, the words, the gesture, could supply. The habit mimic, and the mean belly. Plays well, but all his action is confined. Extending not beyond our humankind. Another, birds, and beasts, and dragons apes. And dreadful images, and monster shapes. This demon, Islos, in heaven's high hall. The gods have named, but men Phobder call. A third is Phantasis, whose actions roll. On meaner thoughts, and things devoid of soul. Earth, fruits, and flowers, he represents in dreams. And solid rocks unmoved, and running streams. These three to kings and chiefs their scenes display. The rest before the ignoble commons play. Of these the chosen Morpheus is dispatched. Which done, the lazy monarch, overwatched. Down from his propping elbow drops his head. Dissolved in sleep, and shrinks within his bed. Darkling the demon glides, for flight prepared. So soft, that scarce his fanning wings are heard. To Trachin, swift as thought, the flitting shade. Through air his momentary journey made. Then lays aside the steerage of his wings. Forsakes his proper form, assumes the king's. And, pale as death, despoiled of his array. Into the queen's apartment takes his way. And stands before the bed at dawn of day. Unmoved his eyes, and wet his beard appears. And shedding vain, but seeming real, tears. The briny waters dropping from his hairs. Then, staring on her with a ghastly look. And hollow voice, he thus the queen bespoke. Knowst thou not me? Not yet, unhappy wife? Or are my features perished with my life? Look once again, and for thy husband lost. Lo! All that's left of him, thy husband's ghost. Thy vows for my return were all in vain. The stormy south o'er took us in the main. And never shalt thou see thy living lord again. Bear witness heaven, I called on thee in death. And, while I called, a billow stopped my breath. Think not that flying fame reports my fate. I present, I appear, and my own wreck relate. Rise, wretched widow, rise, nor undeplored. Permit my soul to pass the Stygian ford. But rise, prepared in black, to mourn thy perished lord. Thus said the player God, and adding art. A voice and gesture, so performed his part. She thought, so like her love the shade appears. That Seek spoke the words. And Seek's shed the tears. She groaned, her inward soul with grief oppressed. She sighed, she wept, and, sleeping, beat her breast. Then stretched her arms to embrace his body bare. Her clasping arms enclose but empty air. At this, not yet awake, she cried, O oh, stay! One is our fate, and common is our way. So dreadful was the dream, so loud she spoke. That, starting sudden up, the slumber broke. Then cast her eyes around, in hope to view. Her vanished lord, and find the vision true. For now the maids, who waited her commands. Ran in with lighted tapers in their hands. Tired with the search, not finding what she seeks. With cruel blows she pounds her blubbered cheeks. Then from her beaten breast the linen tear. And cut the golden call that bound her hair. Her nurse demands the cause, with louder cries. She prosecutes her griefs, and thus replies. No more Alcyone. She suffered death. With her loved lord, when seeks lost his breath. No flattery, no false comfort, give me none. My shipwrecked seeks is for ever gone. 
I saw, I saw him manifest in view. His voice, his figure, and his gestures knew. His luster lost, and every living grace. Yet I retained the features of his face. Though with pale cheeks, wet beard, and dropping hair. None but my Sikhs could appear so fair. I would have strained him with a strict embrace. But through my arms he slipped, and vanished from the place. There, Evan just there, he stood, and, as she spoke. Where last the spectre was she cast her look. Fain would she hope, and gazed upon the ground. If any printed footsteps might be found. Then sight, and said, This I too well foreknew. And my prophetic fears presaged too true. Twas what I begged, when with a bleeding heart. I took my leave. And suffered thee to part. Or I to go along, or thou to stay. Never, ah! Never, to divide our way. Happier for me, that all our hours assigned. Together we had lived, Evan not in death disjoined. So had my Sikh still been living here. Or with my Sikhs I had perished there. Now I die absent, in the vast profound. And me, without myself, the seas have drowned. The storms were not so cruel, should I strive. To lengthen life, and such a grief survive. But neither will I strive, nor wretched thee. In death forsake, but keep thee company. If not one common sepulchre contains. Our bodies, or one urn our last remains. Yet Sikhs and El Sione shall join. Their names remembered in one common line. No further voice her mighty grief affords. For sighs come rushing in between her words. And stopped her tongue. But what her tongue denied. Soft tears, and groans, and dumb complaints supplied. Twas morning, to the port she takes her way. And stands upon the margin of the sea. That place, that very spot of ground, she sought. Or thither by her destiny was brought. Where last he stood. And while she sadly said. Twas here he left me, lingering here delayed. His parting kiss, and there his anchors wait. Thus speaking, while her thoughts past actions trace. And call to mind, admonished by the place. Sharp at her utmost ken she cast her eyes. And somewhat floating from afar descries. It seemed a corpse adrift to distant sight. But at a distance who could judge aright? It wafted nearer yet, and then she knew. That what before she but surmised was true. A corpse it was, but whose it was unknown. Yet moved, however, she made the case her own. Took the bad omen of a shipwrecked man. As for a stranger wept, and thus began. Poor wretch! On stormy seas to lose thy life. Unhappy thou, but more thy widowed wife. At this she paused, for now the flowing tide. Had brought the body nearer to the side. The more she looks, the more her fears increase. At nearer sight, and she's herself the less. Now driven ashore, and at her feet it lies. She knows too much in knowing whom she sees. Her husband's corpse, at this she loudly shrieks. Tis he. Tis he. She cries, and tears her cheeks. Her hair, and vest, and stooping to the sands. About his neck she cast her trembling hands. And is it thus, O oh dearer than my life? Thus, thus returnst thou to thy longing wife? She said, and to the neighboring mole she strode. Raised there to break the incursions of the flood. Headlong from hence to plunge herself she springs. But shoots along. Supported on her wings. A bird new made, about the banks she plies. Not far from shore, and short excursions tries. Nor seeks in air her humble flight to raise. Content to skim the surface of the seas. Her bill, though slender, sends a creaking noise. And imitates a lamentable voice. Now lighting where the bloodless body lies. She, with a funeral note, renews her cries. At all her stretch, her little wings she spread. 
and with her feathered arms embraced the dead. Then flickering to his pallid lips, she strove. To print a kiss, the last essay of love. Whether the vital touch revived the dead. Or that the moving waters raised his head. To meet the kiss, the vulgar doubt alone. For sure a present miracle was shown. The gods their shapes to winter birds translate. But both obnoxious to their former fate. Their conjugal affection still is tied. And still the mournful race is multiplied. The raging Aeolus at length is kind. Calms every storm, and hushes every wind. Prepares his empire for his daughter's ease. And for his hatching nephews smooths the seas. Isacus transformed into a cormorant. Isacus, a prince of Troy, becomes enamored of Hesperia, whom he pursues into the woods. Where the maiden is killed by the venom of a snake, her lover in despair throws himself into the sea, and is changed into a cormorant. These some old man sees wanton in the air. And praises the unhappy constant pair. Then to his friend the long-necked cormorant shows. The former tale reviving others' woes. That sable bird, he cries, which cuts the flood. With slender legs, was once of royal blood. His ancestors from mighty Tros proceed. The brave Laomedon, and Ganymede. Whose beauty tempted Jove to steal the boy. And Priam, hapless prince. Who fell with Troy. Himself was Hector's brother, and, had fate. But given this hopeful youth a longer date. Perhaps had rivaled warlike Hector's worth. Though on the mother's side of meaner birth. Fair Alexotho, a country maid. Bear Isacus, by stealth, in Ida's shade. He fled the noisy town, and pompous court. Loved the lone hills and simple rural sport. And seldom to the city would resort. Yet he no rustic clownishness professed. Nor was soft love a stranger to his breast. The youth had long the nymph Hesperia wooed. Oft through the thicket, or the mead, pursued. Her haply on her father's bank he spied. While fearless she her silver tresses dried. Away she fled, not stags with half such speed. Before the prowling wolf, scud o'er the mead. Not ducks, when they the safer flood forsake. Pursued by hawks, so swift regain the lake. As fast he followed in the hot career. Desire the lover winged, the virgin fear. A snake unseen now pierced her heedless foot. Quick through the veins the venom juices shoot. She fell, and, scaped by death his fierce pursuit. Her lifeless body, fright, he embraced. And cried, Not this I dreaded, but thy haste. Oh! Had my love been less, or less thy fear. The victory, thus bought, is far too dear. A cursed snake. Yet I more cursed than he. He gave the wound, the cause was given by me. Yet none shall say, that unrevenged you died. He spoke, then climbed a cliff's o'erhanging side. And, resolute, leaped on the foaming tide. Tethys received him gently on the wave. The death he sought denied, and feathers gave. Debarred the surest remedy of grief. And forced to live, he cursed th, unasked relief. Then on his airy pinions upward flies. And at a second fall successless tries. The downy plume a quick descent denies. Enraged, he often dives beneath the wave. And there in vain expects to find a grave. His ceaseless sorrow for the unhappy maid. Meagred his look, and on his spirits prayed. Still near the sounding deep he lives, his name. From frequent diving and emerging came. Book. Chapter 12. Trojan War. Preparations are making by the Greeks for the hostile invasion of Troy, Iphigenia, the daughter of Agamemnon, is about to be sacrificed to Diana. When her life is saved by the indulgent goddess, and a hind substituted in her stead. Priam, to whom the story was unknown. As dead, deplored his metamorphosed son. A cenotaph his name and title kept. 
and Hector round the tomb, with all his brothers, wept. This pious office Paris did not share. Absent alone, and author of the war. Which, for the Spartan queen, the Grecians drew. To avenge the rape, and Asia to subdue. A thousand ships were manned to sail the sea. Nor had their just resentments found delay. Had not the winds and waves opposed their way. At Aulis, with united powers, they meet. But there, cross winds or calms detained the fleet. Now, while they raise an altar on the shore. And Jove with solemn sacrifice adore. A boating sign the priests and people see. A snake of size immense ascends a tree. And in the leafy summit spied a nest. Which o'er her callow young a sparrow pressed. Eight were the birds, unfledged, their mother flew. And hovered round her care, but still in view. Till the fierce reptile first devoured the brood. Then seized the fluttering dam, and drank her blood. This dire ostent the fearful people view. Calchas alone, by Phoebus taught, foreknew. What heaven decreed. And with a smiling glance. Thus gratulates to Greece her happy chance. O Argives, we shall conquer, Troy is ours. But long delays shall first afflict our powers. Nine years of labor the nine birds portend. The tenth shall in the town's destruction end. The serpent, which his maw obscene had filled. The branches in his curled embraces held. But, as in spires he stood, he turned to stone. The stony snake retained the figure still his own. Yet, not for this, the wind-bound navy wait. Slack were their sails, and Neptune disobeyed. Some thought him loath the town should be destroyed. Whose building had his hands divine employed. Not so the seer, who knew, and known foreshowed. The virgin Phoebe. With a virgin's blood. Must first be reconciled. The common cause. Prevailed, and pity yielding to the laws. Fair Iphigenia, the devoted maid. Was, by the weeping priests, in linen robes arrayed. All mourn her fate, but no relief appeared. The royal victim bound, the knife already reared. When that offended power, who caused their wa. Relenting ceased her wrath, and stopped the coming blow. A mist before the ministers she cast. And, in the virgin's room, a hind she placed. The ablation slain, and Phoebe reconciled. The storm was hushed, and dimpled ocean smiled. A favorable gale arose from shore. Which to the port desired the Grecian galleys bore. House of Fame. The goddess Fame reports through the whole world the invasion of Troy, Protesilaus, who first lands on the hostile shore, is slain by Hector. Full in the midst of this created space. Between heaven, earth, and skies, there stands a place. Confining on all three, with triple bound. Whence all things, though remote, are viewed around. And thither bring their undulating sound. The palace of loud fame, her seat of power. Placed on the summit of a lofty tower. A thousand winding entries long and wide. Receive of fresh reports a flowing tide. A thousand crannies in the walls are made. Nor gate, nor bars, exclude the busy trade. Tis built of brass, the better to diffuse. The spreading sounds, and multiply the news. Where echoes in repeated echoes play. A mart for ever full, and open night and day. Nor silence is within, nor voice express but a deaf noise of sounds, that never cease. Confused, and chiding, like the hollow roar. Of tides receding from the insulted shore. Or like the broken thunder heard from far. When Jove to distance drives the rolling war. The courts are filled with a tumultuous din. Of crowds, or issuing forth, or entering in. A thoroughfare of news, where some devise. Things never heard, some mingle truth with lies. The troubled air with empty sounds they beat. Intent to hear, and eager to repeat. Error sits brooding there, with added train. 
of vain credulity, and joys as vain. Suspicion, with sedition joined, are near. And rumors raised, and murmurs mixed, and panic fear. Fame sits aloft, and sees the subject ground. And sees about, and skies above, inquiring all around. The goddess gives the alarm, and soon is known. The Grecian fleet descending on the town. Fixed on defense, the Trojans are not slow. To guard their shore from an expected foe. They meet in fight. By Hector's fatal hand. Protesilaus falls, and bites the strand. Which with expense of blood the Grecians won. And proved the strength unknown of Priam's son. And to their cost the Trojan leaders felt. The Grecian heroes, and what deaths they dealt. Story of Sickness Sickness, a son of Neptune, and invulnerable in every part of his body, is at length strangled by Achilles, who strips him of his armor, when he is changed into a swan. From these first onsets, the Sigean shore was strewed with carcasses, and stained with gore. Neptunian sickness troops of Greeks had slain. Achilles in his car had scoured the plain and cleared the Trojan ranks, where'er he fought. Sickness, or Hector, through the fields he sought. Sickness he found. On him his force essayed. For Hector was to the tenth year delayed. His white-maned steeds, that bowed beneath the yoke. He cheered to courage, with a gentle stroke. Then urged his fiery chariot on the foe. And rising shook his lance, in act to throw. But first, he cried, O youth, be proud to bear. Thy death, ennobled by Pelide spear. The lance pursued the voice without delay. Nor did the whizzing weapon miss the way. But pierced his cuirass, with such fury sent. And signed his bosom with a purple dint. At this the seed of Neptune, goddess born. For ornament, not use, these arms are worn. This helm, and heavy buckler, I can spare. As only decorations of the war. So Mars is armed for glory, not for need. Tis somewhat more from Neptune to proceed. Than from a daughter of the sea to spring. Thy sire is mortal, mine is ocean's king. Secure of death, I should contemn thy dart. Though naked, and impassable depart. He said, and threw. The trembling weapon passed. Through nine bull hides, each under other placed. On his broad shield, and stuck within the last. Achilles wrenched it out, and sent again. The hostile gift, the hostile gift was vain. He tried a third, a tough, well-chosen spear. The inviolable body stood sincere. Though sickness then did no defense provide but scornful offered his unshielded side. Not otherwise the impatient hero fared. Then as a bull encompassed with a guard. Amid the circus roars. Provoked from far. By sight of scarlet and a sanguine war. They quit their ground. His bended horns elude. In vain pursuing, and in vain pursued. Before to further fight he would advance. He stood considering, and surveyed his lance. Doubts if he wielded not a wooden spear. Without a point, he looked, the point was there. This is my hand, and this my lance, he said. By which so many thousand foes are dead. Oh whither is their usual virtue fled? I had it once, and the Lernetian wall. And Tenedos, confessed it in their fall. Thy streams, Caicus, rolled a crimson flood. And Thebes ran red with her own native's blood. Twice Telephus employed their piercing steel. To wound him first, and afterward to heal. The vigor of this arm was never vain. And that my wanted prowess I retain. Witness these heaps of slaughter on the plain. He said. And, doubtful of his former deeds. So some new trial of his force proceeds. He chose Menaedes from among the rest. At him he launched his spear, and pierced his breast. On the hard earth the Lycian knocked his head. And lay supine, and forth the spirit fled. 
Then thus the hero, neither can I blame. The hand or javelin, both are still the same. The same I will employ against this foe. And wish but with the same success to throw. So spoke the chief, and while he spoke he threw. The weapon with unerring fury flew. At his left shoulder aimed, nor entrance found. But back, as from a rock, with swift rebound. Harmless returned, a bloody mark appeared. Which, with false joy, the flattered hero cheered. Wound there was none. The blood that was in view. The lance before from slain Menaides drew. Headlong he leaps from off his lofty car. And in close fight on foot renews the war. Raging with high disdain. Repeats his blows. Nor shield nor armor can their force oppose. Huge cantlets of his buckler strew the ground. And no defense in his bored arms is found. But on his flesh no wound or blood is seen. The sword itself is blunted on the skin. This vain attempt the chief no longer bears. But round his hollow temples and his ears. His buckler beats, the son of Neptune, stunned. With these repeated buffets, quits his ground. A sickly sweat succeeds, and shades of night. Inverted nature swims before his sight. The insulting victor presses on the moor. And treads the steps the vanquished trod before. Nor rest nor respite gives. A stone there lay. Behind his trembling foe, and stopped his way. Achilles took the advantage which he found. Erdern D, and pushed him backward on the ground. His buckler held him under, while he pressed. With both his knees above his panting breast. Unlaced his helm, about his chin the twist. He tied, and soon the strangled soul dismissed. With eager haste he went to strip the dead. The vanished body from his arms was fled. His sea god sire, to immortalize his frame, had turned it to the bird that bears his name. A truce succeeds the labors of this day. And arms suspended with a long delay. While Trojan walls are kept with watch and ward. The Greeks before their trenches mount the guard. The feast approached. When to the blue-eyed maid. His vows for sickness slain the victor paid. And a white heifer on her altar laid. The reeking entrails on the fire they threw. And to the gods the grateful odor flew. Heaven had its part in sacrifice, the rest. Was broiled and roasted for the future feast. The chief invited guests were set around. And, hunger first assuaged, the bowls were crowned. Which in deep draughts their cares and labors drowned. The mellow harp did not their ears employ. And mute was all the warlike symphony. Discourse, the food of souls, was their delight. And pleasing chat prolonged the summer's night. The subject, deeds of arms, and valor shone. Or on the Trojan side, or on their own. Of dangers undertaken, fame achieved. They talked by turns, the talk by turns relieved. What things but these could fierce Achilles tell? Or what could fierce Achilles hear so well? The last great act performed, of sickness slain. Did most the martial audience entertain. Wondering to find a body free by fate. From steel, and which could ev end that steel rebate. Amazed, their admiration they renew. And scarce Pelides could believe it true. Story of Senus. The nymph Canis, having suffered violence from Neptune, prevails on her ravisher to change her sex, and make her invulnerable. Then Nestor thus, what once this age has known. In faded sickness, and in him alone. These eyes have seen in Senus long before. Whose body not a thousand swords could bore. Senus in courage and in strength excelled. And still his authories with his fame is filled. But what did most his martial deeds adorn? Though since he changed his sex, a woman born. A novelty so strange, and full of fate. His listening audience asked him to relate. Achilles thus commends their common suit. O father, first for prudence in repute. 
tell, with that eloquence so much thy own. What thou hast heard. Or what of Senus known. What was he? Whence his change of sex begun? What trophies, joined in wars with thee, he won? Who conquered him, and in what fatal strife? The youth, without a wound, could lose his life? Neliads then, though tardy age and time, have shrunk my sinews and decayed my prime. Though much I have forgotten of my store. Yet, not exhausted, I remember more. Of all that arms achieved, or peace designed. That action still is fresher in my mind. Then aught beside. If reverend age can give. To faith a sanction, in my third I live. Twas in my second century I surveyed. Young Canis, then a fair Thessalian maid. Canis the bright, was born to high command. A princess, and a native of thy land. Divine Achilles, every tongue proclaimed. Her beauty, and her eyes all hearts inflamed. Peleus, thy sire, perhaps had sought her bed. Among the rest, but he had either led. Thy mother then, or was by promise tied. But she to him, and all, alike her love denied. It was her fortune once to take her way. Along the sandy margin of the sea. The power of ocean viewed her as she passed. And, loved as soon as seen, by force embraced. Then thus. Transported, to the nymph he cried. Ask what thou wilt, no prayer shall be denied. This also fame relates. The haughty fair. Who not the rape evan of a god could bear. This answer, proud, returned, to mighty wrongs. A mighty recompense, of right. Belongs. Give me no more to suffer such a shame. But change the woman for a better name. One gift for all, she said, and while she spoke. A stern, majestic, manly tone she took. A man she was, and, as the godhead swore. To Senus turned, who Canis was before. To this the lover adds, without request. No force of steel should violate his breast. Glad of the gift, the new-made warrior goes. And arms among the Greeks, and longs for equal foes. Skirmish between the centaurs and Lapithites. The marriage of Pyrithoas, king of the Lapithi, with Hippodamia, is rendered memorable by a furious contest with their centaur guests. Who endeavor to seize the bride, but are defeated. Now brave Pyrithoas, bold Ixion's son. The love of fair Hippodame had won. The cloud-begotten race, half men, half beast. Invited, came to grace the nuptial feast. In a cool cave's recess the treat was made. Whose entrance trees with spreading boughs o'er shade. They sat, and, summoned by the bridegroom, came. To mix with those the Lapithian name. Nor wanted I. The roofs with joy resound. And, Hymen, Io Hymen, rung around. Raised altars shone with holy fires, the bride. Lovely herself, and lovely, by her side. A bevy of bright nymphs, with sober grace. Came glittering like a star. And took her place. Her heavenly form beheld, all wished her joy. And little wanted. But in vain their wishes all employ. For one, most brutal of the brutal brood. Or whether wine or beauty fired his blood. Or both at once, beheld with joyful eyes. The bride. At once resolved to make his prize. Down went the board, and, fastening on her hair. He seized with sudden force the fright fair. Twas Eurydice began, his bestial kind. His crime pursued. And each, as pleased his mind. O'er her whom chance presented, took, the feast. An image of a taken town expressed. The cave resounds with female shrieks. We rise. Mad with revenge, to make a swift reprise. And Theseus first, what frenzy has possessed. O Eurydice, he cried, thy brutal breast. To wrong Pyrithoas, and not him alone. 
but while I live, two friends conjoined in one. To justify his threat, he thrusts aside the crowd of centaurs, and redeems the bride. The monster not replied, for words were vain. And deeds could only deeds unjust maintain. But answers with his hand, and forward pressed. With blows redoubled, on his face and breast. An ample goblet stood, of antique mold. And rough with figures of the rising gold. The hero snatched it up, and tossed in air. Full at the front of the foul ravisher. He falls, and falling, vomits forth a flood. Of wine, and foam, and brains, and mingled blood. Half roaring, and half neighing, through the hall. Arms. Arms, the double formed with fury call. To wreak their brother's death, a medley flight. Of bowls and jars at first supply the fight. Once instruments of feasts, but now of fate. Wine animates their rage, and arms their hate. Bold Amicus from the robbed vestry brings. The chalices of heaven, and holy things. Of precious weight, a sconce that hung on high. With tapers filled, to light the sacristy. Torn from the cord, with his unhallowed hand. He threw amid the Lapathian band. On Celadon the ruin fell, and left. His face of feature, and of form bereft. So, when some brawny sacrificer knocks. Before an altar led, an offered ox. His eyeballs, rooted out. Are thrown to ground. His nose, dismantled, in his mouth is found. His jaws, cheeks, front, one undistinguished wound. This Belatez, the avenger, could not brook. But, by the foot, a maple board he took. And hurled at Amicus, his chin it bent. Against his chest, and down the centaur sent. Whom, sputtering bloody teeth, the second blow. Of his drawn sword dispatched to shades below. Grinius was near, and cast a furious look. On the side altar, sensed with sacred smoke. And bright with flaming fires, the gods, he cried. Have with their holy trade our hands supplied. Why use we not their gifts? Then from the floor. An altar stone he heaved, with all the load it bore. Altar, and altar's freight, together flew. Where thickest thronged the Lapathian crew. And at once Brotes and Aureus slew. Aureus' mother, Mycale, was known. Down from her sphere to draw the laboring moon. Exadius cried, Unpunished shall not go. This fact, if arms are found against the foe. He looked about, where on a pine were spread. The votive horns of a stag's branching head. At Grinius these he throws. So just they fly. That the sharp antlers stuck in either eye. Breathless and blind he fell, with blood besmeared. His eyeballs, beaten out, hung dangling on his beard. Fierce Retus from the hearth a burning brand. Selects, and whirling waves, till from his hand. The fire took flame, then dashed it on the right. On fair Carax's temples. Near the site. The whistling pest came on, and pierced the bone. And caught the yellow hair, that shriveled while it shone. Caught, like dry stubble fired, or like sear wood. Yet from the wound ensued no purple flood but looked a bubbling mass of frying blood. His blazing lock sent forth a crackling sound. And hissed, like red-hot iron within the smithy drowned. The wounded warrior shook his flaming hair. Then, what a team of horse could hardly rear. He heaves the threshold stone, but could not throw. The weight itself forbade the threatened blow. Which, dropping from his lifted arms, came down full on Comet's head, and crushed his crown. Nor Retus then restrained his joy, but said. So by their fellows may our foes be sped. Then with redoubled strokes he plies his head. The burning lever not deludes his pains. But drives the battered skull within the brains. Thus flushed, the conqueror, with force renewed. Evagris, Dryas, Corythus, 
pursued. First Cory thus, with downy cheeks, he slew. Whose fall when fierce Evagris had in view. He cried, What palm is from a beardless prey? Rita's prevents what more he had to say. And drove within his mouth the fiery death. Which entered hissing in, and choked his breath. At Dryas next he flew, but weary chance. No longer would the same success advance. For while he whirled in fiery circles round. The brand, a sharpened stake strong Dryas found. And in the shoulder's joint inflicts the wound. The weapon stuck, which, roaring out with pain. He drew, nor longer durst the fight maintain. But turned his back, for fear, and fled amain. With him fled Ornus, with like dread possessed. Thomas, and Medan, wounded in the breast. And Mermeros, in the late race renowned. Now limping ran, and tardy, with his wound. Pholus and Melanius from fight withdrew. And Abbas maimed, who boars encountering slew. And Augur Astilos, whose art in vain. From fight dissuaded the four-footed train. Now beat the hoof with Nessus on the plain. But to his fellow cried, Be safely slow. Thy death deferred is due to great Alcides' bow. Meantime strong Dryas urged his chance so well. That Lycidas, Arios, Imbrius, fell. All one by one, and fighting face to face. Craneus fled, to fall with more disgrace. For, fearful, while he looked behind, he bore. Between his nose and front, the blow before. Amid the noise and tumult of the fray. Snoring, and drunk with wine, aphidas lay. Evan then the bowl within his hand he kept. And on a bear's rough hide securely slept. Him Forbus with his flying dart transfixed. Take thy next draught with Stygian waters mixed. And sleep thy fill, the insulting victor cried. Surprised with death unfelt, the centaur died. The ruddy vomit, as he breathed his soul. Repassed his throat. And filled his empty bowl. I saw Patrius' arms employed around. A well-grown oak, to root it from the ground. This way and that he wrenched the fibrous bands. The trunk was like a sapling in his hands. And still obeyed the bent, while thus he stood. Perithous dart drove on, and nailed him to the wood. Lycus and Chromis fell. By him oppressed. Helops and Dictis added to the rest. A nobler palm, Helops through either ear. Transfixed, received the penetrating spear. This Dictis saw, and. Seized with sudden fright. Leaped headlong from the hill of steepy height. And crushed an ash beneath, that could not bear his weight. The shattered tree receives his fall. And strikes. Within his full-blown paunch the sharpened spikes. Strong Afarius had heaved a mighty stone. The fragment of a rock, and would have thrown. But Theseus, with a club of hardened oak. The cubit bone of the bold centaur broke. And left him maimed, nor seconded the stroke. Then leaped on tall Bienner's back. Who bore? No mortal burden but his own before Winky Face. Pressed with his knees his sides, the double man. His speed with spurs increased, unwilling ran. One hand the hero fastened on his locks. His other plied him with repeated strokes. The club rang round his ears and battered brows. He falls, and, lashing up his heels, his rider throws. The same Herculean arms Nedimnus wound. And lay by him Lycotas on the ground. And Hippasus, whose beard his breast invades. And Ripheus, hunter of the woodland shades. And Tyrus, used with mountain bears to strive. And from their dens to draw the indignant beasts alive. Demoleon could not bear this hateful sight. Or the long fortune of the Athenian knight. But pulled with all his force, to disengage. From earth a pine. The product of an age. The root stuck fast, the broken trunk he sent. At Theseus, Theseus frustrates his intent. And leaps aside. 
by Pallas warned the blow. To shun, for so he said, and we believed it so. Yet not in vain the enormous weight was cast. Which Cranter's body sundered at the waist. Thy father's, squire, Achilles, and his care. Whom, conquered in the Pelopean War. Their king, his present ruin to prevent. A pledge of peace implored, to Peleus sent. Thy sire, with grieving eyes, beheld his fate. And cried, Not long, loved Cranter, shalt thou wait. Thy vowed revenge. At once he said, and threw. His ashen spear, which quivered as it flew. With all his force and all his soul applied. The sharp point entered in the centaur's side. Both hands to wrench it out the monster joined. And wrenched it output left the steel behind. Stuck in his lungs it stood, enraged he rears. His hoofs, and down to ground thy father bears. Thus trampled underfoot, his shield defends. His head. His other hand the lance portends. Evan while he lay extended on the dust. He sped the centaur with one single thrust. Two more his lance before transfixed from far. And two his sword had slain in closer war. To these was added Dorilas, who spread. A bull's two goring horns round his head. With these he pushed, in blood already died. Him fearless I approached, and thus defied. Now. Monster, now by proof it shall appear. Whether thy horns are sharper, or my spear. At this, I threw, for want of other ward. He lifted up his hand, his front to guard. His hand it passed, and fixed it to his brow. Loud shouts of ours attend the lucky blow. Him Peleus finished, with a second wound. Which through the navel pierced, he reeled around. And dragged his dangling bowels on the ground. Trod what he dragged, and what he trod, he crushed. And to his mother earth with empty belly rushed. Story of Silurus and Hylonomy. The centaur Silurus is mortally wounded in the conflict with the Lapathy, and his mistress Hylonomy expires in his arms. Nor could thy form, O Silurus, for slow. Thy fate, if form to monsters men allow. Just bloomed thy beard. Thy beard of golden hue. Thy locks in golden waves about thy shoulders flew. Sprightly thy look. Thy shapes in every part. So clean, as might instruct the sculptor's art. As far as man extended, where began. The beast. The beast was equal to the man. Add but a horse's head and neck, and he. O Castor, was a courser worthy thee. So was his back proportioned for the seat. So rose his brawny chest, so swiftly moved his feet. Coal black his color, but like jet it shone. His legs and flowing tail were white alone. Beloved by many maidens of his kind. But fair Hylonomy possessed his mind. Hylonomy, for features, and for face. Excelling all the nymphs of double race. Nor less her blandishments than beauty move. At once both living, and confessing love. For him she dressed. For him, with female care. She combed, and set in curl her auburn hair. Of roses, violets, and lilies mixed. And sprigs of flowing rosemary betwixt. She formed the chaplet that adorned her front. In waters of the Pegasian fount. And in the streams that from the fountain play. She washed her face, and bathed her twice a day. The scarf of furs, that hung below her side. Was ermine, or the panther's spotted pride. Spoils of no common beast. With equal flame. They loved, their sylvan pleasures were the same. Uncertain from what hand, a flying dart. At Silurus was sent, which pierced his heart. The javelin drawn from out the mortal wound. He faints with staggering steps, and seeks the ground. The fair within her arms received his fall. And strove his wandering spirits to recall. And while her hand the streaming blood opposed. Joined face to face, his lips with hers she closed. 
stifled with kisses, a sweet death he dies. She fills the fields with undistinguished cries. At last her words were in her clamor drowned. For my stunned ears receive no vocal sound. In madness of her grief, she seized the dart. New drawn, and reeking from her lover's heart. To her bare bosom the sharp point applied. And wounded fell, and falling by his side. Embraced him in her arms, and thus embracing died. Evan still methinks I see Phaecombs. Strange was his habit, and as odd his dress. Six lions' hides, with thongs together fast. His upper part defended to his waist. And where man ended, the continued vest. Spread on his back, the house and trappings of a beast. A stump too heavy for a team to draw. It seems a fable, though the fact I saw. He threw at Folon, the descending blow. Divides the skull, and cleaves his head in two. The brains, from nose, and mouth, and either ear. Came issuing out, as through a cullender. The curdled milk, or from the press the way. Driven down by weights above, is drained away. But him, while stooping down to spoil the slain. Pierced through the paunch, I tumbled on the plain. Then Thonius and Telebois I slew. A fork the former armed. A dart his fellow threw. The javelin wounded me, behold the scar. Then was my time to seek the Trojan war. Then I was Hector's match in open field. But he was then unborn, at least a child. Now I am nothing. I forbear to tell. By Periphantus how Paridus fell. The centaur by the night, nor will I stay. On Amphix, or what deaths he dealt that day. What honor, with a pointless lance, he won. Stuck in the front of a four-footed man. What fame young maker obtained in fight. Or dwell on Nessus, now returned from flight. How prophet Mopsus not alone divined. Whose valor equalled his foreseeing mind. Senus transformed to an eagle. The nymph Canis, whose name is changed to Senus, pursues the centaurs with great slaughter. Who at length crush the hero with huge forests of trees, the gods, however, in compassion, change him into an eagle. Already Senus, with his conquering hand, had slaughtered five, the boldest of their band. Paracmus, Helamus, Antimachus. Bromus the brave, and stronger Stiphilus. Their names I numbered, and remember well. No trace remaining, by what wounds they fell. Latrius, the bulkiest of the double race. Whom the spoiled arms of slain Halesus grace. In years retaining still his youthful might. Though his black hairs were interspersed with white. Between the embattled ranks began to prance. Proud of his helm, and Macedonian lance. And rode the ring around, that either host. Might hear him, while he made this empty boast. And from a female shall we suffer shame? For Canis still, not Senus, is thy name. And still the native softness of thy kind. Prevails, and leaves the woman in thy mind. Remember what thou wert. What price was paid. To change thy sex, to make thee not a maid. And but a man in show, go, card and spin. And leave the business of the war to men. While thus the boaster exercised his pride. The fatal spear of Senus reached his side. Just in the mixture of the kinds it ran. Between the nether beast and upper man. The monster, mad with rage, and stung with smart. His lance directed at the hero's heart. It struck but bounded from his hardened breast. Like hail from tiles, which the safe house invest. Nor seemed the stroke with more effect to come. Then a small pebble falling on a drum. He next his falchion tried, in closer fight. But the keen falchion had no power to bite. He thrust, the blunted point returned again. Since downright blows, he cried, and thrusts are vain. I'll prove his side, in strong embraces held. He proved his side. His side the sword repelled. 
his hollow belly echoed to the stroke. Untouched his body as a solid rock. Aimed at his neck, at last the blade in shivers broke. The impassive knight stood idle, to deride. His rage, and offered oft his naked side. At length, now, monster, in thy turn, he cried. Try thou the strength of Senus at the word. He thrust, and in his shoulder plunged the sword. Then writhed his hand, and as he drove it down. Deep in his breast, made many wounds in one. The centaur saw, enraged, the unhoped success. And rushing on in crowds, together press. At him, and him alone, their darts they threw. Repulsed they from his fated body flew. Amazed they stood, till Monicus began. O oh shame, a nation conquered by a man. A woman man. Yet more a man is he. Then all our race, and what he was, are we. Now what avail our nerves? The united force. Of two the strongest creatures, man and horse. Nor goddess born, nor of Ixion seed. We seem, a lover built for Juno's bed. Mastered by this half-man. Whole mountains throw. With woods at once, and bury him below. This only way remains, nor need we doubt. To choke the soul within, though not to force it out. Heap weights instead of wounds. He chanced to see. Where southern storms had rooted up a tree. This, raised from earth, against the foe he threw. The example shown, his fellow brutes pursue. With forest loads the warrior they invade. Othres and Pelion soon were void of shad. And spreading groves were naked mountains made. Pressed with the burden, Senus pants for breath. And on his shoulders bears the wooden death. To heave the intolerable weight he tries. At length it rose above his mouth and eyes. Yet still he heaves, and struggling with despair. Shakes all aside, and gains a gulp of air. A short relief, which but prolongs his pain. He faints by fits, and then respires again. At last the burden only nods above. As when an earthquake stirs the Idean grove. Doubtful his death, he suffocated seemed. To most. But otherwise our Nopsis deemed. Who said he saw a yellow bird arise? From out the piles, and cleave the liquid skies. I saw it too, with golden feathers bright. Nor e'er before beheld so strange a sight. Whom Mopsus viewing, as it soared around. Our troop, and heard the pinions rattling sound. All hail, he cried. Thy country's grace and love. Once first of men below, now first of birds above. Its author to the story gave belief. For us, our courage was increased by grief. Ashamed to see a single man, pursued. With odds, to sink beneath a multitude. We pushed the foe. And forced to shameful flight. Part fell, and part escaped by favor of the night. Fate of Periclimenos. Periclimenos, the brother of Nestor, is endowed by Neptune with the power of assuming whatever shape he pleases, in the form of an eagle he assaults Hercules. Who mortally wounds him with an arrow. This tale, by Nestor told, did much displease. Lipolemus, the seed of Hercules. For often he had heard his father say. That he himself was present at the fray. And more than shared the glories of the day. Old Chronicle, he said, among the rest. You might have named Alcides at the least. Is he not worth your praise? The Pillian Prince. Sight ere he spoke, then made this proud defense. My former woes, in long oblivion drowned. I would have lost. But you renew the wound. Better to pass him o'er, than to relate. The cause I have your mighty sire to hate. His fame has filled the world, and reached the sky. Which, oh I wish. With truth, I could deny. We praise not Hector, though his name, we know. Is great in arms, tis hard to praise a foe. 
He, your great father, Lavelle to the ground. Messenia's towers. Nor better fortune found. Ellis and Pylus, that a neighboring state. And this my own, both guiltless of their fate. To pass the rest. Twelve, wanting one, he slew. My brethren, who their birth from Neleus drew. All youths of early promise, had they lived. By him they perished, I alone survived. The rest were easy conquest, but the fate. Of Periclimenos is wondrous to relate. To him our common grandsire of the main. Had given to change his form. And changed, resume again. Varied at pleasure, every shape he tried. And in all beasts Ilcedius still defied. Vanquished on earth, at length he soared above. Changed to the bird that bears the bolt of Jove. The nude assembled eagle, now endued. With beak and pounces, Hercules pursued. And cuffed his manly cheeks, and tore his face. Then safe retired, and towered in empty space. Alcides bore not long his flying foe. But bending his inevitable bow. Reached him in air, suspended as he stood. And in his pinion fixed the feathered wood. Light was the wound. But in the sinew hung. The point, and his disabled wing unstrung. He wheeled in air, and stretched his vans in vain. His vans no longer could his flight sustain. For while one gathered wind, one unsupplied. Hung drooping down, nor poised his other side. He fell, the shaft that slightly was impressed. Now from his heavy fall, with weight increased. Drove through his neck aslant. He spurns the ground. And the soul issues through the windpipe's wound. Now, brave commander of the Rhodian seas. What praise is due from me to Hercules? Silence is all the vengeance I decree. For my slain brothers, but, tis peace with thee. Thus, with a flowing tongue, old Nestor spoke. Then to full bowls each other they provoke. At length, with weariness and wine oppressed. They rise from table, and withdraw to rest. Death of Achilles Achilles, having fallen a sacrifice to the hostility of Apollo and the shafts of Paris, Ajax and Ulysses advance their claims to the armor of the deceased hero. The sire of sickness, monarch of the main. Meantime laments his son in battle slain. And vows the victor's death, nor vows in vain. For nine long years the smothered pain he bore. Achilles was not ripe for fate before. Then when he saw the promised hour was near. He thus bespoke the God that guides the year. Immortal offspring of my brother Jove. My brightest nephew, and whom best I love. Whose hands were joined with mine. To raise the wall. Of tottering Troy, now nodding to her fall. Dost thou not mourn our power employed in vain? And the defenders of our city slain? To pass the rest, could noble Hector lie. Unpitied, dragged around his native Troy. And yet the murderer lives, himself by far. A greater plague than all the wasteful war. He lives, the proud Pelides lives, to boast. Our town destroyed, our common labor lost. Oh, could I meet him? But I wish too late. To prove my trident is not in his fate. But let him try, for that's allowed, thy dart. And pierce his only penetrable part. Apollo bows to the superior throne. And to his uncle's anger adds his own. Then, in a cloud involved, he takes his flight. Where Greeks and Trojans mixed in mortal fight. And found out Paris, lurking where he stood. And stained his arrows with plebeian blood. Phoebus to him alone the god confessed. Then to the recreant knight he thus addressed. Dost thou not blush? To spend thy shafts in vain. On a degenerate and ignoble train? If fame or better vengeance be thy care. Their aim, and with one arrow end the war. He said. And showed from far the blazing shield. And sword, which, but Achilles, none could wield. 
and how he moved a god, and mowed the standing field. The deity himself directs aright. The envenomed shaft, and wings the fatal flight. Thus fell the foremost of the Grecian name. And he, the base adulterer, boasts the fame. A spectacle to glad the Trojan train. And please old Priam, after Hector slain. If by a female hand he had foreseen. He was to die, his wish had rather been. The lance and double axe of the fair warrior queen. And now the terror of the Trojan field. The Grecian honor, ornament, and shield. High on a pile the unconquered chief is placed. The god that armed him first, consumed at last. Of all the mighty man, the small remains. A little urn, and scarcely filled, contains. Yet great in Homer, still Achilles lives. And equal to himself, himself survives. His buckler owns its former lord, and brings. New cause of strife between contending kings. Who worthiest after him his sword to wield? Or wear his armor, or sustain his shield? Evan Diomede sat mute, with downcast eyes. Conscious of wanted worth to win the prize. Nor Menelaus presumed these arms to claim. Nor he, the king of men, a greater name. Two rivals only rose, Laertes' son. And the vast bulk of Ajax Telamon. The king, who cherished each with equal love. And from himself all envy would remove. Left both to be determined by the laws. And to the Grecian chiefs transferred the cause. Book. Chapter 13. Speeches of Ajax and Ulysses. Ajax and Ulysses lay claim to the armor of Achilles, which is assigned to the latter by the Grecian chiefs. The chiefs were set. The soldiers crowned the field. To these the master of the sevenfold shield. Upstart fierce, and kindled with disdain. Eager to speak, unable to contain. His boiling rage, he rolled his eyes around. The shore and Grecian galleys hauled aground. Then, stretching out his hands, O Jove, he cried. Must then our cause before the fleet be tried? And dares Ulysses for the prize contend? In sight of what he durst not once defend? But basely fled that memorable day. When I from Hector's hands redeemed the flaming prey. So much, tis safer at the noisy bar. With words to flourish, than engage in war. By different methods we maintain our right. Nor am I made to talk, nor he to fight. In bloody fields I labor to be great. His arms are a smooth tongue and soft deceit. Nor need I speak my deeds, for those you see. The sun and day are witnesses for me. Let him who fights unseen relate his own. And vouch the silent stars and conscious moon. Great is the prize demanded, I confess. But such an abject rival makes it less. That gift, those honors, he but hoped to gain can leave no room for Ajax to be vain. Losing, he wins. Because his name will be. Ennobled by defeat, who durst contend with me. Were my known valor questioned, yet my blood. Without that plea, would make my title good. My sire was Telamon, whose arms, employed. With Hercules, these Trojan walls destroyed. And who before, with Jason sent from Greece. In the first ship brought home the golden fleece. Great Telamon from Aeacus derives. His birth, the inquisitor of guilty lives. In shades below, where Sisyphus, whose son. This thief is thought, rolls up the restless heavy stone. Just Aeacus, the king of gods above. Begot, thus Ajax is the third from Jove. Nor should I seek advantage from my line. Unless, Achilles, it was mixed with thine. As next of kin, Achilles' arms I claim. This fellow would engraft a foreign name. Upon our stock, and the Sisyphian seed. By fraud and theft asserts his father's breed. Then must I lose these arms, because I came. To fight uncalled, a voluntary name. Nor shun the cause, 
but offered you my aid? While he long lurking was to war betrayed. Forced to the field he came, but in the rear. And feigned distraction to conceal his fear. Till one more cunning caught him in the snare. Ill for himself, and dragged him into war. Now let a hero's arms a coward vest. And he who shunned all honors gain the best. And let me stand excluded from my right. Robbed of my kinsmen's arms, who first appeared in fight. Better for us, at home had he remained. Had it been true the madness which he feigned. Or so believed. The less had been our shame. The less his counseled crime, which brands the Grecian name. Nor Philoctetes had been left enclosed. In a bare isle, to wants and pains exposed. Where to the rocks, with solitary groans. His sufferings and our baseness he bemoans. And wishes, so may heaven his wish fulfill. The due reward to him who caused his ill. Now he, with us to Troy's destruction sworn. Our brother of the war, by whom are born. I'll see this arrows, pent in narrow bounds. With cold and hunger pinched, and pained with wounds. To find him food and clothing, must employ. Against the birds the shafts due to the fate of Troy. Yet still he lives, and lives from treason free. Because he left Ulysses' company. Poor Palamede might wish, so void of aid. Rather to have been left, than so to death betrayed. The coward bore the man immortal spite. Who shamed him out of madness into fight. Nor daring otherwise to vent his hate. Accused him first of treason to the state. And then, for proof. Produced the golden store. Himself had hidden in his tent before. Thus of two champions he deprived our host. By exile won, and one by treason lost. Thus fights Ulysses, thus his fame extends. A formidable man but to his friends. Great, for what greatness is in words and sound. Even faithful Nestor less in both is found. But that he might without a rival reign. He left his faithful Nestor on the plain. Forsook his friend Evan at his utmost need. Who tired, and tardy with his wounded steed. Cried out for aid, and called him by his name. But cowardice has neither ears nor shame. Thus fled the good old man, bereft of aid. And, for as much as lay in him, betrayed. That this is not a fable forged by me. Like one of his, an Ulyssian lie. I vouch Evan diamed, who, though his friend, cannot that act excuse, much less defend. He called him back aloud, and taxed his fear. And sure enough he heard, but durst not hear. The gods with equal eyes on mortals look. He justly was forsaken who forsook. Wanted that succor he refused to lend. Found every fellow such another friend. No wonder if he roared that all might hear. His elocution was increased by fear. I heard, I ran, I found him out of breath. Pale, trembling, and half dead with fear of death. Though he had judged himself by his own laws. And stood condemned, I helped the common cause. With my broad buckler hid him from the foe. Even the shield trembled as he lay below. And from impending fate the coward freed. Good heaven forgive me for so bad a deed. If still he will persist, and urge the strife. First let him give me back his forfeit life. Let him return to that opprobrious field. Again creep under my protecting shield. Let him lie wounded, let the foe be near. And let his quivering heart confess his fear. There put him in the very jaws of fate. And let him plead his cause in that estate. And yet when snatched from death, when from below. My lifted shield I loosed, and let him go. Good heavens, how light he rose, with what a bound. He sprung from earth. Forgetful of his wound. How fresh, how eager then his feet to ply. Who had not strength to stand, had speed to fly. Hector came on, and brought the gods along. Fear seized alike the feeble and the strong. 
each Greek was an Ulysses. Such a dread. The approach, and even the sound, of Hector bred. Him, fleshed with slaughter, and with conquest crowned. I met, and overturned him to the ground. When after, matchless as he deemed in might. He challenged all our host to single fight. All eyes were fixed on me, the lots were thrown. But for your champion I was wished alone. Your vows were heard, we fought, and neither yield. Yet I returned unvanquished from the field. With Jove to friend, the insulting Trojan came. And menaced us with force, our fleet with flame. Was it the strength of this tongue valiant lord? In that black hour, that saved you from the sword? Or was my breast exposed alone, to brave? A thousand swords, a thousand ships to save? The hopes of your return. And can you yield? For a saved fleet, less than a single shield? Think it no boast, O Grecians, if I deem. These arms want Ajax, more than Ajax them. Or, I with them an equal honor share. They honored to be worn, and I to wear. Will he compare my courage with his slight? As well he may compare the day with night. Night is indeed the province of his reign. Yet all his dark exploits no more contain. Then a spy taken, and a sleeper slain. A priest made prisoner. Pallas made a prey. But none of all these actions done by day. Nor aught of these was done, and diamed away. If on such petty merits you confer. So vast a prize, let each his portion share. Make a just dividend, and if not all. The greater part to diamed will fall. But why for Ithacus such arms as those? Who naked, and by night, invades his foes? The glittering helm by moonlight will proclaim. The latent robber, and prevent his game. Nor could he hold his tottering head upright. Beneath that morion, or sustain the weight. Nor that right arm could toss the beamy lance. Much less the left that ampler shield advance. Ponderous with precious weight, and rough with cost. Of the round world in rising gold embossed. That orb would ill become his hand to wield. And look as for the gold he stole the shield. Which, should your error on the wretch bestow. It would not frighten, but allure the foe. Why asks he what avails him not in fight? And would but cumber and retard his flight. In which his only excellence is placed. You give him death, that intercept his haste. Add, that his own is yet a maiden shield. Nor the least dint has suffered in the field. Guiltless of fight, mine, battered, hewed, and bored. Worn out of service. Must forsake its lord. What further need of words, our right to scan. My arguments are deeds, let action speak the man. Since from a champion's arms the strife arose. Go cast the glorious prize amid the foes. Then send us to redeem both arms and shield. And let him wear who wins them in the field. He said, a murmur from a multitude. Or somewhat like a stifled shout ensued. Till from his seat arose Laertes' son. Looked down a while, and paused ere he begun. Then to the expecting audience raised his look. And not without prepared attention spoke. Soft was his tone, and sober was his face. Action his words, and words his action grace. If heaven, my lords, had heard our common prayer. These arms had caused no quarrel for an heir. Still great Achilles had his own possessed. And we with great Achilles had been blessed. But since hard fate, and heaven's severe decree. Have ravished him away from you and me. At this he sight, and wiped his eyes, and drew. Or seemed to draw, some drops of kindly dew. Who better can succeed Achilles lost? Than he who gave Achilles to your host? This only I request, that neither he may gain, by being what he seems to be. A stupid thing, nor I may lose the prize. By having sense, which heaven to him denies. Since great or small, the talent I enjoyed. 
was ever in the common cause employed. Nor let my wit, and wanted eloquence, which often has been used in your defense, and in my own, this only time be brought, to bear against myself, and deemed a fault. Make not a crime where nature made it none. For every man may freely use his own. The deeds of long-descended ancestors are but by grace of imputation ours. There's an effect. But since he draws his line from Jove, and seems to plead a right divine. From Jove, like him, I claim my pedigree. And am descended in the same degree. My sire Laertes was Arcesius' heir. Arcesius was the son of Jupiter. No parricide, no banished man is known. In all my line, let him excuse his own. Hermes ennobles to my mother's side. By both my parents to the gods allied. But not because that on the female part. My blood is better, dare I claim desert. Or that my sire from parricide is free. But judge by merit between him and me. The prize be to the best. Provided yet. That Ajax for a while his kin forget. And his great sire, and greater uncle's name. To fortify by them his feeble claim. Be kindred and relation laid aside. And honor's cause by laws of honor tried. For if he plead proximity of blood. That empty title is with ease withstood. Peleus, the hero's sire, more nigh than he. And Pyrrhus, his undoubted progeny. Inherit first these trophies of the field. To Cyrus, or to Thia, send the shield. And Tusser has an uncle's right, yet he. Waves his pretensions, nor contends with me. Then since the cause on pure desert is placed. Whence shall I take my rise, what reckon last? I not presume on every act to dwell. But take these few, in order as they fell. Thetis, who knew the fates, applied her care. To keep Achilles in disguise from war. Until the threatening influence was past. A woman's habit on the hero cast. All eyes were cousined by the borrowed vest. And Ajax, never wiser than the rest. Found no Pelides there, at length I came. With proffered wares to this pretended dame. She, not discovered by her mien or voice. Betrayed her manhood by her manly choice. And while on female toys her fellows look. Grasped in her warlike hand, a javelin shook. Whom, by this act revealed, I thus bespoke. O goddess born! Resist not heaven's decree. The fall of Ilium is reserved for thee. Then seized him, and produced in open light. Sent blushing to the field the fatal night. Mine then are all his actions of the war. Great Telephus was conquered by my spear. And after cured, to me the Thebans owe. Lesbos, and Tenedos, their overthrow. Cyrus and Scylla, not on all to dwell. By me Lernessus and strong Chrysa fell. And since I sent the man who Hector slew. To me the noble Hector's death is due. Those arms I put into his living hand. Those arms, Pelides dead, I now demand. When Greece was injured in the Spartan prince. And met at Aulis to avenge the offense. Twas a dead calm, or adverse blasts, that reigned. And in the port the wind-bound fleet detained. Bad signs were seen, and oracles severe. Were daily thundered in our general's ear. That by his daughter's blood we must appease. Diana's kindled wrath, and free the seas. Affection, interest, fame, his heart assailed. But soon the father o'er the king prevailed. Bold, on himself he took the pious crime. As angry with the gods as they with him. No subject could sustain their sovereign's look. Till this hard enterprise I undertook. I only durst the imperial power control. And undermined the parent in his soul. Forced him to exert the king for common good. And pay our ransom with his daughter's blood. Never was cause more difficult to plead. 
than where the judge against himself decreed. Yet this I won by dint of argument. The wrongs his injured brother underwent. And his own office, shamed him to consent. Twas harder yet to move the mother's mind. And to this heavy task was I designed. Reasons against her love I knew were vain. I circumvented whom I could not gain. Had Ajax been employed, our slackened sails. Had still at Aulis waited happy gales. Arrived at Troy, your choice was fixed on me. A fearless envoy, fit for a bold embassy. Secure, I entered through the hostile court. Glittering with steel. And crowded with resort. There, in the midst of arms, I plead our cause. Urge the foul rape, and violated laws. Accuse the foes, as authors of the strife. Reproach the ravisher, demand the wife. Priam, Antenor, and the wiser few. I moved. But Paris and his lawless crew. Scarce held their hands and lifted swords, but stood. In act to quench their impious thirst of blood. This Menelaus knows. Exposed to share. With me the rough preludium of war. Endless it were to tell what I have done. In arms, or counsel, since the siege begun. The first encounters passed, the foe repelled. They skulked within the town, we kept the field. War seemed asleep for nine long years, at length. Both sides resolved to push, we tried our strength. Now what did Ajax, while our arms took breath? Versed only in the gross mechanic trade of death. If you require my deeds, with ambushed arms. I trapped the foe, or tired with false alarms. Secured the ships, drew lines along the plain. The fainting cheered, chastised the rebel train. Provided forage, our spent arms renewed. Employed at home, or sent abroad, the common cause pursued. The king, deluded in a dream by Jove. Despaired to take the town, and ordered to remove. What subject durst arraign the power supreme? Producing Jove to justify his dream. Ajax might wish the soldiers to retain. From shameful flight, but wishes were in vain. As wanting of effect had been his words. Such as of course his thundering tongue affords. But did this boaster threaten, did he pray? Or by his own example urge their stay? None, none of these, but ran himself away. I saw him run, and was ashamed to see. Who plied his feet so fast to get aboard as he. Then speeding through the place, I made a stand. And loudly cried, Oh, base degenerate band. To leave a town already in your hand. After so long expense of blood for fame. To bring home nothing but perpetual shame. These words, or what I have forgotten since. For grief inspired me then with eloquence. Reduce their minds. They leave the crowded port. And to their late forsaken camp resort. Dismayed the council met, this man was there. But mute, and not recovered of his fear. Thersites taxed the king. And loudly railed. But his wide-opening mouth with blows I sealed. Then, rising, I excite their souls to fame. And kindle sleeping virtue into flame. From thence, whatever he performed in fight. Is justly mine, who drew him back from flight. Which of the Grecian chiefs consorts with thee? But Diam desires my company. And still communicates his praise with me. As guided by a god, secure he goes. Armed with my fellowship, amid the foes. And sure no little merit I may boast. Whom such a man selects from such a host. Unforced by lots I went without a fright. To dare with him the dangers of the night. On the same errand sent, we met the spy. Of Hector, double-tongued, and used to lie. Him I dispatched, but not till undermined. I drew him first to tell what treacherous Troy designed. My task performed, with praise I had retired. But not content with this. To greater praise aspired. Invaded Rhesus, and his Thracian crew. 
and him and his in their own strength I slew. Returned a victor, all my vows complete. With the king's chariot, in his royal seat. Refuse me now his arms, whose fiery steeds were promised to the spy for his nocturnal deeds. And let dull Ajax bear away my right. When all his days outbalance this one night. Nor fought I darkling still, the sun beheld. With slaughtered lichens when I strewed the field. You saw, and counted as I passed along. Alaster, Chromius, Serranos the Strong. Alcander, Pritanes, and Halius. Nomon, Charopes, and Enemus. Kuhn, Chersodamas, and five beside. Men of obscure descent, but courage tried. All these this hand laid breathless on the ground. Nor want I proofs of many a manly wound. All honest, all before, believe not me. Words may deceive, but credit what you see. At this he bared his breast, and showed his scars. As of a furrowed field, well ploughed with wars. Nor is this part unexercised, said he. That giant bulk of his from wounds is free. Safe in his shield, he fears no foe to try. And better manages his blood than I. But this avails me not. Our boaster strove. Not with our foes alone, but partial Jove. To save the fleet, this I confess is true. Nor will I take from any man his due. But thus assuming all. He robs from you. Some part of honor to your share will fall. He did the best indeed, but did not all. Patroclus in Achilles' arms, and thought. The chief he seemed, with equal ardor fought. Preserved the fleet, repelled the raging fire. And forced the fearful Trojans to retire. But Ajax boasts, that he was only thought. A match for Hector, who the combat sought. Sure he forgets the king, the chiefs. And me. All were as eager for the fight as he. He but the ninth, and not by public voice. Or ours preferred, was only fortune's choice. They fought. Nor can our hero boast the event. For Hector from the field unwounded went. Why am I forced to name that fatal day? That snatched the prop and pride of Greece away? I saw Pelide sink with pious grief and ran in vain, alas! to his relief. For the brave soul was fled, full of my friend. I rushed amid the war, his relics to defend. Nor ceased my toil till I redeemed my prey. And, loaded with Achilles, marched away. Those arms which on these shoulders then I bore. Tis just you to these shoulders should restore. You see I want not nerves, who could sustain. The pond rouse ruins of so great a man. Or if in others equal force you find. None is endued with a more grateful mind. Did Thetis then, ambitious in her care. These arms thus labored for her son prepare. That Ajax after him the heavenly gift should wear. For that dull soul to stare, with stupid eyes. On the learned unintelligible prize. What are to him the sculptures of the shield? Heaven's planets, earth, and ocean's watery field? The Pleiades, Hyads, less and greater bear. Undipped in seas, Orion's angry star. Two differing cities, graved on either hand. Would he wear arms he cannot understand? Besides, what wise objections he prepares? Against my late accession to the wars? Does not the fool perceive his argument? is with more force against Achilles bent. For if dissembling be so great a crime, the fault is common, and the same in him. And if he taxes both of long delay, my guilt is less, who sooner came away. His pious mother, anxious for his life, detained her son, and me, my pious wife. To them the blossoms of our youth were due. Our riper manhood we reserved for you. But grant me guilty, tis not much my care. When with so great a man my guilt I share. My wit to war the matchless hero brought. But by this fool I never had been caught. 
nor need I wonder, that on me he threw. Such foul aspersions, when he spares not you. If Palamede unjustly fell by me. Your honour suffered in the unjust decree. I but accused, you doomed, and yet he died. Convinced of treason. And was fairly tried. You heard not he was false. Your eyes beheld. The traitor manifest, the bribe revealed. That Philoctetes is on Lemnos left. Wounded, forlorn, of human aid bereft. Is not my crime, or not my crime alone. Defend your justice, for the facts your own. Tis true, the advice was mine. That staying there. He might his weary limbs with rest repair. From a long voyage free, and from a long war. He took the counsel, and he lives at least. The event declares I counseled for the best. Though faith is all in ministers of state. For who can promise to be fortunate? Now since his arrows are the fate of Troy. Do not my wit, or weak address employ. Send Ajax there, with his persuasive sense. To mollify the man. And draw him thence. But Xanthus shall run backward. Ida stand. A leafless mountain, and the Grecian band. Shall fight for Troy, if, when my counsel fail. The wit of heavy Ajax shall prevail. Hard Philoctetes, exercise thy spleen. Against thy fellows, and the king of men. Curse my devoted head above the rest. And wish in arms to meet rue breast to breast. Yet I the dangerous task will undertake. And either die myself, or bring thee back. Nor doubt the same success, as when before. The Phrygian prophet to these tents I bore. Surprised by night, and forced him to declare. In what was placed the fortune of the war. Heaven's dark decrees, and answers to display. And how to take the town, and where the secret lay. Yet this I compassed. And from Troy conveyed. The fatal image of their guardian maid. That work was mine. For Pallas, though our friend. Yet while she was in Troy, did Troy defend. Now what has Ajax done, or what designed? A noisy nothing, and an empty wind. If he be what he promises in show. Why was I sent, and why feared he to go? Our boasting champion thought the task not light. To pass the guards, commit himself to night. Not only through a hostile town to pass. But scale, with steep ascent, the sacred place. With wandering steps to search the citadel. And from the priests their patroness to steal. Then through surrounding foes to force my way. And bear in triumph home the heavenly prey. Which had I not, Ajax in vain had held. Before that monstrous bulk his sevenfold shield. That night to conquer Troy I might be said. When Troy was liable to conquest made. Why points thou to my partner of the war? Tidides had indeed a worthy share. In all my toil and praise, but when thy might. Our ships protected, didst thou singly fight? All joined, and thou of many wert but one. I asked no friend, nor had, but him alone. Who had he not been well assured, that art. And conduct were of war the better part. And more availed than strength, my valiant friend. Had urged a better right than Ajax can pretend. As good at least Euripolis may claim. And the more moderate Ajax of the name. The Cretan king, and his brave charioteer. And Menelaus bold with sword and spear. All these had been my rivals in the shield. And yet all these to my pretensions yield. Thy boisterous hands are then of use, when I. With this directing head those hands apply. Brawn without brain is thine, my prudent care. Foresees, provides, administers the war. Thy province is to fight, but when shall be. The time to fight, the king consults with me. No dram of judgment with thy force is joined. Thy body is of profit, and my mind. By how much more the ship her safety owes. To him who steers, than him that only rows. 
by how much more the captain merits praise. Than he who fights, and fighting but obeys. By so much greater is my worth than thine. Who canst but execute what I design? What gainst thou brutal man, if I confess? Thy strength superior, when thy wit is less? Mind is the man, I claim my whole desert. From the mind's vigor, and the immortal part. But you, O Grecian chiefs, reward my care. Be grateful to your watchmen of the war. For all my labors in so long a space. Sure I may plead a title to your grace. Enter the town. I then unbarred the gates. When I removed their tutelary fates. By all our common hopes, if hopes they be. Which I have now reduced to certainty. By falling Troy, by yonder tottering towers. And by their taken gods, which now are ours. Or if there yet a farther task remains. To be performed by prudence, or by pains. If yet some desperate action rests behind. That asks high conduct, and a dauntless mind. If aught be wanting to the Trojan doom. Which none but I can manage and overcome. Award those arms I ask, by your decree. Or give to this, what you refuse to me. He ceased, and ceasing, with respect he bowed. And with his hand at once the fatal statue showed. Heaven, air, and ocean, rung with loud applause. And by the general vote he gained his cause. Thus conduct won the prize, when courage failed. And eloquence o'er brutal force prevailed. Death of Ajax. Ajax, in despair, puts a period to his existence, and the blood of the hero is changed into a hyacinth. He who could often, and alone, withstand. The foe, the fire, and Jove's own partial hand. Now cannot his unmastered grief sustain. But yields to rage, to madness, and disdain. Then snatching out his falchion, thou, said he. Art mine, Ulysses lays no claim to thee. O oh, often tried, and ever trusty sword. Now do thy last kind office to thy lord. Tis Ajax who requests thy aid, to show. None but himself himself could overthrow. He said. And with so good a will to die. Did to his breast the fatal point apply. It found his heart, a way till then unknown. Where never weapon entered but his own. No hands could force it thence, so fixed it stood. Till out it rushed, expelled by streams of spouting blood. The fruitful blood produced a flower, which grew. On a green stem, and of a purple hue. Like his, whom unaware Apollo slew. Inscribed in both, the letters are the same. But those express the grief, and these the name. Story of Polyxena and Hecuba. Polyxena, the daughter of Priam, is sacrificed at the tomb of Achilles, while her brother Polydor, by his great riches, excites the avarice of Polymester. King of Thrace, who murders him, the lifeless body of her son is discovered by Hecuba, who contrives to deprive the faithless monarch of his eyes, his subjects pursue her with darts and stones. When she if metamorphosed into a bitch. The victor with full sails for Lemnos stood. Once stained by matrons with their husband's blood. Thence great Alcides fatal shafts to bear. Assigned to Philoctetes' secret care. These with their guardian to the Greeks conveyed. Their ten years' toil with wished success repaid. With Troy old Priam falls, his queen survives. Till all her woes complete, transformed she grieves. In borrowed sounds, nor with a human face. Barking tremendous o'er the plains of Thrace. Still Ilium's flames their pointed columns raise. And the red Hellespont reflects the blaze. Shed on Jove's altar are the poor remains. Of blood, which trickled from old Priam's veins. Cassandra lifts her hands to heaven in vain. Dragged by her sacred hair, the trembling train. Of matrons to their burning temples fly. There to their gods for kind protection cry. And to their statues cling till forced away. The victor Greeks bear off the invidious prey. 
from those high towers a Styanax is thrown. Whence he was wont with pleasure to look down. When oft his mother with a fond delight. Pointed to view his father's rage in fight. To win renown, and guard his country's right. The winds now call to sea, brisk northern gales. Sing in the shrouds, and court the spreading sails. Farewell, dear Troy, the captive matrons cry. Yes, we must leave our long-loved native sky. Then prostrate on the shore they kiss the sand. And quit the smoking ruins of the land. Last Hecuba on board, sad sight. Appears. Found weeping o'er her children's sepulchres. Dragged by Ulysses from her slaughtered sons. While yet she grasped their tombs, and kissed their mouldering bones. Yet Hector's ashes from his urn she bore. And in her bosom the sad relic wore. Then scattered on his tomb her hoary hairs. A poor oblation mingled with her tears. Opposed to Ilium lie the Thracian plains. Where Polymester safe in plenty reigns. King Priam to his care commits his son. Young Polydor, the chance of war to shun. A wise precaution. Had not gold, consigned. For the child's use, debauched the tyrant's mind. When sinking Troy to its last period drew. With impious hands his royal charge he slew. Then in the sea the lifeless corse is thrown. As with the body he the guilt could drown. The Greeks now riding on the Thracian shore. Till kinder gales invite, their vessels moor. Hear the wide opening earth to sudden view. Disclosed Achilles, great as when he drew. The vital air, but fierce with proud disdain. As when he sought Briseis to regain. When stern debate, and rash injurious strife. Unsheathed his sword, to reach a tried's life. And will ye go, he said. Is then the name. Of the once great Achilles lost to fame? Yet stay, ungrateful Greeks, nor let me sue. In vain for honours to my manes do. For this just end, Polyxena I doom. With victim rights to grace my slighted tomb. The phantom spoke, the ready Greeks obeyed. And to the tomb led the devoted maid. Snatched from her mother, who with pious care. Cherished this last relief of her despair. Superior to her sex, the fearless maid. Approached the altar, and around surveyed. The cruel rites, and consecrated knife. Which Pyrrhus pointed at her guiltless life. Then, as with stern amaze intent he stood. Now strike, she said, now spill my generous blood. Deep in my breast or throat your dagger sheath. While thus I stand prepared to meet my death. For life on terms of slavery I despise. Yet sure no God approves this sacrifice. Oh! Could I but conceal this dire event. From my sad mother, I should die content. Yet should she not with tears my death deplore. Since her own wretched life demands them more. But let not the rude touch of man pollute. A virgin victim, tis a modest suit. It best will please, who or demands my blood. That I untainted reach the Stygian flood. Yet let one short, last, dying prayer be heard. To Priam's daughter pay this last regard. Tis Priam's daughter, not a captive, sues. Do not the rites of sepulture refuse. To my afflicted mother, I implore. Free without ransom my dead course restore. Nor barter me for gain. When I am cold. But be her tears the price if I am sold. Time was she could have ransomed me with gold. Thus as she prayed, one common shower of tears. Burst forth, and streamed from every eye but hers. Even the priest wept, and with a rude remorse. Plunged in her heart the steel's resistless force. Her slackened limbs sunk gently to the ground. Dauntless her looks, unaltered by the wound. And as she fell, she strove with decent pride. To guard what modest women care to hide. The Trojan matrons the pale corse receive. And the whole slaughtered race of Priam grieve. 
sad they recount the long disastrous tale. Then with fresh tears, thee, royal maid, bewail. Thy widowed mother too, who flourished late. The royal pride of Asia's happier state. A captive lot now to Ulysses born. Whom yet the victor would reject with scorn. Were she not Hector's mother, Hector's fame. Scarce can a master for his mother claim. With strict embrace the lifeless course she viewed. And her fresh grief that flood of tears renewed. With which she lately mourned so many dead. Tears for her country, sons, and husbands shed. With the thick gushing stream she bathed the wound. Kissed her pale lips. Then weltering on the ground. With wanton rage her frantic bosom tore. Sweeping her hair amid the clotted gore. While her sad accents thus her loss deplore. Behold a mother's last dear pledge of woe. Yes, tis the last I have to suffer now. Thou, my Polyxena, my ills must crown. Already in thy fate I feel my own. Tis thus, lest haply of my numerous seed. One should unslaughtered fall, even thou must bleed. And yet I hope thy sex had been thy guard. But neither has thy tender sex been spared. The same Achilles, by whose deadly hate. Thy brothers fell, urged thy untimely fate. The same Achilles, whose destructive rage. Laid waste my realms, has robbed my childless age. When Paris shafts with Phoebus certain aid. At length had pierced this dreadful chief, I said. Secure of future ills, he can no more. But see, he still pursues me as before. With rage rekindled his dead ashes burn. And his yet murdering ghost my wretched home must mourn. This tyrant's lust of slaughter I have fed. With large supplies from my too fruitful bed. Troy's towers lie waste, and the wide ruin ends. The public wa, but me fresh wa attends. Troy still survives to me, to none but me. And from its ills I never must be free. I who so late had power, and wealth, and ease. Blessed with my husband, and a large increase. Must now in poverty and exile mourn. Evan from the tombs of my dead offspring torn. Given to Penelope, who, proud of spoil. Allots me to the loom's ungrateful toil. Points to her dames, and cries, with scorning mien. See Hector's mother, and great Priam's queen. And thou, my child, sole hope of all that's lost. Thou now art slain, to soothe this hostile ghost. Yes, my child falls an offering to my foe. Then what am I, who still survive this wa? Say, cruel gods. For what new scenes of death? Must a poor aged wretch prolong this hated breath? Troy fallen, to whom could Priam happy seem? Yet was he so, and happy must I deem. His death, for, oh, my child. He saw not thine. When he his life did with his Troy resign. Yet sure do obsequies thy tomb might grace. And thou shalt sleep amid thy kingly race. Alas, my child! Such fortune does not wait. Our suffering house in this abandoned state. A foreign grave, and thy poor mother's tears. Are all the honors that attend thy hearse. All now is lost. Yet no. One comfort more. Of life remains my much-loved Polydor. My youngest hope. Here on this coast he lives. Nursed by the guardian king, he still survives. Then let me hasten to the cleansing flood. And wash away these stains of guiltless blood. Straight to the shore her feeble steps repair. With limping pace, and torn disheveled hair. Silvered with age. Give me an urn, she cried to bear back water from this swelling tide. When on the banks her son in ghastly hue, transfixed with Thracian arrows strikes her view. The matron shrieked, her big swollen grief surpassed. The power of utterance, she stood aghast. She had nor speech, nor tears to give relief. Excess of was suppressed the rising grief. 
lifeless as stone, on earth she fixed her eyes. And then looked up to heaven with wild surprise. Now she contemplates o'er with sad delight. Her son's pale visage. Then her aching sight. Dwells on his wounds, she varies thus by turns. Till with collected rage at length she burns. Wild as the mother lion. When among. The haunts of prey she seeks her ravished young. Swift flies the ravisher, she marks his trace. And by the print directs her anxious chase. So Hecuba with mingled grief and rage. Pursues the king, regardless of her age. She greets the murderer, with dissembled joy. Of secret treasure hoarded for her boy. The specious tale the unwary king betrayed. Fired with the hopes of prey, give quick, he said. With soft enticing speech, the promised store. Whatever you give, you give to Polydor. Your son, by the immortal gods I swear. Shall this with all your former bounty share? She stands attentive to his soothing lies. And darts avenging horror from her eyes. Then full resentment fires her boiling blood. She springs upon him, mid the captive crowd. Her thirst of vengeance want of strength supplies. Fastens her forky fingers in his eyes. Tears out the rooted balls, her rage pursues. And in the hollow orbs her hand embrues. The Thracians, fired at this inhuman scene. With darts and stones assail the frantic queen. She snarls and growls, nor in a human tone. Then bites impatient at the bounding stone. Extends her jaws, as she her voice would raise. To keen invectives in her wanted phrase. But barks, and thence the yelping brute betrays. Still a sad monument the place remains. And from this monstrous change its name obtains. Where she, in long remembrance of her ills. With plaintive howlings the wide desert fills. Greeks, Trojans, friends and foes, and gods above. Her numerous wrongs to just compassion move. Even Juno's self forgets her ancient hate. And owns she had deserved a milder fate. Funeral of Memnon. Memnon, the son of Aurora, is killed by Achilles at the siege of Troy, in honor of his memory, and in compliance with the prayers of his mother, Jupiter causes birds. Called Memnonides, to spring from his ashes, who divide into two parties, and contend with mutual acrimony. Yet bright Aurora, partial as she was. To Troy, and those that loved the Trojan cause. Nor Troy nor Hecuba can now bemoan. But weeps a sad misfortune, more her own. Her offspring Memnon, by Achilles slain. She saw extended on the Phrygian plain. She saw, and straight the purple beams, that grace. The rosy morning, vanished from her face. A deadly pale her wanted bloom invades. And veils the lowering skies with mournful shades. But when his limbs upon the pile were laid, the last kind duty that by friends is paid, his mother to the skies directs her flight, nor could sustain to view the doleful sight. But frantic, with her loose neglected hair, hastens to Jove, and falls a suppliant there. O King of Heaven, O Father of the skies! The weeping goddess passionately cries, Though I the meanest of immortals am, and fewest temples celebrate my fame. Yet still a goddess, I presume to come. Within the verge of your ethereal dome. Yet still may plead some merit, if my light. With purple dawn controls the powers of night. If from a female hand that virtue springs. Which to the gods and men such pleasure brings. Yet I nor honors seek, nor rites divine. Nor for more altars or more fanes repine. Oh that such trifles were the only cause. From whence Aurora's mind its anguish draws. For Memnon lost, my dearest only child. With weightier grief my heavy heart is filled. My warrior son. That lived but half his time. Nipped in the bud, and blasted in his prime. Who for his uncle early took the field. 
and by Achilles' fatal spear was killed. To whom but Jove should I for succor come? For Jove alone could fix his cruel doom. O sovereign of the gods, accept my prayer. Grant my request, and soothe a mother's care. On the deceased some solemn boon bestow. To expiate the loss, and ease my wa. Jove, with a nod, complied with her desire. Around the body flamed the funeral fire. The pile decreased, that lately seemed so high. And sheets of smoke rolled upward to the sky. As humid vapors from a marshy bog. Rise by degrees, condensing into fog. That intercept the sun's enlivening ray. And with a cloud infect the cheerful day. The sooty ashes wafted by the air. Whirl round, and thicken in a body there. Then take a form, which their own heat and fire. With active life and energy inspire. Its lightness makes it seem to fly, and soon. It schemes on real wings, that are its own. A real bird, it beats the breezy wind. Mixed with a thousand sisters of the kind. That, from the same formation newly sprung. Upborne aloft on plumy pinions hung. Thrice round the pile advanced the circling throng. Thrice, with their wings, a whizzing consort rung. In the fourth flight their squadron they divide. Ranked in two different troops, on either side. Then two and two, inspired with martial rage. From either troop in equal pairs engage. Each combatant with beak and pounces pressed. In wrathful ire, his adversary's breast. Each falls a victim, to preserve the fame. Of that great hero whence their being came. From him their courage and their name they take. And, as they lived, they die for Memnon's sake. Punctual to time, with each revolving year. In fresh array the champion birds appear. Again, prepared with vengeful minds, they come. To bleed, in honor of the soldier's tomb. Therefore in others it appeared not strange. To grieve for Hecuba's unhappy change. But poor Aurora had enough to do. With her own loss, to mind another's wa. Who still in tears her tender nature shows. Besprinkling all the world with pearly dews. Voyage of Aeneas. Aeneas, with his father Anchises, is hospitably entertained at Delos, by Aeneas the priest of Apollo, after visiting the island of Phaeacia. The hero at length arrives at the dangerous rocks of Scylla. Troy thus destroyed, t'was still denied by fate. The hopes of Troy should perish with the state. His sire, the son of Cytherea bore. And household gods from burning Ilium's shore. The pious prince, a double duty paid. Each sacred burden through the flames conveyed. With young Ascanius, and this only prize. Of heaps of wealth, he from Antandros flies. But struck with horror, left the Thracian shore. Stained with the blood of murdered Polydor. The Delian Isle receives the banished train. Driven by kind gales, and favored by the main. Here pious Aeneas, priest and monarch, reigned. And either charge with equal care sustained. His subjects ruled, to Phoebus homage paid. His God obeying, and by those obeyed. The priest displays his hospitable gait. And shows the riches of his church and state. The sacred shrubs, which eased Latona's pain. The palm, and olive, and the votive fane. Here grateful flames with fuming incense fed. And mingled wine ambrosial odors shed. Of slaughtered steers the crackling entrails burned. And then the strangers to the court returned. On beds of tapestry placed aloft, they dine. With Ceres' gift, and flowing bowls of wine. When thus Anchises spoke, amid the feast. Say, mitred monarch, Phoebus' chosen priest. Or, ere from Troy by cruel fate expelled. When first mine eyes these sacred walls beheld. A son, and twice two daughters crown thy bliss. Or heirs my memory, and I judge amiss. The royal prophet shook his hoary head. With snowy fillets bound, and sighing, said. 
Thy memory errs not, Prince. Thou sawst me then. The happy father of so large a train. Behold me now, such turns of chance befall. The race of man, almost bereft of all. For ah! What comfort can my son bestow? What help afford, to mitigate my wa? While far from hence, in Andrus Isle he reigns. From him so named, and there my place sustains. Him Delius prescience gave, the twice-born god. A boon more wondrous on the maids bestowed. Whatever they touched, he gave them to transmute. A gift past credit, and above their suit. To Ceres, Bacchus, and Minerva's fruit. How great their value, and how rich their use! Whose only touch such treasures could produce! The dire destroyer of the Trojan reign! Fierce Agamemnon, such a prize to gain! A proof we also were designed by fate! To feel the tempest that o'erturned your state! With force superior, and a ruffian crew! From these weak arms the helpless virgins drew! and sternly bade them use the grant divine. To keep the fleet in corn, in oil, and wine. Each, as they could, escaped, two strove to gain. You be as isle, and two their brothers reign. The soldier follows, and demands the dames. If held by force, immediate war proclaims. Fear conquered nature in their brother's mind. And gave them up to punishment assigned. Forgive the deed, nor Hector's arm was there. Nor thine, Aeneas, to maintain the war. Whose only force upheld your Ilium's towers. For ten long years against the Grecian powers. Prepared to bind their captive arms in bands. To heaven they reared their yet unfettered hands. Help, Bacchus, author of the gift, they prayed. The gift's great author gave immediate aid. If such destruction of the human frame, by ways so wondrous, may deserve the name. Nor could I hear, nor can I now relate. Exact the manner of their altered state. But this in general of my loss I knew. Transformed to doves, on milky plumes they flew. Such as on Ida's mount thy consort's chariot drew. With such discourse they entertained the feast. Then rose from table, and withdrew to rest. The following morn, ere soul was seen to shine. The inquiring Trojans sought the sacred shrine. The mystic power commands them to explore. Their ancient mother, and a kindred shore. Attending to the sea, the generous prince. Dismissed his guests with rich munificence. In old Anchises hand a scepter placed. A vest and quiver young Ascanius graced his sire a cup, which from the Aeonian coast, Ismenian Thurses sent his royal host, Alcon of Mile made what Thurses sent, and carved thereon this ample argument. A town with seven distinguished gates was shown, which spoke its name, and made the city known. Before it, piles and tombs, and rising flames, the rites of death, and choirs of mourning dames who bared their breasts, and gave their hair to flow. The signs of grief, and marks of public woe. Their fountains dried, the weeping naiads mourned. The trees stood bare, with searing cankers burned. No herbage clothed the ground. A ragged flock. Of goats half famished licked the naked rock. Of manly courage, and with mind serene. Orion's daughters in the town were seen. One heaved her chest to meet the lifted knife. One plunged the poniard through the seed of life. Their country's victims. Mourns the rescued state. The bodies burns, and celebrates their fate. To save the failure of the illustrious line. From the pale ashes rose, of form divine. Two generous youths. These, fame Caroni calls. Who join the pomp and mourn their mother's falls. These burnished figures formed of antique mold. Shone on the brass, with rising sculpture bold. A wreath of gilt acanthus round the brim was rolled. Nor less expense the Trojan gifts expressed. 
a fuming censer for the royal priest, a chalice, and a crown of princely cost, with ruddy gold, and sparkling gems embossed. Now hoisting sail, to Crete the Trojans stood, themselves remembering sprung from Tusser's blood. But heaven forbids, and pestilential Jove. From noxious skies the wandering navy drove. Her hundred cities left, from Crete they bore. And sought the destined land, Ausonius' shore. But tossed by storms at either strophe as lay. Till scared by harpies from the faithless bay. Then passing onward with a prosperous wind. Left sly Yulse's spacious realms behind. Ambracia's state, in former ages known. The strife of gods, the judge transformed to stone. They saw, for Actian Phoebus since renowned. Who Caesar's arms with naval conquest crowned. Next passed Dodona, wont of old to boast. Her vocal forest, and Caonia's coast. Where King Molossus' sons on wings aspired. And saw secure the harmless fuel fired. Now to Phaeacia's happy isle they came. For fertile orchards known to early fame. Epirus passed, they next beheld with joy. A second Ilium, and fictitious Troy. Here Trojan Hellenus the scepter swayed. Who showed their fate, and mystic truths displayed. By him confirmed, Cecilia's isle they reached. Whose sides to see, three promontories stretched. Pekinos to the stormy south is placed. On Lilibium blows the gentle west. Poloros cliffs the northern bear survey. Who rolls above, and dreads to touch the sea. By this they steer, and favored by the tide. Secure by night in Zankel's harbor ride. Here cruel Scylla gains the rocky shore. And there the waves of loud Charybdis roar. This sucks, and vomits ships, and bodies drowned. And ravenous dogs the womb of that surround. In face a virgin, and, if aught be true. By bards recorded, once a virgin too. A train of youths in vain desired her bed. By sea nymphs loved, to nymphs of seas she fled. The maid to these, with female pride, displayed. Their baffled courtship, and their love betrayed. When Galatea thus bespoke the fair. But first she sight, while Scylla combed her hair. You, lovely maid, a generous race pursues. Whom safe you may, as now you do, refuse. To me, though powerful in a numerous train. Of sisters, sprung from gods, who rule the main. My native seas could scarce a refuge prove. To shun the fury of the Cyclops' love. Tears choked her utterance here, the pitying maid. With marble fingers wiped them off, and said. My dearest goddess, let thy Scylla know. For I am faithful, whence these sorrows flow. The maid's entreaties o'er the nymph prevail. Who thus to Scylla tells the mournful tale. Story of Assis, Polyphemus, and Galatea. Galatea, a sea nymph, is passionately beloved by the Cyclop Polyphemus, whom she treats with disdain, while Assis, a shepherd of Sicily, is the object of her affections, stung with jealousy, the Cyclop crushes his rival with a piece of broken rock, his mistress is inconsolable for his loss. And since she is unable to restore him to life, changes him into a fountain. Assis, the lovely youth, whose loss I mourn. From Faunus, and the nymph Symethus, born. Was both his parents' pleasure, but to me. Was all that love could make a lover be. The gods our minds in mutual bands did join. I was his only joy, and he was mine. Now sixteen summers the sweet youth had seen. And doubtful down began to shade his chin. When Polyphemus first disturbed our joy. And loved me fiercely, as I loved the boy. Ask not which passion in my soul was higher. My last aversion, or my first desire. Nor this the greater was, nor that the less. Both were alike, for both were in excess. Thee, Venus, thee, both heaven and earth obey. Immense thy power, and boundless is thy sway. The Cyclop, 
who defied the ethereal throne. And thought no thunder louder than his own. The terror of the woods, and wilder far. Than wolves in plains, or bears in forests, are. The inhuman host, who made his bloody feasts. On mangled members of his butchered guests. Yet felt the force of love, and fierce desire. And burned for me with unrelenting fire. Forgot his caverns, and his woolly care. Assumed the softness of a lover's air. And combed, with teeth of rakes. His rugged hair. Now with a crooked scythe his beard he sleeks. And mows the stubborn stubble of his cheeks. Now in the crystal stream he looks, to try. His courteous bows, and rolls his glaring eye. His cruelty and thirst for blood are lost. And ships securely sail along the coast. The prophet Telemus arrived by chance. Where Etna's summits to the seas advance. Who marked the tracks of every bird that flew. And sure presages from their flying drew. Foretold the cyclop that Ulysses' hand. In his broad eye should thrust a flaming brand. The giant, with a scornful grin, replied. Vain augur, thou hast falsely prophesied. Already love his flaming brand has tossed. Looking on two fair eyes my sight I lost. Thus, warned in vain, with stalking pace he strode. And stamped the margin of the briny flood. With heavy steps, and weary, sought again. The cool retirement of his gloomy den. A promontory, sharpening by degrees. Ends in a wedge, and overlooks the seas. On either side below, the water flows. This airy walk the giant lover chose. Here on the midst he sat, his flocks unled. Their shepherd followed, and securely fed. A pine, so burly, and of length so vast. That sailing ships required it for a mast. He wielded for a staff, his steps to guide. But laid it by, his whistle while he tried. A hundred reeds, of a prodigious growth. Scarce made a pipe proportion to his mouth. Which, when he gave it wind, the rocks around. And watery plains, the dreadful hiss resound. I heard the ruffian shepherd rudely blow. Where in a hollow cave I sat below. On Assis' bosom I my head reclined. And still preserve the poem in my mind. Oh, lovely Galatea! Whiter far. Then falling snows and rising lilies are. More flowery than the meads, as crystal bright. Erect as alders, and of equal height. More wanton than a kid, more sleek thy skin. Than orient shells, that on the shores are seen. Than apples fairer, when the boughs they laid. Pleasing as winter suns, or summer shade. More grateful to the sight than goodly plains and softer to the touch than down of swans, or curds new turned, and sweeter to the taste, than swelling grapes, that to the vintage haste, more clear than ice, or running streams, that stray, through garden plots, but, ah, more swift than they, yet, Galatea, harder to be broke, than bullocks, unreclaimed to bear the yoke, and far more stubborn than the knotted oak. Like sliding streams, impossible to hold. Like them fallacious, like their fountains cold. More warping than the willow, to decline. My warm embrace, more brittle than the vine. Immovable and fixed in thy disdain. Rough as these rocks, and of a harder grain. More violent than is the rising flood. And the praised peacock is not half so proud. Fierce as the fire, and sharp as thistles are. And more outrageous than a mother bear. Deaf as the billows to the vows I make. And more revengeful than a trodden snake. In swiftness fleeter than the flying hind. Or driven tempests, or the driving wind. All other faults with patience I can bear. But swiftness is the vice I only fear. Yet, if you knew me well, you would not shun. My love, but to my wished embraces run. Would languish in your turn, and court my stay. 
and much repent of your unwise delay. My palace in the living rock is made. By nature's hand, a spacious pleasing shade. Which neither heat can pierce, nor cold invade. My garden filled with fruits you may behold. And grapes in clusters, imitating gold. Some blushing bunches of a purple hue. And these, and those, are all reserved for you. Red strawberries, in shades, expecting stand. Proud to be gathered by so white a hand. Autumnal cornels later fruit provide. And plums, to tempt you, turn their glossy side. Not those of common kinds. But such alone. As in Phaeacian orchards might have grown. Nor chestnuts shall be wanting to your food. Nor garden fruits, nor wildings of the wood. The laden boughs for you alone shall bear. And yours shall be the product of the year. The flocks you see are all my own. Beside. The rest that woods and winding valleys hide. And those that folded in the caves abide. Ask not the numbers of my growing store. Who knows how many, knows he has no more. Nor will I praise my cattle, trust not me. But judge yourself, and pass your own decree. Behold their swelling dugs. The sweepy weight. Of ewes, that sink beneath the milky freight. In the warm folds their tender lambkins lie. Apart from kids, that call with human cry. New milk in nut-brown bowls is duly served. For daily drink, the rest for cheese reserved. Nor are these household dainties all my store. The fields and forests will afford us more. The deer, the hare, the goat, the savage boar. All sorts of venison, and of birds the best. A pair of turtles taken from the nest. I walked the mountains, and two cubs I found. Whose dam had left them on the naked ground. So like, that no distinction could be seen. So pretty, they were presents for a queen. And so they shall, I took them both away. And keep to be companions of your play. O oh, rays, fair nymph, your beauteous face above. The waves, nor scorn my presence and my love. Come, Galatea, come, and view my face. I late beheld it in the watery glass. And found it lovelier than I feared it was. Survey my towering stature, and my size. Not Jove, the Jove you dream that rules the skies. Bears such a bulk. Or is so largely spread. My locks, the plenteous harvest of my head. Hang o'er my manly face, and dangling down. As with a shady grove, my shoulders crown. Nor think. Because my limbs and body bear. A thick-set underwood of bristling hair. My shape deformed. What fouler sight can be. Than the bald branches of a leafless tree? Foul is the steed without a flowing mane. And birds without their feathers and their train. Wool decks the sheep, and man receives a grace. From bushy limbs, and from a bearded face. My forehead with a single eye is filled. Round as a ball, and ample as a shield. The glorious lamp of heaven, the radiant sun. Is nature's eye, and she's content with one. Add, that my father sways your seas, and I. Like you, am of the watery family. I make you his, in making you my own. You I adore, and kneel to you alone. Jove, with his fabled thunder, I despise. And only fear the lightning of your eyes. Frown not, fair nymph, yet I could bear to be. Disdained, if others were disdained with me. But to repulse the cyclop, and prefer. The love of asses, heavens. I cannot bear. But let the stripling please himself, nay, more. Please you, though that's the thing I most abhor. The boy shall find, if e'er we cope in fight. These giant limbs endued with giant might. His living bowels, from his belly torn. And scattered limbs, shall on the flood be born. Thy flood, ungrateful nymph, and fate shall find. That way for thee and asses to be joined. 
4, O. Oh. I burn with love, and thy disdain. Augments at once my passion and my pain. Translated Etna flames within my heart. And thou, inhuman, wilt not ease my smart. Lamenting thus in vain, he rose, and strode. With furious paces to the neighboring wood. Restless his feet, distracted was his walk. Mad were his motions. And confused his talk. Mad as the vanquished bull when forced to yield. His lovely mistress, and forsake the field. Thus far unseen I saw. When fatal chance. His looks directing, with a sudden glance. Assis and I were to his sight betrayed. Where, not suspecting, we securely played. From his wide mouth a bellowing cry he cast. I see, I see. But this shall be your last. A roar so loud made J. Etna to rebound. And all the cyclop labored in the sound. Affrighted with his monstrous voice, I fled. And in the neighboring ocean plunged my head. Poor Assis turned his back, and, help, he cried. Help, Galatea. Help, my parent gods. And take me, dying, to your deep abodes. The cyclop followed, but he sent before. A rib, which from the living rock he tore. Though but an angle reached him of the stone. The mighty fragment was enough alone. To crush all asses. Twas too late to save. But what the fantees allowed to give, I gave. That asses to his lineage should return. And roll among the river gods his urn. Straight issued from the stone a stream of blood. Which lost the purple, mingling with the flood. Then like a double torrent it appeared. The torrent too. In little space was cleared. The stone was cleft and through the yawning chink. New reeds arose on the new river's brink. The rock, from out its hollow womb, disclosed. A sound like water in its course opposed. When, wondrous to behold. Full in the flood. Up starts a youth, and navel high he stood. Horns from his temples rise, and either horn. Thick wreaths of reeds, his native growth, adorn. Were not his stature taller than before. His bulk augmented, and his beauty more. His color blue, for asses he might pass. And asses changed into a stream he was. But mine no more. He rolls along the plains. With rapid motion, and his name retains. Story of Glaucus and Scylla. Glaucus, a fisherman of Boeotia, is transformed into a sea god, and becomes enamored of a Nereid, named Scylla, who rejects his suit. Here ceased the nymph, the fair assembly broke. The sea-green Nereids to the waves betook. While Scylla, fearful of the widespread main, swift to the safer shore returns again. There o'er the sandy margin unarrayed. With printless footsteps, flies the bounding maid. Or in some winding creek's secure retreat. She bathes her weary limbs, and shuns the noonday heat. Her, Glaucus saw, as o'er the deep he rode. New to the seas, and late received a god. He saw, and languished for the virgin's love. With many an artful blandishment he strove. Her flight to hinder, and her fears remove. The more he sues, the more she wings her flight and nimbly gains a neighboring mountain's height. Steep shelving to the margin of the flood. A neighboring mountain bare and woodless stood. Here, by the place secured, her steps she stayed. And, trembling still, her lover's form surveyed. His shape, his hue, her troubled sense appall. And drooping locks, that o'er his shoulders fall. She sees his face divine, and manly brow. End in a fish's writhy tail below. She sees, and doubts within her anxious mind. Whether he comes of God or monster kind. This Glaucus soon perceived, and, oh, forbear. His hand supporting on a rock lay near. Forbear, he cried, fond maid, this needless fear. Nor fish am I, nor monster of the main. 
but equal with the watery gods I reign. Nor Proteus, nor Polemon me excel. Nor he whose breath inspires the sounding shell. My birth, tis true, I owe to mortal race. And I myself but late a mortal was. Even then, in seas, and seas alone, I joyed. The seas my hours and all my cares employed. In meshes now the twinkling prey I drew. Now skillfully the slender line I threw. And silent sat the moving float to view. Not far from shore there lies a verdant mead. With herbage half, and half with water spread. There nor the horned heifers browsing stray. Nor shaggy kids. Nor wanton lambkins play. There nor the sounding bees their nectar cull. Nor rural swains their genial chaplets pull. Nor flocks, nor herds, nor mowers, haunt the place. To crop the flowers, or cut the bushy grass. Thither sure first of living race came I. And sat, by chance, my drooping nets to dry. My scaly prize, in order all displayed. By number on the greensward there I laid. My captives, which or in my nets I took. Or hung unwary on my wily hook. Strange to behold. Yet what avails a lie? I saw them bite the grass as I sat by. Then sudden darting o'er the verdant plain. They spread their fins, as in their native main. I paused, with wonder struck, while all my prey. Left their new master, and regained the sea. Amazed, within my secret self I sought. What God, what herb, the miracle had wrought. But sure no herbs have power like this, I cried. And straight I plucked some neighboring herbs and tried. Scarce had I bit, and proved the wondrous taste. When strong convulsions shook my troubled breast. I felt my heart grow fond of something strange. And my whole nature laboring with a change. Restless I grew, and every place forsook. And still upon the seas I bent my look. Farewell forever. Farewell, land. I said. And plunged among the waves my sinking head. The gentle powers, who that low empire keep, Received me as a brother of the deep. To Tethys, and to ocean old they pray. To purge my mortal earthy parts away. The watery parents to their suit agreed. And thrice nine times a secret charm they read. Then with lust rations purify my limbs. And bid me bathe beneath a hundred streams. A hundred streams from various fountains run and on my head at once come rushing down. Thus far each passage I remember well. And faithfully thus far the tale I tell. But then oblivion dark on all my senses fell. Again, at length, my thoughts reviving came. When I no longer found myself the same. Then first this sea-green beard I felt to grow. And these large honors on my spreading brow. My long descending locks the billows sweep and my broad shoulders cleave the yielding deep. My fishy tail, my arms of azure hue, and every part divinely changed, I view. But what avails these useless honors now? What joys can immortality bestow? What, though our nereids all my form approve? What boots it, while fair Scylla scorns my love? Thus far the god, and more he would have said. When from his presence flew the ruthless maid. Stung with repulse, in such disdainful sort. He seeks Titany in Circe's horrid court. Book. Chapter 14. Transformation of Scylla. The goddess Circe, becoming enamored of Glaucus, and finding his preference for Scylla. Revenges herself on her unhappy rival by a hideous transformation, this sudden metamorphosis so terrifies her. That she throws herself into that part of the sea which separates the coasts of Italy and Sicily, where she is changed into dangerous rocks, which still bear her name. Now Glaucus, with a lover's haste, bounds o'er the swelling waves, and seeks the Latian shore. Messina, Regium, and the barren coast of flaming Etna. To his sight are lost. 
at length he gains the Tyrrhene seas, and views. The hills where baneful filters Circe brews. Monsters in various forms around her press. And thus the god salutes the sorceress. O oh, Circe, be indulgent to my grief. And give a lovesick deity relief. Too well the mighty power of plants I know. To those my figure and new fate I owe. Against Messina, on the Ausonian coast. I Scylla viewed, and from that hour was lost. In tenderest sounds I sued, but still the fair. Was deaf to vows, and pitiless to prayer. If numbers can avail, exert their power. Or energy of plants, if plants have more. I ask no cure, let but the virgin pine. With dying pangs, or agonies, like mine. No longer Circe could her flame disguise. But to the suppliant god Marine replies. When maids are coy, have manlier aims in view. Leave those that fly, but those that like pursue. If love can be by kind compliance won. See, at your feet, the daughter of the sun. Sooner, said Glaucus, shall the ash remove. From mountains, and the swelling surges love. Or humble seaweed to the hills repair. Ere I think any but my Scylla fair. Straight Circe reddens with a guilty shame. And vows revenge for her rejected flame. Fierce liking oft a spite as fierce creates. For love refused, without aversion, hates. To hurt her hapless rival she proceeds. And, by the fall of Scylla, Glaucus bleeds. Some fascinating beverage now she brews. Composed of deadly drugs, and baneful juice. At Regium she arrives, the ocean braves. And treads with unwet feet the boiling waves. Upon the beach a winding bay there lies. Sheltered from seas, and shaded from the skies. This station Scylla chose, a soft retreat. From chilling winds, and raging cancer's heat. The vengeful sorceress visits this recess. Her charm infuses, and infects the place. Soon as the nymph wades in, her nether parts. Turn into dogs, then at herself she starts. A ghastly horror in her eyes appears. But yet she knows not who it is she fears. In vain she offers from herself to run. And drags about her what she strives to shun. Oppressed with grief the pitying God appears. And swells the rising surges with his tears. From the detested sorceress he flies. Her art reviles, and her address denies. While hapless Scylla, changed to rocks, decrees. Destruction to those barks that beat the seas. Voyage of Aeneas continued. After being detained at Carthage, Aeneas at length arrives on the coast of Naples. Here bulged the pride of famed Ulysses' fleet. But good Aeneas scaped the fate he met. As to the Latian shore the Trojan stood. And cut with well-timed oars the foaming flood. He weathered fell Charybdis, but ere long. The skies were darkened, and the tempest strong. Then to the Libyan coast he stretches o'er. And makes at length the Carthaginian shore. Here Dido, with a hospitable care. Into her heart receives the wanderer. From her kind arms the ungrateful hero flies. The injured queen looks on with dying eyes. Then to her folly falls a sacrifice. Aeneas now sets sail, and plying gains. Fair Eryx, where his friend Aesistes reigns. First to his sire does funeral rites decree. Then gives the signal next, and stands to see. Outruns the islands where volcanoes roar. Gets clear of sirens and their faithless shore. But loses Palinurus in the way. Then makes Inarime and Prokita. Transformation of Circopians into apes. The inhabitants of the island Pithecusa are changed into monkeys as a punishment of their dishonesty. The galleys now by Pithecusa pass. The name is from the natives of the place. The father of the gods detesting lies. Oft with abhorrence heard their perjuries. The abandoned race, transformed to beasts, began. To mimic the impertinence of man. 
flat-nosed and furrowed, with grimace they grin. And look to what they were too near akin. Merry in make, and busy to no end. This moment they divert, the next offend. So much this species of their past retains. Though lost the language, yet the noise remains. Aeneas descends to hell. Aeneas entreats the Sibyl to permit him to seek the shade of his father in the Elysian fields. Now, on his right, he leaves Parthenope. His left, Messenus jutting in the sea. Arrives at Kuma, and with awe surveyed. The grotto of the venerable maid. Begs leave through black Avernus to retire. And view the much-loved manes of his sire. Straight the divining virgin raised her eyes. And, foaming with a holy rage, replies. O thou, whose worth thy wondrous works proclaim. The flames thy piety, the world thy fame. Though great be thy request. Yet shalt thou see. The Elysian fields, the infernal monarchy. Thy parents shade. This arm thy steps shall guide. To suppliant virtue nothing is denied. She spoke, and pointing to the golden bough. Which in the Avernian grove refulgent grew. Sees that, she bids, he listens to the maid. Then views the mournful mansions of the dead. The shade of great Anchises, and the place. By fates determined to the Trojan race. As back to upper light the hero came. He thus salutes the visionary dame. Oh! Whether some propitious deity. Or loved by those bright rulers of the sky. With grateful incense I shall style you one. And doom no godhead greater than your own. Twas you restored me from the realms of night. And gave me to behold the fields of light. To feel the breezes of congenial air. And nature's best benevolence to share. Story of the Sibyl Apollo becomes enamored of the Sibyl. And offers to grant whatever she asks, the request is made of a continuance of life for as many years as there are grains in a heap of sand. But the enjoyment of health and beauty are unfortunately forgotten by the applicant. I am no deity, replied the dame. But mortal, and religious rites disclaim. Yet had avoided death's tyrannic sway. Had I consented to the god of day. With promises he sought my love, and said. Have all you wish, my fair Cumean maid. I paused, then pointing to a heap of sand. For every grain, to live a year demand. But, ah! Unmindful of the effect of time. Forgot to covenant for youth and prime. The smiling bloom I boasted once is gone. And feeble age with lagging limbs creeps on. Seven centuries have I lived, three more fulfill. The period of the years to finish still. Who'll think that Phoebus, dressed in youth divine, had once believed his luster less than mine? This withered frame, so fates have willed, shall waste. To nothing but prophetic words at last. The Sibyl mounting now from nether skies. And the famed Ilian prince at Kuma rise. He sailed, and near the place to anchor came. Since called Kajeda from his nurse's name. Here did the luckless maker, a friend. To wise Ulysses, his long labors end. Here, wandering, Achaemenides he meets. And, sudden, thus his late associate greets. Whence came you here, O friend, and whither bound? All gave you lost on fair Cyclopean ground. A Greeks at last aboard a Trojan found. Adventures of Achaemenides Achaemenides, a companion of Ulysses, is left behind on the coast of Sicily, where Aeneas finds him on his voyage to Italy. Thus Achaemenides, with thanks I name. Aeneas, and his piety proclaim. I escaped the Cyclop through the hero's aid. Else in his maw my mangled limbs had laid. When first your navy under sail he found. He raved till Etna labored with the sound. Raging, he stalked along the mountain side. And vented clouds of breath at every stride. His staff a mountain ash, and in the clouds. Oft as he walks, his grisly front he shrouds. 
eyeless he groped about with vengeful haste, and just led promontories as he passed. Then heaved a rock's high summit to the main, and bellowed like some bursting hurricane. Oh! Could I seize Ulysses in his flight? How unlamented were my loss of sight! These jaws should piecemeal tear each panting vein, grind every crackling bone, and pound his brain. As thus he raved my joints with horror shook. The tide of blood my chilling heart forsook. I saw him once disgorge huge morsels, raw. Of wretches undigested in his maw. From the pale breathless trunks whole limbs he tore. His beard all clotted with o'erflowing gore. My anxious hours I passed in caves, my food. Was forest fruits and wildings of the wood. At length a sail I wafted, and aboard. My fortune found a hospitable lord. Now, in return, your own adventures tell. And what, since first you put to sea, befell. Adventures of Maker Maker relates the adventures of Ulysses and his companions during their voyage to Ithaca, with the enchantments of Circe. Who detains the hero at her court twelve months. Then Maker, there reigned a prince of fame. O'er Tuscan seas, and Aeolus his name. A largest to Ulysses he consigned. And in a steer's tough hide enclosed a wind. Nine days before the swelling gale we ran. The tenth to make the meeting land began. When now the merry mariners, to find. Imagined wealth within, the bag unbind. Forth with out rushed a gust, which backward bore. Our galleys to the Lestragonian shore. Whose crown antiphides the tyrant wore. Some few commissioned were with speed to treat. We to his court repair, his guards we meet. Two, friendly flight preserved, the third was doomed. To be by those cursed cannibals consumed. Inhumanly our hapless friends they treat. Our men they murder, and destroy our fleet. In time the wise Ulysses bore away and dropped his anchor in yon faithless bay. The thoughts of perils past we still retain, and fear to land, till lots appoint the men. Polite's true, Alpiner given to wine. Eurylochus, myself, the lots assign. Designed for dangers, and resolved to dare. To Circe's fatal palace we repair. Before the spacious front a herd we find. Of beasts, the fiercest of the savage kind. Our trembling steps with blandishments they meet. And fawn, unlike their species, at our feet. Within, upon a sumptuous throne of state. On golden columns raised, the enchantress sate. Rich was her robe, and amiable her mien. Her aspect awful, and she looked a queen. Her maids not mind the loom, nor household care nor wage in needlework a Scythian war. But cull, in canisters, disastrous flowers. And plants from haunted heaths, and fairy bowers. With brazen sickles reaped at planetary hours. Each dose the goddess weighs with watchful eye. So nice her art in impious pharmacy. Entering, she greets us with a gracious look. And airs, that future amity bespoke. Her ready nymphs serve up a rich repast. The bowl she dashes first, then gives to taste. Quick, to our own undoing we comply. Her power we prove, and show the sorcery. Soon, in a length of face, our head extends. Our chine stiff bristles bears, and forward bends. A breadth of brawn new burnishes our neck. Anon we grunt, as we begin to speak. Alone Eurylochus refused to taste. Nor to a beast obscene the man debased. Hither Ulysses hastes, so fate's command. And bears the powerful moly in his hand. Unsheathes his scimitar, assaults the dame. Preserves his species, and remains the same. The nuptial rite this outrage straight attends. The dower desired is his transfigured friends. The incantation backward she repeats. Inverts her rod, and what she did defeats. And now our skin grows smooth, our shape upright. Our arms stretch up, 
our cloven feet unite. With tears our weeping general we embrace. Hang on his neck, and melt upon his face. Twelve silver moons in Circe's court we stay. While there they waste the unwilling hours away. Twas here I spied a youth in Parian stone. His head a pecker bore, the cause unknown. To passengers. A nymph of Circe's train. The mystery thus attempted to explain. Story of Picus and Canons. Picus, king of Latium, becomes the husband of Canons. Whom he tenderly loves, shortly after the nuptials, the youth, while indulging in the pleasures of the chase, is met by Circe. Who becomes deeply enamored of him, Picus meets the advances of the goddess with coldness. And she, in revenge, transforms him into a woodpecker, and his companions into wild beasts, while Canons, in despair, wastes away, and is changed into a voice. Picus, who once the Ausonian scepter held, could rein the steed, and fit him for the field. So like he was to what you see, that still. We doubt if real, or the sculptor's skill. The graces in the finished piece, you find, are but the copy of his fairer mind. For lustre scarce the royal youth could name. Till every lovesick nymph confessed a flame. Oft for his love the mountain dryad sued. And every silver sister of the flood. Those of Numicus, Albula, and those. Where Almo creeps, and hasty Anar o'erflows. Where Segi Anio glides through smiling meads. Where shady Farfar rustles in the reeds. And those that love the lakes, and homage o. Oh. To the chaste goddess of the silver bow. In vain each nymph her brightest charms put on. His heart no sovereign would obey but one. She whom Vanilla, on Mount Palatine. To Janus bore, the fairest of his line. Nor did her face alone her charms confess. Her voice was ravishing, and pleased no less. Weener she sung, so melting were her strains. The flocks, unfed, seemed listening on the plains. The rivers would stand still, the cedars bend. And birds neglect their pinions to attend. The savage kind in forest wilds grow tame. And canons, from her heavenly voice, her name. Hymen had now, in some ill-fated hour. Their hands united, as their hearts before. While their soft moments in delights they waste. And each new day was dearer than the past. Picus would sometimes o'er the forests rove. And mingle sports with intervals of love. It chanced, as once the foaming boar he chased. His jewel sparkling on his Tyrian vest. Lascivious Circe well the youth surveyed. As simpling on the flowery hills she strayed. Her wishing eyes their silent message tell. And from her lap the verdant mischief fell. As she attempts at words, his courser springs. O'er hills, and lawns, and Evan a wish out wings. Thou shalt not, skate me so, pronounced the dame. If plants have power, and spells be not a name. She said, and forthwith formed a boar of air. That sought the covert with dissembled fear. Swift to the thicket Picus wings his way. On foot, to chase the visionary prey. Now she invokes the daughters of the night. Does noxious juices smear, and charms recite. Such as can veil the moon's more feeble fire. Or shade the golden luster of her sire. In filthy fog she hides the cheerful noon. The guard at distance, and the youth alone. By those fair eyes, she cries, and every grace. That finish all the wonders of your face. Oh! I conjure thee, hear a queen complain. Nor let the sun's soft lineage sue in vain. Who or thou art, replied the king, forbear. None can my passion with my cannons share. She first my every tender wish possessed. And found the soft approaches to my breast. In nuptials blessed, each loose desire we shun. Nor time can end what innocence begun. Think not, she cried, to saunter out a life. Of form, with that domestic drudge, a wife. 
My just revenge, dull fool, ere long shall show. What ills we women, if refused, can do. Think me a woman and a lover too. From dear successful spite we hope for ease. Nor fail to punish where we fail to please. Now twice to east she turns, as oft to west. Thrice waves her wand, as oft a charm expressed. On the lost youth her magic power she tries. Aloft he springs, and wonders how he flies. On painted plumes the woods he seeks, and still. The monarch oak he pierces with his bill. Thus changed, no more o'er Latian lands he reigns. Of Picus nothing but the name remains. The winds from drizzling damps now purge the air. The mist subsides, the settling skies are fair. The court their sovereign seek with arms in hand. They threaten Circe, and their lord demand. Quick she invokes the spirits of the air. And twilight elves, that on dun wings repair. To charnels, and the unhallowed sepulchre. Now, strange to tell, the plants sweat drops of blood. The trees are tossed from forests where they stood. Blue serpents o'er the tainted herbage slide. Pale glaring spectres on the ether ride. Dogs howl, earth yawns, rent rocks forsake their beds. And from their quarries heave their stubborn heads. The sad spectators, stiffened with their fears. She sees, and sudden every limb she smears. Then each of savage beasts the figure bears. The sun did now to western waves retire. In tides to temper his bright world of fire. Cannons laments her royal husband's stay. Ill suits fond love with absence or delay. Where she commands, her ready people run. She wills, retracts, bids, and forbids anon. Restless in mind, and dying with despair. Her breasts she beats, and tears her flowing hair. Six days and nights she wanders on, as chance. Directs, without or sleep or sustenance. Tiber at last beholds the weeping fair. Her feeble limbs no more the mourner bear. Stretched on his banks, she to the flood complains. And faintly tunes her voice to dying strains. The sickening swan thus hangs her silver wings. And, as she droops, her elegy she sings. Ere long sad cannons wastes to air, while fame. The place still honors with her hapless name. Here did the tender tale of Picus cease. Above belief the wonder I confess. Again we sail, but more disasters meet. Foretold by Circe, to our suffering fleet. Myself unable further woes to bear. Declined the voyage, and am refuged here. Aeneas arrives in Italy. Latinus, king of Latium, bestows the hand of his daughter on Aeneas, who is opposed by Turnus. The affianced husband of the maiden, Aeneas obtains a supply of auxiliary troops from the Etruscans. While the Rutuli dispatch an embassy to Diamed in behalf of Tomus. Thus Maker. Now with a pious aim. Had good Aeneas raised a funeral flame. In honor of his hoary nurse's name. Her epitaph he fixed, and setting sail. Kajeda left, and catched at every gale. He steered at distance from the faithless shore. Where the false goddess reigns with fatal power. And sought those grateful groves, that shade the plain. Where Tiber rolls majestic to the main. And fattens, as he runs, the fair champagne. His kindred gods the hero's wishes crown. With fair Lavinia, and Latinus throne. But not without a war the prize he won. Drawn up in bright array the battle stands. Turnus with arms his promised wife demands. Etrurians, Latians equal fortune share. And doubtful long appears the face of war. Both powers from neighboring princes seek supplies. And embassies appoint for new allies. Aeneas, for relief, Evander moves. His quarrel he asserts, his case approves. The bold Rutulians, with an equal speed. Sage Venulus dispatched to Diamed. The king, late griefs revolving in his mind. These reasons for neutrality assigned. 
shall I, of one poor dotal town possessed. My people thin, my wretched country waste. An exiled prince, and on a shaking throne. Or risk my patron subjects, or my own. You'll grieve the harshness of our hap to hear. Nor can I tell the tale without a tear. Adventures of Diomedes. Diomed briefly recounts to the Rutulian embassy the misfortunes he has encountered since the destruction of Troy. After famed Ilium was by Argives won. And flames had finished what the sword begun. Pallas, incensed, pursued us to the main. In vengeance of her violated fane. Alone Oileus forced the Trojan maid. Yet all were punished for the brutal deed. A storm begins, the raging waves run high. The clouds look heavy, and benight the sky. Red sheets of lightning o'er the seas are spread. Our tackling yields, and wrecks at last succeed. Tis tedious our disastrous state to tell. Evan Priam would have pitted what befell. Yet Pallas saved me from the swallowing main. At home new wrongs to meet, as fates ordain. Chased from my country, I once more repeat. All suffering seas could give, or war complete. For Venus, mindful of her wound, decreed. Still new calamities should past succeed. Agmon, impatient through successive ills. With fury, love's bright goddess thus reviles. These plagues in spite of Diomed are sent. The crime is his, but ours the punishment. Let each my friends her puny spleen despise. And dare that proud dictator of the skies. The rest of Agmon's insolence complain. And of irreverence the wretch arraign. About to answer, his blaspheming throat. Contracts, and shrieks in some disdainful note. To his new skin a fleece of feathers clings. Hides his late arms and lengthens into wings. The lower features of his face extend. Warp into horn, and in a beak descend. Some more experience Agmon's destiny. And wheeling in the air, like swans they fly. These thin remains to Donna's realms I bring. And here I reign, a poor precarious king. Transformation of Apulus. The disrespectful treatment of the wood nymphs by Apulus is punished by his transformation into a wild olive tree. Thus Diomedes. Venulus withdraws. Unsped the service of the common cause. Putially he passes, and surveyed. A cave long honored for its awful shade. Here trembling reeds exclude the piercing ray. Here streams in gentle falls through winding stray. And with a passing breath cool zephyrs play. The goatherd god frequents the silent place. As once the wood nymphs of the sylvan race. Till Apulus with a dishonest air. And gross behavior. Banished thence the fair. The bold buffoon, weener they tread the green. Their motion mimics, but with jest obscene. Loose language oft he utters, but ere long. A bark in filmy network binds his tongue. Thus changed, a base wild olive he remains. The shrub the coarseness of the clown retains. Trojan ships transform to sea nymphs. Turnus sets fire to the Trojan ships, which are transformed into sea deities by Sibylle, Aeneas, at length, surmounts all opposition. And is united to Lavinia. Meanwhile the Latians all their power prepare. Gainst fortune, and the foe to push the war. With Phrygian blood the floating fields they stain. But short of suckers, still contend in vain. Turnus remarks the Trojan fleet ill-manned. Unguarded, and at anchor near the strand. He thought. And straight a lighted brand he bore. And fire invades what, scaped the waves before. The billows from the kindling prow retire. Pitch, rosin, sear wood on red wings aspire. And Vulcan on the seas exerts his attribute of fire. This when the mother of the gods beheld. Her towery crown she shook, and stood revealed. Her brindled lions reigned, unveiled her head. And hovering o'er her favored fleet, she said. Cease, Turnus, and the heavenly powers respect. 
nor dare to violate what I protect. These galleys once fair trees on Ida stood, and gave their shade to each descending god. Nor shall consume, irrevocable fate. Allots there being no determined date. Straight peals of thunder heaven's high arches rend. The hailstones leap, the showers in spouts descend. The winds with widened throats the signal give. The cables break, the smoking vessels drive. Now, wondrous, as they beat the foaming flood. The timbers soften into flesh and blood. The yards and oars new arms and legs design. A trunk the hull, the slender keel a spine. The prow a female face, and by degrees. The galleys rise green daughters of the seas. Sometimes on coral beds they sit in state. Or wanton on the waves they feared of late. The barks that beat the seas are still their care. Themselves remembering what of late they were. To save a Trojan sail in throngs they press. But smile to see Alcinous in distress. Unable were those wonders to deter. The Latians from their unsuccessful war. Both sides for doubtful victory contend. And on their courage and their gods depend. Nor bright Lavinia, nor Latinus crown. Warm their great soul to war, like fair renown. Venus at last beholds her godlike son. Triumphant, and the field of battle won. Brave Turnus slain, strong Ardia but a name. And buried in fierce deluges of flame. Her towers, that boasted once a sovereign sway. The fate of fancied grandeur now betray. A famished heron from the ashes springs. And beats the ruin with disastrous wings. Calamities of towns distressed she feigns. And oft, with woeful shrieks, of war complains. Deification of Aeneas. The prayers of Venus prevail, and Aeneas is admitted into the number of the gods, while his descendants sway the scepter of Latium. Now had Aeneas, as ordained by fate, survived the period of Satinia's hate, and, by a sure irrevocable doom, fixed the immortal majesty of Rome, fit for the station of his kindred stars. His mother goddess thus her suit prefers. Almighty arbiter, whose powerful nod shakes distant earth, and bows our own abode. To thy great progeny indulgent be, and rank the goddess born a deity. Already has he viewed, with mortal eyes, thy brother's kingdoms of the nether skies. Forth with a conclave of the godhead meets, where Juno in the shining senate sits. Remorse for past revenge the goddess feels. Then thundering Jove the almighty mandate seals. Allots the prince of his celestial line. An apotheosis, and rites divine. The crystal mansions echo with applause. And, with her graces, love's bright queen withdraws. Shoots in a blaze of light along the skies. And, borne by turtles. To Laurentum flies. Alights, where through the reeds Nemitia strays. And to the seas his watery tribute pays. The god she supplicates to wash away. The parts more gross and subject to decay. And cleanse the goddess born from radical allay. The horned flood with glad attention stands. Then bids his streams obey their sire's commands. His better parts by lustral waves refined. More pure, and nearer to ethereal mind. With gums of fragrant scent the goddess strews. And on his features breathes ambrosial dews. Thus deified, new honors Rome decrees. Shrines, festivals, and styles him indiges. Ascanius now the Latian scepter sways. The Alban nation, Silvius, next obeys. Then young Latinus, next an Alba came. The grace and guardian of the Alban name. Then Epitus, then gentle Capus reigned. Then caped is the regal power sustained. Next he who perished on the Tuscan flood. And honored with his name the river god. Now haughty Remulus began his reign. Who fell by thunder he aspired to fame. Mica Crota succeeded to the crown. 
from peace endeavouring, more than arms, renown. To Aventinus well resigned his throne. The mount, on which he ruled, preserves his name. And Procas wore the regal diadem. Story of Vertumnus and Pomona Vertumnus prosecutes his suit to the nymph Pomona in the disguise of an old woman. A hamadryad flourished in these days. Her name Pomona, from her woodland race. In garden culture none could so excel. Or form the pliant souls of plants so well. Or to the fruit more generous flavors lend. Or teach the trees with nobler loads to bend. The nymph frequented not the flattering stream. Nor meads, the subject of a virgin's dream. But to such joys her nursery did prefer. Alone to attend her vegetable care. A pruning hook she carried in her hand. And taught the stragglers to obey command. Lest the licentious, and unthrifty bow. The too indulgent parent should undo. She shows, how stocks invite to their embrace. A graft, and naturalize a foreign race. To mend the savage taint, and in its stead. Adopt new nature, and a nobler breed. Now hourly she observes her growing care. And guards the nonage from the bleaker air. Then opes her streaming sluices, to supply. With flowing draughts her thirsty family. Long had she labored to continue free. From chains of love, and nuptial tyranny. And in her orchard small extent immured. Her vowed virginity she still secured. Oft would loose pan, and all the brutal train. Of satyrs, tempt her innocence in vain. Vertumnus too pursued the maid no less. But with his rivals shared a like success. To gain access a thousand ways he tries. Oft, in the hind, the lover would disguise. The heedless lout comes shambling on, and seems. Just sweating from the labor of his teams. Then, from the harvest of the mimic swain. Seems bending with a load of bearded grain. Sometimes a dresser of the vine he feigns. And lawless tendrils to their bounds restrains. Sometimes his sword a soldier shows, his rod. An angler, still so various is the god. Now, in a forehead cloth, some crone he seems. A staff supplying the defect of limbs. Admittance thus he gains, admires the store. Of fairest fruit, the fair possessor more. Then greets her with a kiss, the unpractised dame. Admired a grand aim kissed with such a flame. Now, seated by her, he beholds a vine. Around an elm in amorous foldings twine. If that fair elm, he cried, alone should stand. No grapes would glow with gold and tempt the hand. Or if that vine without her elm should grow. T'would creep a poor neglected shrub below. Be then, fair nymph, by these examples led. Nor shun, for fancied fears, the nuptial bed. Not she for whom the Lapithites took arms. Nor Sparta's queen, could boast such heavenly charms. And if you would on woman's faith rely. None can your choice direct so well as I. Though old, so much Pomona I adore. Scarce does the bright Vertumnus love her more. Tis your fair self alone his breast inspires. With softest wishes, and unsoiled desires. Then fly all vulgar followers, and prove. The God of seasons only worth your love. On my assurance well you may repose. Vertumnus scarce Vertumnus better knows. True to his choice, all looser flames he flies. Nor for new faces fashionably dies. The charms of youth, and every smiling grace. Bloom in his features, and the God confess. Besides, he puts on every shape at ease. But those the most that best Pomona please. Still to oblige her is her lover's aim. Their likings and aversions are the same. Nor the fair fruit your burdened branches bear. Nor all the youthful product of the year. Could bribe his choice, yourself alone can prove. A fit reward for so refined a love. Relent, fair nymph, and with a kind, regret. 
Think tis Vertumnus weeping at your feet. A tale attend, through Cyprus known, to prove. How Venus once revenged neglected love. Story of Iphis and Anaxarete. The disguised Vertumnus cautions his mistress from the indulgence of an unfeeling disregard to the sufferings of her lover by the example of Anaxarete. Who is converted into a statue as a punishment for her pride, the god then resumes his natural shape, and Pomona renounces her prepossessions in favor of a single life. Iphis, of vulgar birth, by chance had viewed. Fair Anaxarete of Tusser's blood. Not long had he beheld the royal dame. Ere the bright sparkle kindled into flame. Oft did he struggle with a just despair. Unfixed to ask, unable to forbear. But love, who flatters still his own disease. Hopes all things will succeed he knows will please. Where'er the fair one haunts, he hovers there. And seeks her confidant with sighs. And prayer. Or letters he conveys, that seldom prove. Successless messengers in suits of love. Now shivering at her gates the wretch appears. And myrtle garlands on the columns rears. Wet with a deluge of unbidden tears. The nymph, more hard than rocks, more deaf than seas. Derides his prayers, insults his agonies. Arraigns of insolence the aspiring swain. And takes a cruel pleasure in his pain. Resolved at last to finish his despair. He thus upbraids the inexorable fair. Oh, Anaxarete, at last forget. The license of a passion indiscreet. Now triumph, since a welcome sacrifice. Your slave prepares to offer to your eyes. My life, without reluctance, I resign. That present best can please a pride like thine. But, oh! Forbear to blast a flame so bright. Doomed never to expire but with the light. And you, great powers, do justice to my name. The hours, you take from life, restore to fame. Then o'er the posts, once hung with wreaths, he throws. The ready cord, and fits the fatal noose. For death prepares. And bounding from above. At once the wretch concludes his life and love. Ere long the people gather, and the dead. Is to his mourning mother's arms conveyed. First, like some ghastly statue she appears. Then bathes the breathless corse in seas of tears. And gives it to the pile. Now as the throng. Proceed in sad solemnity along. To view the passing pomp the cruel fair. Hastes, and beholds her breathless lover there. Struck with the sight, inanimate she seems. Set are her eyes, and motionless her limbs. Her features without fire, her color gone. And, like her heart, she hardens into stone. In Salamis the statue still is seen. In the famed temple of the Cyprian queen. Warned by this tale, no longer than disdain. O, oh, nymph beloved, to ease a lover's pain. So may the frosts in spring your blossoms spare. And winds their rude autumnal rage forbear. The story oft Vertumnus urged in vain. But then assumed his heavenly form again. Such looks, and luster the bright youth adorn. As when with rays glad Phoebus paints the morn. The sight so warms the fair admiring maid. Like snow she melts, so soon can youth persuade. Consent, on eager wings, succeeds desire. And both the lovers glow with mutual fire. Latian line. Romulus, having restored his grandfather Numitor to the throne of which he had been unjustly dispossessed by his brother Amulius, at length succeeds to the crown. Now Procas yielding to the fates, his son. Mild Numitor succeeded to the crown. But false Amulius, with a lawless power. At length deposed his brother Numitor. Then Ilya's valiant issue, with the sword. Her parent re-enthroned, the rightful lord. Next Romulus to people Rome contrives. The joyous time of Pale's feast arrives. He gives the word to seize the Sabine wives. The sires enraged take arms, by Tatius led. 
bold to revenge their violated bed. A fort there was, not yet unknown to fame. Called the Tarpeian, its commander's name. This by the false Tarpeia was betrayed. But death well recompensed the treacherous maid. The foe on this new bought success relies. And, silent, march, the city to surprise. Satenia's arts with Sabine arms combine. But Venus countermines the vain design. Entreats the nymphs that o'er the springs preside. Which near the fane of hoary Janus glide. To send their suckers, every urn they drain. To stop the Sabine's progress, but in vain. The naiads now more stratagems essay. And kindling sulfur to each source convey. The floods ferment, hot exhalations rise. Till from the scalding ford the army flies. Soon Romulus appears in shining arms. And to the war the Roman legions warms. The battle rages, and the field is spread. With nothing but the dying and the dead. Both sides consent to treat without delay. And their two chiefs at once the scepter sway. But Tatius by Lavinian fury slain. Great Romulus continued long to reign. Assumption of Romulus. The god Mars translates Romulus to the skies, where H.E.W. enrolled in the number of the gods under the name of Curinus. Now warrior Mars his burnished helm puts on. And thus addresses heaven's imperial throne. Since the inferior world is now become. One vassal globe, and colony to Rome. This grace, O Jove, for Romulus I claim. Admit him to the skies, from whence he came. Long hast thou promised an ethereal state. To Mars's lineage, and thy word is fate. The sire, that rules the thunder with a nod. Declared the fiat, and dismissed the god. Soon as the power armipotent surveyed. The flashing skies, the signal he obeyed. And leaning on his lance, he mounts his car. His fiery coursers lashing through the air. Mount Palatine he gains, and finds his son. Good laws enacting on a peaceful throne. The scales of heavenly justice holding high. With steady hand, and a discerning eye. Then vaults upon his car, and to the spheres. Swift, as a flying shaft, Rome's founder bears. The parts more pure, in rising, are refined. The gross and perishable lag behind. His shrine in purple vestments stands in view. He looks a god, and is Quirinus now. Assumption of Hercilia. A seat in the celestial mansions is assigned to Hercilia, the while of Romulus, who assumes the name of Aura. Ere long the goddess of the nuptial bed. With pity moved, sends Iris in her stead. To sad Hercilia. Thus the meteor maid. Chaste relict. In bright truth to heaven allied. The Sabine's glory, and the sex's pride. Honored on earth, and worthy of the love. Of such a spouse, as now resides above. Some respite to thy killing griefs afford. And if thou wouldst once more behold thy lord. Retire to yon steep mount, with groves o'erspread. Which with an awful gloom his temples shade. With fear the modest matron lifts her eyes. And to the bright ambassadress replies. O goddess, yet to mortal eyes unknown. But sure thy various charms confess thee one. O quick to Romulus thy votress bear. With looks of love he'll smile away my care. In whatever orb he shines, my heaven is there. Then hastes with Iris to the holy grove. And up the Mount Quirinal as they move. A lambent flame glides downward through the air. And brightens with a blaze her cilious hair. Together on the bounding ray they rise. And shoot a gleam of light along the skies. With opening arms Quirinus met his bride. Now Aura named, and pressed her to his side. Book. Chapter 15. Pythagorean Philosophy. The Pythagorean system of philosophy, which is here minutely described, is adopted and taught by Numa, who is chosen by the Romans to be the successor of Romulus. 
a king is sought to guide the growing state. One able to support the public weight. And fill the throne where Romulus had sate. Renown, which oft bespeaks the public voice. Had recommended Numa to their choice. A peaceful pious prince. Who not content. To know the Sabine rites, his study bent. To cultivate his mind, to learn the laws. Of nature, and explore their hidden cause. Urged by this care, his country he forsook. And to Crotona thence his journey took. Arrived, he first inquired the founder's name. Of this new colony, and whence he came. Then thus a senior of the place replies. Well read, and curious of antiquities. Tis said, Alcides hither took his way. From Spain, and drove along his conquered prey. Then, leaving in the fields his grazing cows. He sought himself some hospitable house. Good Croton entertained his godlike guest. While he repaired his weary limbs with rest. The hero, thence departing, blessed the place. And here, he said, in Lime's revolving race. A rising town shall take his name from thee. Revolving time fulfilled the prophecy. For Missilos, the justest man on earth. A lemon's son, at Argos had his birth. Him Hercules, armed with his club of oak. Urshadau D in a dream, and thus bespoke. Go, leave thy native soil, and make abode. Where Isaris rolls down his rapid flood. He said. And sleep forsook him, and the god. Trembling he waked, and rose with anxious heart. His country laws forbade him to depart. What should he do? Twas death to go away. And the god menaced if he dared to stay. All day he doubted, and when night came on. Sleep, and the same forewarning dream, begun. Once more the god stood threatening o'er his head. With added curses if he disobeyed. Twice warned, he studied flight, but would convey. At once his person and his wealth away. Thus while he lingered his design was heard. A speedy process formed, and death declared. Witness there needed none of his offense. Against himself the wretch was evidence. Condemned, and destitute of human aid. To him for whom he suffered thus he prayed. O power, who hast deserved in heaven a throne. Not given, but by thy labors made thy own. Pity thy suppliant, and protect his cause. Whom thou hast made obnoxious to the laws. A custom was of old, and still remains. Which life or death by suffrages ordains. White stones and black within an urn are cast. The first absolve, but fate is in the last. The judges to the common urn bequeath. Their votes, and drop the sable signs of death. The box receives all black, but, poured from thence. The stones came candid forth the hue of innocence. Thus Alemanides his safety won. Preserved from death by Alcumina's son. Then to his kinsman God his vows he pays. And cuts with prosperous gales the Ionian seas. He leaves Tarentum favored by the wind. And Thurine bays, and Temesis, behind. Soft Cyberus, and all the capes that stand. Along the shore, he makes in sight of land. Still doubling, and still coasting, till he found. The mouth of Isaris, and promised ground. Then saw, where, on the margin of the flood, the tomb that held the bones of Croton stood. Here, by the god's command, he built, and walled. The place predicted, and Crotona called. Thus fame, from time to time, delivers down. The sure tradition of the Italian town. Here dwelt the man divine, whom Samos bore. But now self-banished from his native shore. Because he hated tyrants, nor could bear. The chains, which none but servile souls will wear. He, though from heaven remote, to heaven could move. With strength of mind, and tread the abyss above. And penetrate, with his interior light. Those upper depths which nature hid from sight. And what he had observed and learned from thence. 
loved in familiar language to dispense. The crowd with silent admiration stand. And heard him as they heard their God's command. While he discoursed of heaven's mysterious laws. The world's original, and nature's cause. And what was God, and why the fleecy snows. In silence fell, and rattling winds arose. What shook the steadfast earth, and whence begun. The dance of planets round the radiant sun. If thunder was the voice of angry Jove. Or clouds with nitre pregnant, burst above. Of these, and things beyond the common reach. He spoke, and charmed his audience with his speech. He first the taste of flesh from tables drove. And argued well, if arguments could move. O oh mortals, from your fellow's blood abstain. Nor taint your bodies with a food profane. While corn and pulse by nature are bestowed. And planted orchards bend their willing load. While labored gardens wholesome herbs produce. And teeming vines afford their generous juice. Nor tardier fruits of cruder kind are lost. But tamed with fire, or mellowed by the frost. While kind to pales distended udders bring. And bees their honey redolent of spring. While earth not only can your need supply. But lavish of her store, provides for luxury. A guiltless feast administers with ease. And without blood is prodigal to please. Wild beasts their maws with their slain brethren fill. And yet not all, for some refuse to kill. Sheep, goats, and oxen, and the nobler steed. On brows, and corn, and flowery meadows feed. Bears, tigers, wolves, the lion's angry brood. Whom heaven endued with principles of blood. He wisely sundered from the rest, to yell. In forests, and in lonely caves to dwell. Where stronger beasts oppress the weak by might. And all in prey and purple feasts delight. O oh, impious use! To nature's laws opposed. Where bowels are in other bowels closed. Where fattened by their fellows' fat, they thrive. Maintained by murder, and by death they live. Tis then for naught, that Mother Earth provides. The stores of all she shows, and all she hides. If men with fleshy morsels must be fed. And chew with bloody teeth the breathing bread. What else is this, but to devour our guests? And barbrowsly renew Cyclopean feasts. We, by destroying life, our life sustain. And gorge the ungodly maw with meats obscene. Not so the golden age, who fed on fruit. Nor durst with bloody meals their mouths pollute. Then birds in airy space might safely move. And timorous hares on heath securely rove. Nor needed fish the guileful hooks to fear. For all was peaceful, and that peace sincere. Whoever was the wretch, and cursed be he. That envied first our food simplicity. The essay of bloody feasts on brutes began. And after forged the sword to murder man. Had he the sharpened steel alone employed. On beasts of prey, that other beasts destroyed. Or man invaded with their fangs and paws. This had been justified by nature's laws. And self-defense, but who did feasts begin? Of flesh, he stretched necessity to sin. To kill man-killers man has lawful power. But not the extended license to devour. Ill habits gather by unseen degrees. As brooks make rivers, rivers run to seas. The sow, with her broad snout, for rooting up. The entrusted seed, was judged to spoil the crop. And intercept the sweating farmer's hope. The covetous churl, of unforgiving kind. The offender to the bloody priest resigned. Her hunger was no plea, for that she died. The goat came next in order to be tried. The goat had cropped the tendrils of the vine. In vengeance laity and clergy join. Where one had lost his profit, won his wine. Here was at least some shadow of offense. The sheep was sacrificed on no pretense. But meek and unresisting innocence. A patient, useful creature, 
born to bear. The warm and woolly fleece, that clothed her murderer. And daily to give down the milk she bred. A tribute for the grass on which she fed. Living, both food and raiment she supplies. And is of least advantage when she dies. How did the toiling ox his death deserve? A downright simple drudge, and horn to serve? O tyrant! With what justice canst thou hope? The promise of the year, a plenteous crop. When thou destroyst thy laboring steer, who tilled? And ploughed with pains, thy else ungrateful field? From his yet reeking neck, to draw the yoke. That neck with which the surly clods he broke. And to the hatchet yield thy husbandman. Who finished autumn, and the spring began. Nor this alone but heaven itself to bribe. We to the gods our impious acts ascribe. First recompense with death their creatures toil. Then call the blessed above to share the spoil. The fairest victim must the powers appease. So fatal, tis sometimes too much to please. A purple fillet his broad brow adorns. With flowery garlands crowned, and gilded horns. He hears the murderous prayer the priest prefers. But understands not, tis his doom he hears. Beholds the meal between his temples cast. The fruit and product of his labors past winky face. And in the water views perhaps the knife. Uplifted to deprive him of his life. Then broken up alive, his entral sees. Torn out, for priests to inspect the gods' decrees. From whence, O oh mortal men, this gust of blood. Have you derived, and interdicted food? Be taught by me this dire delight to shun. Warned by my precepts, by my practice one. And when you eat the well-deserving beast, think on the laborer of your field you feast. Now since the God inspires me to proceed, be that, whatever inspiring power, obeyed. For I will sing of mighty mysteries, of truths concealed before, from human eyes. Dark oracles unveil, and open all the skies. Pleased as I am to walk along the sphere. Of shining stars, and travel with the year. To leave the heavy earth, and scale the height. Of Atlas, who supports the heavenly weight. To look from upper light, and then survey. Mistaken mortals wandering from the way. And wanting wisdom, fearful for the state of future things, and trembling at their fate. Those I would teach, and by right reason bring. To think of death as but an idle thing. Why thus affrighted at an empty name? A dream of darkness, and fictitious flame? Vain themes of wit, which but in poems pass. And fables of a world that never was? What feels the body when the soul expires? By time corrupted, or consumed by fires? Nor dies the spirit, but new life repeats. In other forms, and only changes seats. Even I, who these mysterious truths declare. Was once Euphorbus in the Trojan War. My name and lineage I remember well. And how in fight by Sparta's king I fell. In Argive Juno's fame I late beheld. My buckler hung on high, and owned my former shield. Then death, so called, is but old matter dressed. In some new figure, and a varied vest. Thus all things are but altered, nothing dies. And here and there the unbodied spirit flies. By time, or force, or sickness dispossessed. And lodges, where it lights, in man or beast. Or hunts without, till ready limbs it find. And actuates those according to their kind. From tenement to tenement is tossed. The soul is still the same, the figure only lost. And, as the softened wax new seals receives. This face assumes, and that impression leaves. Now called by one, now by another name. The form is only changed, the wax is still the same. So death, so called, can but the form deface. The immortal soul flies out in empty space to seek her fortune in some other place. Then let not piety be put to flight. 
to please the taste of glutton appetite. But suffer inmate souls secure to dwell. Lest from their seats your parents you expel. With rabid hunger feed upon your kind. Or from a beast dislodge a brother's mind. And since, like typhus parting from the shore, in ample seas I sail, and depths untried before. This let me farther add, that nature knows. No steadfast station. But or ebbs or flows. Ever in motion. She destroys her old. And casts new figures in another mold. Even times are in perpetual flux, and run. Like rivers from their fountain, rolling on. For time, no more than streams, is at a stay. The flying hour is ever on her way. And as the fountain still supplies her store, the wave behind impels the wave before. Thus in successive course the minutes run, and urge their predecessor minutes on. Still moving, ever new, for former things, are set aside, like abdicated kings. And every moment alters what is done, and innovates some act, till then unknown. Darkness we see emerges into light. And shining suns descend to sable night. Even heaven itself receives another die. When wearied animals in slumbers lie. Of midnight ease, another, when the gray. Of morn preludes the splendor of the day. The disc of Phoebus, when he climbs on high. Appears at first but as a bloodshot eye. And when his chariot downward drives to bed. His ball is with the same suffusion red. But mounted high in his meridian race. All bright he shines, and with a better face. For there, pure particles of ether flow. Far from the infection of the world below. Nor equal light the unequal moon adorns. Or in her waxing, or her waning horns. For every day she wanes, her face is less. But gathering into globe, she fattens at increase. Perceivest thou not the process of the year? How the four seasons in four forms appear? Resembling human life in every shape they wear? Spring, first, like infancy, shoots out her head. With milky juice requiring to be fed. Helpless, though fresh, and wanting to be led. The green stem grows in stature, and in size. But only feeds with hope the farmer's eyes. Then laughs the childish year with florets crowned. And lavishly perfumes the fields around. But no substantial nourishment receives. Infirm the stalks, unsolid are the leaves. Proceeding onward whence the year began. The summer grows adult, and ripens into man. This season, as in men, is most replete. With kindly moisture, and prolific heat. Autumn succeeds, a sober tepid age. Not froze with fear, nor boiling into rage. More than mature, and tending to decay. When our brown locks repine to mix with odious gray. Last, winter creeps along with tardy pace. Sour is his front, and furrowed is his face. His scalp, if not dishonored quite of hair. The ragged fleece is thin. And thin is worse than bare. Even our own bodies daily change receive. Some part of what was theirs before, they leave. Nor are today what yesterday they were. Nor the whole same tomorrow will appear. Time was when we were sowed, and just began. To show the promise of a future man. Then nature's hand, fermented as it was. Molded to shape the soft coagulated mass. And when the little man was fully formed. The breathless embryo with a spirit warmed. But when the mother's throes begin to come. The creature, pent within the narrow room. Breaks his blind prison, pushing to repair. His stifled breath, and draw the living air. Cast on the margin of the world he lies. A helpless babe, but by instinct he cries. He next essays to walk, but downward pressed. On four feet imitates his brother beast. By slow degrees he gathers from the ground. His legs, and to the rolling chair is bound. Then walks alone, 
a horseman now become. He rides a stick, and travels round the room. In time he vaunts among his youthful peers. Strong-boned, and strung with nerves, in pride of years. He runs with metal his first merry stage. Maintains the next, abetted of his rage. But manages his strength. And spares his age. Heavy the third, and stiff, he sinks apace. And though, tis downhill all, he creeps along the race. Now sapless on the verge of death he stands. Contemplating his former feet and hands. And, Milo-like, his slackened sinews seize. And withered arms, once fit to cope with Hercules. Unable now to shake, much less to tear, the trees. So Helen wept, when her too faithful glass. Reflected on her eyes the ruins of her face. Thy teeth, devouring time, thine, envious age. On things below still exercise your rage. With venomed grinders you corrupt your meat. And then, at lingering meals, the morsels eat. Nor those, which elements we call, abide. Nor to this figure, nor to that are tied. For this eternal world is said, of old. But four prolific principles to hold. Four different bodies. Two to heaven ascend. And other two down to the center tend. Fire first with wings expanded mounts on high. Pure, void of weight, and dwells in upper sky. Then air, because unclogged in empty space. Flies after fire, and claims the second place. But weighty water, as her nature guides. Lies on the lap of earth. And mother earth subsides. All things are mixed of these, which all contain. And into these are all resolved again. Earth rarefies to do. Expanded more. The subtle dew in air begins to soar. Spreads, as she flies, and weary of her name. Extenuates still, and changes into flame. Thus having by degrees perfection won. Restless they soon untwist the web they spun. And fire begins to lose her radiant hue. Mixed with gross air, and air descends to dew. And dew condensing, does her form forego. And sinks a heavy lump of earth below. Thus are their figures never at a stand. But changed by nature's innovating hand. All things are altered, nothing is destroyed. The shifted scene for some new show employed. Then, to be born is to begin to be. Some other thing we were not formerly. And what we call to die, is not to appear. Or be the thing that formerly we were. Those very elements, which we partake. Alive, when dead some other bodies make. Translated grow, have sense, or can discourse. But death on deathless substance have no force. That forms are changed, I grant, that nothing can. Continue in the figure it began. The golden age to silver was debased. To copper that, our metal came at last. The face of places, and their forms decay. And that is solid earth that once was sea. Seas in their turn retreating from the shore. Make solid land, what ocean was before. And far from strands are shells of fishes found. And rusty anchors fixed on mountain ground. And what were fields before, now washed and worn. By falling floods from high, to valleys turn. And crumbling still descend to level lands. And lakes, and trembling bogs, are barren sands. And the parched desert floats in streams unknown. Wondering to drink of waters not her own. Here nature living fountains opes. And there. Seals up the wombs, where living fountains were. Or earthquakes stop their ancient course, and bring. Diverted streams to feed a distant spring. So Lycus, swallowed up, is seen no more. But far from thence knocks out another door. Thus Erasmus dives. And blind in earth. Runs on, and gropes his way to second birth. Starts up in Argo's meads, and shakes his locks. Around the fields, and fattens all the flocks. 
so Mysus by another way is led. And, grown a river, now disdains his head. Forgets his humble birth, his name forsakes. And the proud title of Caicus takes. Large Amenane, impure with yellow sands. Runs rapid often, and as often stands. And here he threats the drunken fields to drown. And there his dugs deny to give their liquor down. A Nigros once did wholesome draughts afford. But now his deadly waters are abhorred. Since, hurt by Hercules, as fame resounds. The centaurs in his current washed their wounds. The streams of Hippinus are sweet no more. But brackish lose the taste they had before. Antisa, Pharos, Tyre, in seas were pent. Once isles, but now increase the continent. While the Lucadian coast, main land before. By rushing seas is severed from the shore. So Zankel to the Italian earth was tied. And men once walked where ships at anchor ride. Till Neptune overlooked the narrow way. And in disdain poured in the conquering sea. Two cities, that adorned the Achaean ground. Burris, and Hellas, no more are found. But whelmed beneath a lake, are sunk and drowned. And boatmen, through the crystal water, show. To wandering passengers the walls below. Near treason stands a hill, exposed in air. To winter winds of leafy shadows bare. This once was level ground, but, strange to tell. The included vapors, that in caverns dwell. Laboring with colic pangs, and close confined. In vain sought issue for the rumbling wind. Yet still they heaved for vent, and heaving still. Enlarged the concave. And shot up the hill. As breath extends a bladder, or the skins. Of goats are blown to enclose the hoarded wines. The mountain yet retains a mountain's face. And gathered rubbish heals the hollow space. Of many wonders which I heard, or knew. Retrenching most, I will relate but few. What, are not springs with qualities opposed? Endued at seasons, and at seasons lost? Thrice in a day thine, Ammon, change their form. Cold at high noon, at morn and evening warm. Thine, Athaman, will kindle wood, if thrown. On the piled earth, and in the waning moon. The Thracians have a stream, if any try. The taste, his hardened bowels petrify. Whatever it touches, it converts to stones. And makes a marble pavement where it runs. Crathus, and Cyberus, her sister flood. That slide through our Calabrian neighbor wood. With gold and amber dye the shining hair. And thither youth resort, for who would not be fair? But stranger virtues yet in streams we find. Some change not only bodies, but the mind. Who has not heard of Salmachus obscene? Whose waters into women soften men? Or Ethiopian lakes, which turn the brain? To madness, or in heavy sleep constrain? Clitorian streams the love of wine expel. Such is the virtue of the abstemious well. Whether the colder nymph, that rules the flood, extinguishes, and box the drunken god. Or that Milampus, so have some assured. When the mad proetides with charms he cured. And powerful herbs, both charms, and simples cast. Into the sober spring. Where still their virtues last. Unlike effects Lincestus will produce. Who drinks his waters, though with moderate use. Reels us with wine, and sees with double sight. His heels too heavy, and his head too light. Laden, once Phineas, an Arcadian stream. Ambiguous in the effects, as in the name. By day is wholesome beverage, but is thought. By night infected, and a deadly draught. Thus running rivers, and the standing lake. Now of these virtues, now of those partake. Time was, and all things time and fate obey. When fast Ortigia floated on the sea. Such were Cyanian isles, when Typhus steered. Between their straits, and their collision feared. They swam where now they sit, 
and firmly joined. Secure of rooting up, resist the wind. Nor Etna, vomiting sulfurous fire. Will ever belch, for sulfur will expire. The veins exhausted of the liquid store. Time was, she cast no flames, in time will cast no more. For whether earth's an animal, and air. Imbibes, her lungs with coolness to repair. And what she sucks remits, she still require. Inlets for air, and outlets for her fires. When tortured with convulsive fits she shakes. That motion choke the vent, till other vent she makes. Or when the winds in hollow caves are closed. And subtle spirits find that way opposed. They toss up flints in air. The flints that hide. The seeds of fire, thus tossed in air, collide. Kindling the sulfur, till the fuel spent. The cave is cooled, and the fierce winds relent. Or whether sulfur, catching fire, feeds on. Its unctuous parts, till all the matter gone. The flames no more ascend, for earth supplies. The fat that feeds them. And when earth denies. That food, by length of time consumed, the fire. Famished for want of fuel must expire. A race of men there are, as fame has told. Who shivering suffer hyperborean cold. Till nine times bathing in Minerva's lake. Soft feathers, to defend their naked sides they take. Tis said, the Scythian wives, believe who will. Transform themselves to birds by magic skill. Smeared over with an oil of wondrous might. That adds new pinions to their airy flight. But this by sure experiment we know. That living creatures from corruption grow. Hide in a hollow pit a slaughtered steer. Bees from his putrid bowels will appear. Who, like their parents, haunt the fields, and bring. Their honey harvest home, and hope another spring. The warlike steed is multiplied, we find. To wasps, and hornets of the warrior kind. Cut from a crab his crooked claws, and hide. The rest in earth, a scorpion thence will glide. And shoot his sting, his tail in circles tossed. Refers the limbs his backward father lost. And worms, that stretch on leaves their filmy loom. Crawl from their bags, and butterflies become. Even slime begets the frog's loquacious race. Short of their feet at first, in little space. With arms, and legs endued, long leaps they take. Raised on their hinder part. And swim the lake. And waves repel. For nature gives their kind. To that intent, a length of legs behind. The cubs of bears a living lump appear. When whelped, and no determined figure wear. Their mother licks them into shape, and gives. As much of form, as she herself receives. The grubs from their sex angular abode. Crawl out unfinished, like the maggots brood. Trunks without limbs. Till time at leisure brings. The thighs they wanted, and their tardy wings. The bird, that draws the car of Juno, vain. Of her crowned head, and of her starry train. And he that bears the artillery of Jove. The strong pounced eagle, and the billing dove. And all the feathered kind, who could suppose. But that for sight, the surest sense, he knows. They from the included yoke, not ambient white, arose. There are, who think the marrow of a man. Which in the spine, while he was living, ran. When dead, the pith corrupted will become. A snake, and hiss within the hollow tomb. All these receive their birth from other things. Out from himself the phoenix only springs. Self-born, begotten by the parent flame. In which he burned, another and the same. Who not by corn, or herbs his life sustains. But the sweet essence of Amomum drains. And watches the rich gums Arabia bears. While yet in tender dew they drop their tears. He, his five centuries of life fulfilled. His nest on oaken boughs begins to build. Or trembling tops of palm, and first he draws. 
the plan with his broad bill, and crooked claws. Nature's artificers. On this the pile. Is formed, and rises round, then with the spoil. Of cassia, cinnamon, and stems of nard. For softness strewed beneath. His funeral bed is reared. Funeral and bridal both. And all around. The borders with corruptless myrrh are crowned. On this incumbent, till ethereal flame. First catches, then consumes the costly frame. Consumes him too, as on the pile he lies. He lived on odors, and in odors dies. An infant phoenix from the former springs. His father's heir, and from his tender wings. Shakes off his parent dust, his method he pursues. And the same lease of life on the same terms renews. When grown to manhood he begins his reign. And with stiff pinions can his flight sustain. He lightens of its load the tree that bore. His father's royal sepulchre before. And his own cradle, this with pious care. Placed on his back, he cuts the buxom air. Seeks the sun city, and his sacred church. And decently lays down his burden in the porch. A wonder more amazing would we find? The hyena shows it, of a double kind. The thin chameleon fed with air, receives. The color of the thing to which he cleaves. India when conquered, on the conquering god. For planted vines the sharp-eyed lynx bestowed. Whose moisture shed before it touches earth. Congeals in air. And gives to gems their birth. So coral soft, and white in ocean's bed. Comes hardened up in air, and glows with red. All changing species should my song recite. Before I ceased, would change the day to night. Nations and empires flourish, and decay. By turns command, and in their turns obey. Time softens hardy people, time again. Hardens to war a soft, unwarlike train. Thus Troy for ten long years her foes withstood. And, daily bleeding, bore the expense of blood. Now for thick streets it shows an empty space. Or. Only filled with tombs of her own perished race. Herself becomes the sepulchre of what she was. Mycene, Sparta, Thebes, of mighty fame. Are vanished out of substance into name. And Darden Rome, that just begins to rise. On Tiber's banks, in time shall mate the skies. Widening her bounds, and working on her way. Even now she meditates imperial sway. Yet this is change, but she by changing thrives. Like moons newborn. And in her cradle strives. To fill her infant horns, an hour shall come. When the round world shall be contained in Rome. For thus old saws foretell, and Helenus. And Chyses drooping sun enlivened thus. When Ilium now was in a sinking state. And he was doubtful of his future fate. O goddess born! With thy hard fortune strive. Troy never can be lost, and thou alive. Thy passage thou shalt free through fire and sword. And Troy in foreign lands shall be restored. In happier fields a rising town I see. Greater than whatever was, or is. Or e'er shall be. And heaven yet owes the world a race derived from thee. Sages and chiefs, of other lineage born. The city shall extend, extended, shall adorn. But from Ulysses he must draw his breath. By whom thy Rome shall rule the conquered earth. Whom heaven will lend mankind, on earth to reign. And late require the precious pledge again. This Hellenist to great Aeneas told. Which I retain, e'er since in other mould. My soul was clothed. And now rejoice to view. My country walls rebuilt, and Troy revived anew. Raised by the fall, decreed by loss to gain. Enslaved but to be free, and conquered but to reign. Tis time my hard-mouthed coursers to control. Apt to run riot, and transgress the goal. And therefore I conclude, whatever lies. In earth, or flits in air, or fills the skies. 
all suffer change. And we that are of soul. And body mixed, are members of the whole. Then when our sires or grandsires shall forsake. The forms of men, and brutal figures take. Thus housed. Securely let their spirits rest. Nor violate thy father in the beast. Thy friend, thy brother, any of thy kin. If none of these, yet there's a man within. O oh, spare to make a Thyestean meal. To enclose his body, and his soul expel. Ill customs by degrees to habits rise. Ill habits soon become exalted vice. What more advance can mortals make in sin? So near perfection, who with blood begin? Deaf to the calf that lies beneath the knife. Looks up, and from her butcher begs her life. Deaf to the harmless kid, that, ere he dies. All methods to procure thy mercy tries. And imitates in vain thy children's cries? Where will he stop, who feeds with household bread? Then eats the poultry which before he fed? Let plough thy steers, that when they lose their breath. To nature, not to thee, they may impute their death. Let goats for food their loaded udders lend. And sheep from winter cold thy sides defend. But neither springes, nets, nor snares employ. And be no more ingenious to destroy. Free as in air, let birds on earth remain. Nor let insidious glue their wings constrain. Nor opening hounds the trembling stags affright. Nor purple feathers intercept his flight. Nor hooks concealed in baits for fish prepare. Nor lines to heave them twinkling up in air. Take not away the life you cannot give. For all things have an equal right to live. Kill noxious creatures, where, tis sin to save. This only just prerogative we have. But nourish life with vegetable food. And shun the sacrilegious taste of blood. These precepts by the Samian sage were taught. Which godlike Numa to the Sabines brought. And thence transferred to Rome, by gift his own. A willing people, and an offered throne. O oh, happy monarch! Sent by heaven to bless. A savage nation with soft arts of peace. To teach religion, rapine to restrain. Give laws to lust, and sacrifice ordain. Himself a saint, a goddess was his bride. And all the muses o'er his acts preside. Story of Hippolytus Hippolytus, rejecting with horror the advances of his stepmother Phaedra, is accused by her of the guilt which he has refused to contract, the angry Theseus entreats Neptune to punish the incontinence of his son. And the innocent youth is thrown from his chariot and dashed to pieces, he is afterward restored to life by Diana, who disguises his features, and bestows on him immortal existence. Advanced in years he died, one common date. His reign concluded, and his mortal state. Their tears plebeians and patricians shed. And pious matrons wept their monarch dead. His mournful wife, her sorrows to bewail. Withdrew from Rome, and sought the Arician Vale. Hid in thick woods, she made incessant moans. Disturbing Cynthia's sacred rites with groans. How oft the nymphs, who ruled the wood and lake. Reproved her tears, and words of comfort spake. How oft in vain, the son of Theseus said. Thy stormy sorrows be with patience laid. Nor are thy fortunes to be wept alone. Weigh others' woes, and learn to bear thine own. Be mine an instance to assuage thy grief. Would mine were none. Yet mine may bring relief. You've heard, perhaps, in conversation told. What once befell Hippolytus of old. To death by Theseus' easy faith betrayed. And caught in snares his wicked stepdame laid. The wondrous tale your credit scarce may claim. Yet, strange to say, behold in me the same. Whom amorous Phaedra oft had pressed in vain. My father's honor and my own to stain. Till, seized with fear, or by revenge inspired. She charged on me the crimes herself desired. Expelled by Theseus, from his home I fled. With heaps of curses on my guiltless head. 
Forlorn, I sought pity in treason's land. And drove my chariot o'er Corinthus' strand. When from the surface of the level main. A billow rising, heaved above the plain. Rolling and gathering, till so high it swelled. A mountain's height the enormous mass excelled. Then bellowing, burst, when from the summit cleaved. A horned bull his ample chest upheaved. His mouth and nostrils storms of briny rain. Expiring, blue. Dread horror seized my train. I stood unmoved. My father's cruel doom. Claimed all my soul, nor fear could find a room. Amazed, a while my trembling coursers stood. With pricked up ears, contemplating the flood. Then, starting sudden from the dreadful view. At once like lightning from the seas they flew. And o'er the craggy rocks the chariot drew. In vain to stop the hot-mouthed steeds I tried. And, bending backward, all my strength applied. The frothy foam in driving flakes disdains. The bits and bridles, and bedews the reins. But though as yet untamed they run, at length. Their heady rage had tired beneath my strength. When in the spokes a stump entangling, tore. The shattered wheel, and from its axle bore. The shock impetuous tossed me from the seat. Caught in the reins, beneath my horse's feet. Then stretched, the well-knit limbs in pieces hailed. Part stuck behind, and part the chariot trailed. Till, midst my cracking joints and breaking bones. I breathed away my wearied soul in groans. No part distinguished from the rest was found. But all my parts a universal wound. Now say, self-tortured nymph, can you compare? Our griefs as equal, or injustice dare? I saw besides the darksome realms of Wa. And bathed my wounds in smoking streams below. There I had stayed, nor second life enjoyed. But Pian's son his wondrous art employed. To light restored, by medicinal skill. In spite of fate, and rigid Pluto's will. The invidious object to preserve from view. A misty cloud around me Cynthia threw. And lest my sight should stir my foes to rage. She stamped my visage with the marks of age. My former hue was changed, and for it shone. A set of features and a face unknown. A while the goddess stood in doubt, or Crete. Or Delos' isle, to choose for my retreat. Delos and Crete refused, this would she chose. Bade me my former luckless name depose. Which kept alive the memory of my woes. Then said, Immortal life be thine, and thou. Hippolytus once called, Be verbious now. Here then a god, but of the inferior race. I serve my goddess, and attend her chase. Egeria transformed to a fountain. Egeria, the wife of Numa, while lamenting the loss of her husband, is changed by Apollo into a fountain. But others' woes were useless to appease. Egeria's grief, or set her mind at ease. Beneath the hill fill comfortless she laid. The dropping tears her eyes incessant shed. Till pitying Phoebus eased her pious wa. Thawed to a spring, whose streams forever flow. The nymphs and verbius like amazement filled. As seized the swains who tearing furrows tilled. When heaving up, a clod was seen to roll. Untouched, self-moved. And big with human soul. The spreading mass, in former shape deposed. Began to shoot, and arms and legs disclosed. Till, formed a perfect man, the living mold. Op at its new mouth, and future truths foretold. And, Tages named by natives of the place. Taught arts prophetic to the Tuscan race. Or such as once by Romulus was shown. Who saw his lance with sprouting leaves o'ergrown. When fixed in earth the point began to shoot. And, growing downward, turned a fibrous root. While spread aloft, the branching arms displayed. O'er wandering crowds, an unexpected shade. Story of Sippus A noble Roman, named Sippus, 
while returning victorious to the city, finds horns growing on his forehead. Which are pronounced by the soothsayers to foretell his future reign if he should enter Rome, unwilling to enslave his country, he voluntarily banishes himself. And a large portion of land without the city walls is allotted for his support by the grateful senate. Or as when Sippus in the current viewed the shooting horns that on his forehead stood. His temples first he feels, and, with surprise, his touch confirms the assurance of his eyes. Straight to the skies his horned front he rears, and to the gods directs these pious prayers. If this portent be prosperous, O decree, to Rome the event, if otherwise, to me. An altar then of turf he hastes to raise. Rich gums in fragrant exhalations blaze. The panting entrails crackle as they fry. And boding fumes pronounce a mystery. Soon as the augur saw the holy fire. And victims with presaging signs expire. To Sippus then he turns his eyes with speed. And views the horny honors of his head. Then cried, Hail, conqueror! Thy call obey. Those omens I behold presage thy sway. Rome waits thy nod, unwilling to be free. And owns thy sovereign power as fate's decree. He said, and Sippus, starting at the event. Spoke in these words his pious discontent. Far hence, ye gods, this execration send. And the great race of Romulus defend. Better that I in exile live abhorred. Then ere the capital should style me lord. This spoke, he hides with leaves his omened head. Then prays. The senate next convenes, and said. If augurs can foresee, a wretch is come. Designed by destiny the bane of Rome. Two horns, most strange to tell, his temple's crown. If e'er he pass the walls, and gain the town. Your laws are forfeit that ill-fated hour. And liberty must yield to lawless power. Your gates he might have entered, but this arm. Seized the usurper, and withheld the harm. Haste, find the monster out, and let him be. Condemned to all the senate can decree. Or tied in chains, or into exile thrown. Or by the tyrant's death prevent your own. The crowd such murmurs utter as they stand. As swelling surges breaking on the strand. Or as when gathering gales sweep o'er the grove. And their tall heads the bending cedars move. Each with confusion gazed, and then began. To feel his fellow's brows, and find the man. Sippus then shakes his garland off, and cries. The wretch you want I offer to your eyes. The anxious throng looked down, and, sad in thought. All wished they had not found the sign they sought. In haste, with laurel wreaths his head they bind. Such honor to such virtue was assigned. Then thus the senate, here, O Sippus, here. So godlike is thy tutelary care. That since in Rome thyself forbids thy stay. For thy abode those acres we convey. The plowshare can surround, the labor of a day. In deathless records thou shalt stand enrolled. And Rome's rich posts shall shine with horns of gold. Occasion of Aesculapius being brought to Rome. The city of Rome is delivered from a plague by the presence of Aesculapius. Who willingly accompanies the Roman ambassadors from Epidaurus in the form of a serpent. Melodious maids of Pindus, who inspire. The flowing strains, and tune the vocal lyre. Tradition secrets are unlocked to you. Old tales revive, and ages past renew. You who can hidden causes best expound. Say, whence the isle which Tiber flows around. Its altars with a heavenly stranger graced. And in our shrines the god of physic placed. A wasting plague infected Latium skies. Pale, bloodless looks were seen, with ghastly eyes. The dire diseases marks each visage war. And the pure blood was changed to putrid gore. In vain were human remedies applied. In vain the power of healing herbs was tried. Wearied with death, they seek celestial aid. 
and visit Phoebus in his Delphic shade. In the world center sacred Delpho stands, and gives its oracles to distant lands. Here they implore the god, with fervent vows, his salutary power to interpose, and end a great afflicted city's woes. The holy temple sudden tremors proved. The laurel grove and all its quivers moved. In hollow sounds the priestess thus began. And through each bosom thrilling horrors ran. The assistance, Roman, which you here implore. Seek from another, and a nearer shore. Relief must be implored, and succor won. Not from Apollo, but Apollo's son. My son, to Latium born, shall bring redress. Go with good omens, and expect success. When these clear oracles the Senate knew, the sacred tripods' counsels they pursue, depute a pious and a chosen band, who sail to Epidaurus' neighboring land. Before the Grecian elders when they stood, they pray them to bestow the healing god. Ordained was he to save Ausonia's state. So promised Delphos, and unerring fate. Opinions various their debates enlarge. Some plead to yield to Rome the sacred charge. Others, tenacious of their country's wealth, refuse to grant the power who guards its health. While dubious they remained, the wasting light withdrew before the growing shades of night. Thick darkness now obscured the dusky skies. Now, Roman, closed in sleep were mortal eyes. When health's auspicious God appears to thee, and thy glad dreams his form celestial see, in his left hand, a rural staff preferred, his right is seen to stroke his decent beard. Dismiss, said he, with mildness all divine. Dismiss your fears, I come, and leave my shrine. This serpent view, that with ambitious play, my staff encircles, mark him every way. His form, though larger, nobler, I'll assume. And changed, as gods should be, bring aid to Rome. Here fled the vision, and the vision's flight. Was followed by the cheerful dawn of light. Nor was the morn with blushing streaks o'erspread. And all the starry fires of heaven were fled. The chiefs perplexed, and filled with doubtful care. To their protector's sumptuous roofs repair. By genuine signs implore him to express. What seats he deigns to choose. What land to bless. Scarce their ascending prayers had reached the sky. Lo, the serpentine god, erected high. Forerunning hissings his approach confessed. Bright shone his golden scales, and waved his lofty crest. The trembling altar his appearance spoke. The marble floor, and glittering ceiling shook. The doors were rocked, the statue seemed to nod. And all the fabric owned the present god. His radiant chest he taught aloft to rise. And round the temple cast his flaming eyes. Struck was the astonished crowd. The holy priest. His temples with white bands of ribbon dressed. With reverent awe the power divine confessed. The God. The God, he cries, all tongues be still. Each conscious breast devoutest ardor fill. O beauteous! O divine! Assist our cares. And be propitious to thy V.O.T.R.I.'s prayers. All with consenting hearts, and pious fear. The words repeat, the deity revere. The Romans in their holy worship joined. With silent awe, and purity of mind. Gracious to them. His crest is seen to nod. And, as an earnest of his care, the god. Thrice hissing, vibrates thrice his forked tongue. And now the smooth descent he glides along. Still on the ancient seats he bends his eyes. In which his statue breathes, his altars rise. His long-loved shrine with kind concern he leases. And to forsake the accustomed mansion grieves. At length his weeping bulk in state is borne. Through the thronged streets. Which scattered flowers adorn. Through many a fold he winds his mazy course. And gains the port and moles, which break the ocean's force. 
Twas here he made a stand, and having viewed the pious train, who his last steps pursued, seemed to dismiss their zeal with gracious eyes, while gleams of pleasure in his aspect rise. And now the Latian vessel he ascends. Beneath the weighty god the vessel bends. The Latins on the strand great Jove appease. Their cables loose. And plow the yielding seas. The high-reared serpent from the stern displays. His gorgeous form, and the blue deep surveys. The ship is wafted on with gentle gales. And o'er the calm Ionian smoothly sails. On the sixth morn the Italian coast they gain. And touch Lacinia, graced with Juno's fane. Now fair Calabria to the sight is lost. And all the cities on her fruitful coast. They pass at length the rough Sicilian shore. The Brutian soil, rich with metallic ore. The famous isles, where Aeolus was king. And Pestus blooming with eternal spring. Minerva's cape they leave, and Capri's isle. Campania, on whose hills the vineyards smile. The city, which I'll see this spoils adorn. Naples, for soft delight and pleasure born. Fair Stabii, with Cumian Sibyl seats. And Baie's tepid baths, and green retreats. Linternum next they reach, where balmy gums. Distill from mastic trees, and spread perfumes. Kajeda, from the nurse so named for whom. With pious care Aeneas raised a tomb. Vulturn, whose whirlpools suck the numerous sands. And Trachas, and Minterni's marshy lands. And Formia's coast is left, and Circe's plain. Which yet remembers her enchanting reign. To Antium, last, his course the pilot guides. Here, while the anchored vessel safely rides. For now the ruffled deep portends a storm. The spiry god unfolds his spheric form. Through large indentings draws his lubric train. And seeks the refuge of Apollo's fane. The fane is situate on the yellow shore. When the sea smiled, and the winds raged no more. He leaves his father's hospitable lands. And furrows, with his rattling scales. The sands. Along the coast. At length the ship regains. And sails to Tiber, and Lavinium's plains. Here mingling crowds to meet their patron came. Even the chaste guardians of the vestal flame. From every part tumultuous they repair. And joyful acclamations rend the air. Along the flowery banks, on either side. Where the tall ship floats on the swelling tide. Disposed in decent order altars rise. And crackling incense, as it mounts the skies. The air with sweets refreshes. While the knife. Warm with the victim's blood, lets out the streaming life. The world's great mistress, Rome, receives him now. On the mast's top reclined he waves his brow. And from that height surveys the great abodes. And mansions, worthy of residing gods. The land, a narrow neck, itself extends. Round which his course the stream divided bends. The stream's two arms, on either side, are seen. Stretched out in equal length. The land between. The isle, so called, from hence derives its name. Twas here the salutary serpent came. Nor sooner has he left the Latian pine. But he assumes again his form divine. And now no more the drooping city mourns. Joy is again restored, and health returns. Deification of Julius Caesar. Venus, unable to arrest the impending death of Julius Caesar, procures his admission into the celestial mansions. But Aesculapius was a foreign power. In his own city Caesar we adore. Him arms and arts alike renowned beheld. In peace conspicuous, dreadful in the field. His rapid conquests, and swift finished wars. The hero justly fixed among the stars. Yet is his progeny his greatest fame. The son immortal makes the father's name. The sea-girt Britons, by his courage tamed. For their high rocky cliffs, and fierceness famed. 
his dreadful navies, which victorious rode. O'er Niles affrighted waves and seven-sourced flood. Numidia, and the spacious realms regained. Where Sinephus or flows, or Juba reigned. The powers of titled Mithridates broke. And Pontus added to the Roman yoke. Triumphal shows decreed, for conquests won. For conquests, which the triumph still outshone. These are great deeds. Yet less, than to have given. The world a Lord, in whom, propitious heaven. When you decreed the sovereign rule to place. You blessed with lavish bounty human race. Now lest so great a prince might seem to rise. Of mortal stem, his sire must reach the skies. The beauteous goddess, that Aeneas bore. Foresaw it, and foreseeing did deplore. For well she knew her hero's fate was nigh. Devoted by conspiring arms to die. Trembling, and pale, Joe every god she cried. Behold, what deep and subtle arts are tried. To end the last, the only branch that springs. From my Lulus, and the Darden kings. How bent they are. How desperate to destroy. All that is left me of unhappy Troy. Am I alone by fate ordained to know? Uninterrupted care and endless wa? Now from Tidide's spear I feel the wound. Now Ilium's towers the hostile flames surround. Troy laid in dust, my exiled son I mourn. Through angry seas, and raging billows borne. O'er the wide deep his wandering course he bends. Now to the sullen shades of Styx descends. With Turnus driven at last fierce wars to wage. Whether with unpitying Juno's rage. But why record I now my ancient woes? Sense of past ills in present fears I lose. On me their points the impious daggers throw. Forbid it, gods, repel the direful blow. If by cursed weapons Numa's priest expires. No longer shall ye burn, ye vestal fires. While such complaining Cyprius grief disclose. In each celestial breast compassion rose. Not gods can alter fate's resistless will. Yet they foretold by signs the approaching ill. Dreadful were heard, among the clouds, alarms. Of echoing trumpets, and of clashing arms. The sun's pale image gave so faint a light. That the sad earth was almost veiled in night. The ether's face with fiery meteors glowed. With storms of hail were mingled drops of blood. A dusky hue the morning star o'erspread. And the moon's orb was stained with spots of red. In every place portentous shrieks were heard. The fatal warnings of the infernal bird. In every place the marble melts to tears. While in the groves, revered through length of years. Boding and awful sounds the ear invade. And solemn music warbles through the shade. No victim can atone the impious age. No sacrifice the wrathful gods assuage. Dire wars and civil fury threat the state. And every omen points out Caesar's fate. Around each hallowed shrine, and sacred dome. Night howling dogs disturb the peaceful gloom. Their silent seats the wandering shades forsake. And fearful tremblings the rocked city shake. Yet could not, by these prodigies, be broke. The plotted charm, or stayed the fatal stroke. Their swords the assassins in the temple draw. Their murdering hands nor gods nor temples awe. This sacred place their bloody weapons stain. And virtue falls, before the altar slain. Twas now fair Cypria, with her woes oppressed. In raging anguish smote her heavenly breast. Wild with distracting fears, the goddess tried. Her hero in the ethereal cloud to hide. The cloud, which youthful Paris did conceal. When Menelaus urged the threatening steel. The cloud, which once deceived tide-eyed sight. And saved Aeneas in the unequal fight. When Jove, in vain, fair daughter, U.S.A. To O'Errol destiny's unconquered sway. Your doubts to banish, enter fate's abode. 
a privilege to heavenly powers allowed. There you shall see the records graved, in length. On iron and solid brass, with mighty strength. Which heaven and earth's concussion shall endure. Maugre all shocks, eternal, and secure. There, on perennial adamant designed. The various fortunes of your race you'll find. Well I have marked them, and will now relate. To thee the settled laws of future fate. He, goddess, for whose death the fates you blame. Has finished his determined course with fame. To thee, tis given at length, that he shall shine. Among the gods. And grace the worshipped shrine. His son to all his greatness shall be heir. And worthily succeed to empire's care. Ourself will lead his wars. Resolve to aid. The brave avenger of his father's shade. To him its freedom Mutina shall owe. And Decius his auspicious conduct know. His dreadful powers shall shake Pharsalia's plain. And drench and gore Philippi's fields again. A mighty leader, in Cecilia's flood. Great Pompey's warlike son, shall be subdued. Egypt's soft queen, adorned with fatal charms. Shall mourn her soldiers' unsuccessful arms. Too late shall find her swelling hopes were vain. And know that Rome o'er Memphis still must reign. What name I Afric, or Nile's hidden head? For as both oceans roll. His power shall spread. All the known earth to him shall homage pay. And the seas own his universal sway. When cruel war no more disturbs mankind. To civil studies shall he bend his mind. With equal justice guardian laws ordain. And by his great example vice restrain. Where will his bounty or his goodness end? To times unborn his generous views extend. The virtues of his heir our praise engage. And promise blessings to the coming age. Late shall he in his kindred orbs be placed. With pillion years, and crowded honors graced. Meantime, your hero's fleeting spirit bear. Fresh from his wounds, and change it to a star. So shall great Julius rites divine assume. And from the sky's eternal smile on Rome. This spoke, the goddess to the senate flew. Where, her fair form concealed from mortal view. Her Caesar's heavenly part she made her care. Nor left the recent soul to waste to air. But bore it upward to its native skies. Glowing with newborn fires she saw it rise. Forth springing from her bosom up it flew. And, kindling as it soared, a comet grew. Above the lunar sphere it took its flight. And shot behind it a long trail of light. Reign of Augustus, in which Ovid flourished. The superiority of Augustus to his great predecessor is insisted on by the courteous poet. Thus raised, his glorious offspring Julius viewed. Beneficently great, and scattering good. Deeds, that his own surpassed, with joy beheld. And his large heart dilates to be excelled. What though this prince refuses to receive? The preference, which his juster subjects give. Fame uncontrolled, that no restraint obeys. The homage, shunned by modest virtue, pays. And proves disloyal only in his praise. Though great his sire, him greater we proclaim. So Atreus yields to Agamemnon's fame. Achilles so superior honors won. And Peleus must submit to Peleus' son. Examples yet more noble to disclose. So Saturn was eclipsed. When Jove to empire rose. Jove rules the heavens, the earth Augustus sways. Each claims a monarch's, and a father's praise. Celestials, who for Rome your cares employ. Ye gods, who guarded the remains of Troy. Ye native gods, here born, and fixed by fate. Quirinus, founder of the Roman state. O parent Mars, from whom Quirinus sprung. Chaste Vesta, Caesar's household gods among. Most sacred held. Domestic Phoebus, thou. To whom with Vesta chaste alike we bow. Great guardian of the high Tarpeian rock. And all ye powers, whom poets may invoke. 
O oh, grant, that day may claim our sorrows late. When loved Augustus shall submit to fate. Visit those seats, where gods and heroes dwell. And leave, in tears. The world he ruled so well. The poet concludes. Ovid concludes with a rapturous anticipation of the renown which will follow the publication of this work. The work is finished, which nor dreads the rage of tempests, fire, or war, or wasting age. Come, soon or late, death's undetermined day. This mortal being only can decay. My nobler part, my fame, shall reach the skies. And to late times with blooming honors rise. Whatever the unbounded Roman power obeys. All climes and nations shall record thy praise. If tis allowed to poets to divine. One half of round eternity is mine.